Welcome everybody to day two of the Trader Line Trading Conference of 2023. Super excited to have you guys here. So thank you for joining us. I'm um, just taking a step back. Uh, this overall conference is four days of stellar presentations from market wizards, fund managers, trading psychology experts, and U.S. investing champions, 100% for free. So thanks so much for tuning in. And just a brief message before we get into the schedule, uh, we do want to remind you to please go ahead and share with your friends, other traders who you know, anybody who might find value in these presentations. Uh, here is the schedule for today. It's definitely packed. Uh, starting at 9 a.m., we've got Jim Ropel talking about markets, leadership, and what's next. Uh, then we've got Chris Pruna talking about when to sell, especially from an investing point of view. Definitely going to be a fantastic presentation. At 12, we've got Lance Bredstein, more than just friends, a trend love story. Uh, then Ryan Pierpont at 2 p.m., uh, the evolution of a trader, Brian Feraldi, Developing an Edge with Fundamentals, an Introduction to Accounting. Brian Shannon at 5 p.m., Don't Buy Dips, Don't Buy Breakouts, Don't Short Rips, and Don't Short Breakdowns. Do this instead. Definitely going to be a fantastic presentation. I always learn a ton from Brian. And finally, to wrap things up, we've got Market Wizards. All right, welcome to the last day in the 2023 Trader Line Training Conference. Thanks so much for tuning in. Uh, we've got a stellar lineup to close things out. Uh, and just taking a step back, this has been a fantastic experience. Um, I personally learned a ton and I hope you guys have as well. Um, and, you know, I've been so impressed with all the speakers, uh, the depth that they've gone into their systems, their processes and their topics. Uh, so really looking forward to closing things out uh, strong with day four. So with that said, uh, here is the schedule for today, starting with Matt Caruso. When is the right time for trading growth stocks? Definitely an important question. Then we've got Dr. Brett Steenbarger, uh, Mike Bellafiore, uh, developing as a trader group entering and coaching session. Uh, then after lunch, we've got Ross Haber, our very own Ross Haber, discussing the consolidation pivot setup and optimizing trading execution. Uh, then we've got John Brody discussing money management and the mental aspects of trading. And finally, to close things out, we've got Tom Basso uh, discussing all weather trading. So a really stacked lineup here uh, to end out uh, day four and the conference. Uh, will it be recorded? Yes, 100%. Uh, just like the other uh, streams from the previous days, uh, this is 100% recorded, uh, and you can actually scroll back at any time using the um, time scroll bar here on YouTube and go back, rewatch um, a certain part, uh, and you can always come back to the same URL of the stream and watch any presentation from today. Um, how to get the most out of the experience? This is just pretty much quick review. Uh, first, make sure you're subscribed down below to the Trailline channel. Uh, the learning does not end today with the conference. We've got a ton in store for the rest of the year, including tutorials, Trailline podcasts, clips, uh, and a ton more you know, ideas and content coming your way. Uh, so make sure you're subscribed. Uh, it's completely free. Um, also, be sure to take notes. Give back if you can to St. Jude's. Um, engage in the chat with others and with the speakers. Uh, and also, feel free to share key takeaways on Twitter. And as I mentioned before, feel free to rewatch your favorite presentations. Uh, this is brought to you by Trailline, and an awesome thing that we're doing this year as well is also giving you a free ultimate trading guide. Um, this is 100 plus pages, I believe it's 115. Uh, we've worked on this for the past few months, um, and basically in there is you know uh, discussions about setups, edges, um, routines, everything you you kind of need to build a trading system. Uh, you can learn and improve upon by reading this uh, guide. So definitely go ahead and click the link down below in the description. It should also be in the chat pinned there um, and download your copy uh, today. Also, I do wanna mention that we're currently running a sale on all the Trader Lion Masterclasses from Oliver Kell, Jared Tenler, um, Eve, and the folks over at the Lifecycle Trade. And of course, Stan Weinstein, who many of you guys heard live yesterday. And he's actually doing a special offer right now where included in any purchase right now is a free one month subscription uh, to Global Trend Alert, his institutional um, service right there. Uh, so you get to see his ideas and exactly how he's interpreting the market at this crucial time. So a really compelling offer there. Uh, it's also on sale for a significant uh, discount. So go ahead and check it out. Uh, the link is in the description right now. Uh, and all of these masterclasses are amazing. Um, and I've learned a ton through each of one and helping create uh, these resources. So definitely go ahead and uh, consider uh, investing in yourself and taking one of these classes. Uh, in addition to uh, TraderLine, this is also brought to you by DeepView. 
Uh, this is a new and innovative charting platform that we're developing here. Um, and if you're a techno fundamentalist, this is the best platform for you in terms of screening for ideas, in terms of managing watch lists, setting alerts, all of that. Uh, you can basically customize this any way you wish, including the data columns, stats tables with earnings and sales uh, data, and then the data table over here on the right-hand side where you can put basically any data point you wish in there. Fully customizable. You can tailor it to your process. Um, and we're really excited about this. And this is uh, going to really change how people trade, I think. And our goal is to build an all-in-one solution, including trade analytics, uh, journaling capabilities, and much, much more. Uh, so definitely go ahead and check out DeepView down below. Um, and, you know, a key thing is we're bringing updates, new modules, uh, new features, you know, almost every week, every month. Um, so we're really taking into account the ideas of our users and potential users and incorporating that straight into the platform. Uh, so if you're looking for a platform that's new, innovative, and tailored to your needs and kind of the modern uh, trading structure, definitely go ahead and check out DeepView. Um, you won't be disappointed. Uh, moving on, if you are finding value in this conference, please go ahead and consider a donation to St. Jude's. Uh, it's a very worthy cause and uh, you know, $5, $10, $20, anything is fantastic. And uh, yeah, it's just a great cause that uh, you can use to give back if you've learned something from the conference. Uh, lastly, just another reminder to subscribe to the channel 100% free. Um, hopefully you've learned something in the conference. So if you've learned something and you're not yet subscribed, uh, go ahead and change that down below. Also, please go ahead and drop a link or drop a like, sorry, uh, on this video as well. That helps let YouTube know that's a valuable uh, stream and it will push it to more traders who can benefit uh, from the knowledge being shared. Um, as I mentioned before, we've got a lot in store coming later this year, Trailline podcasts, uh, tutorials, free webinars, and key clips that you don't want to miss. So go ahead and subscribe. Uh, and with that, let's go ahead and close out these, this thing strong uh, and get started with Matt Caruso in just a few minutes. Uh, enjoy, uh, take good notes. Uh, and yeah, thanks so much for being a part of this and uh, look forward to your comments and questions in the chat. And we'll be right back. Take care. All right, welcome everybody to day four of the 2023 Trailline Trading Conference. Uh, it's my pleasure to kick things off with my good friend, Matt Caruso, uh, the founder of Caruso Insights and also a top performer in the US Investing Championship. Um, always great chatting with Matt and he's such a fantastic teacher about trading and investing concepts. So Matt, thank you so much for taking the time and uh, I'm really looking forward to this. 
Yeah, it's great to be back here uh, one year later. I even thought I'd kick off with a little bit of a follow-up from last year. And uh, what a great conference you guys put together. So thanks thanks again for having me. Yeah, it's a real pleasure. And, and just before you get going, uh, if you guys do enjoy the conference, please go ahead and take the time to leave a like down below, subscribe to the channel, uh, check out all the speakers. And uh, I think, Matt, you'd love some participation as well. So if you have any questions uh, for Matt, uh, drop them in the live chat and we'll have a dedicated Q&A at the very end. Uh, and with that, Matt, the, the floor is all yours. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited for this one. Perfect. Thanks again, Richard. So today I want to kind of tackle this with a, a bit of a different view, kind of to follow on actually a little bit from my presentation of last year, but uh, you know, it's not, a, it's not a required watch. Um, I want to discuss the right time for growth stocks. So it's all about context and environment is the way I kick this off. And I think myself and, and probably most people, but I, I know I definitely fell into this camp, was you start investing and you want to know when do I buy? What's the trigger? What do I use? How do I get in? And there's just so much beyond that you know it's just really interesting we get so fixated and and with you know it's the reasonable logical progression say hey i can't make money if i don't buy at the right time but what i've, I've come to realize that you know like everything else there's, there's just a time for things to work and those same tools that will work in some environments won't necessarily work in others so that context is really really key so that's kind of like the uh theme i wanted to go with uh, on today's presentation because i i don't see that too often i just think it's so critical for success so kind of kicking off with the first slide, this is the slide I actually had last year. So I was discussing last year, uh, this is the S&P 500. Up here is the uh, Bank of America uh, Lynch uh, High Yield Index. And um, I was just showing this very strong relationship between uh, interest rates and the uh, stock market. Now, I specifically picked high yield interest rates, so, so high yield debt. So that's the kind of lower quality debt. Lower quality debt moves similarly to equities, to stocks, because... If you're a lower quality debt, there's a higher chance of you know not being paid back. So you really need the company to succeed. Whereas if you're like really pristine debt, top of the heap, you can even get paid back even if the company goes into bankruptcy. So there's a very strong relationship between the two of them. And this is where we left off last year. I kind of had this like red line along the top around you know nine percent, which has been kind of the area things have gotten to in the recent uh, more significant market corrections. Although 08 was definitely like a, a standout with the financial crisis. And so I want to kind of update that for where we are here. And this kind of black bar is where that last chart left off. And so you can see really where uh, this peaked late last October is where we bought him. So again, a lot of what I try and focus on, because there's so much noise out there, there's a million and one things you can look at, is really like, how do I understand the real mechanics of what the market is? And so I just thought it would be a great example. This doesn't mean that this is easy to predict. Obviously, if you have to know where high yield the index is going to go to know where the S&P is going to go. It's not just simply easy to predict this, but we'll we'll look at tools after on how to kind of have a better idea of what's going to come next. But just the important foundational understanding of what really drives the stock market or what are the, what, what are one of the main drivers? And this high yield uh, debt pricing is one of them. And of course, that's a, a whole discussion in and of itself, which you can probably view last year's presentation and other stuff I've spoken about. But just to kind of show that like the mechanics still hold true so although it's been a bit of a, a weird market this past year, I mean, we've had interest rates that we haven't seen for decades and, uh, you know, the Federal Reserve going from QE to QT and all of these, all of these like kind of new economic changes, people will say, oh, you know, the market's broken. Well, the underlying mechanics are not broken. Doesn't mean it's an easy market, but the underlying mechanics are not broken. It's really just uh, the situation that we're in. Kind of, uh, I you know, interesting that I used NVIDIA last year, not that I... Uh, knew it, NVIDIA was going to be this monster AI leader, but I was just showing how this relationship also is very dominant with an even growth, uh, specifically growth stocks. And you can see how when yields started to really rise last year, uh, that's when NVIDIA went to this kind of bear market. So kind of fast forwarding again to this year, this is where we left off on last year's slide. You can see really the ultimately the low in NVIDIA was the peak in high yield debt and Obviously, thanks to NVIDIA's kind of um, innovative products and all the rest, this is kind of shot way back, even much faster than general indexes. But the underlying mechanics, again, the sensitivity to the changes of interest rates, especially high yield debt, uh, played a major role in, in calling like the top of the stock and the bottom. So regardless of everything that the company was doing, it still had to kind of work within that paradigm of the general flows of the market in general. So the need for context. So this is something like, you know, I, I've... You know, like every other trader, we write things for reminders for ourselves. And this is one I've written for myself. And, you know, with thousands of stocks, most of what we do in this business is say no. And we have to work hard to find the few times when it makes sense to say yes. 
And that's really true because especially even beyond the thousands of listed stocks, I mean, I think between NASDAQ, NYSE, Amex were, I, don't know, I know north of like 7,000 securities. On top of that, you have to figure you can look at a weekly chart, a daily chart, a five-minute chart, an hourly. I mean, there's an endless stream of things to look at. So when do we say yes? We need that context. Without that, we're going to be lost in the sea of markets. And, you know, even my own personal journey, I mean, I've tried all kinds of strategies from I was a market maker, pro trader, I was a day trader, a swing trader, now a position trader. And it's really, you need to build that context around yourself with the kind of business you want to run. So let's take a look now at Roku. Again, back to the original thought, we need to focus on what are the, you know, the, the, the techniques to buy a stock? Well, we have here what I would call a perfect three-touch trend line. You can see this trend line was touched three times. Absolutely perfectly respected. We close above the trend line. And wow, look at this massive advance. You can see this is the trend line way back here in, in June and this monster move, right? So you say, hey, that trend line and trend lines, you know, are like technical analysis 101. I use it in my work all the time. Most people like novice to the market will say, okay, great. So now I know how to buy stocks. I need to just use those trend lines. So now we say, oh, we've got another great three touch trend line. We have one touch, two touch, three touch, four touch, five touch, six touch. This is a real authentic trend line. It's perfectly drawn. And look at this great candle that busts above this trend line. And uh oh, we have this big, big drop lower. So what happened? I mean, why could the, that same technique work so well in one environment that led to kind of these like instant profits? And this other environment, we kind of just like popped up two days and rolled over and really fell apart. I mean, from 140, 150, like fell in half within a few months, kind of the exact opposite outcome from the prior trend line break. So, you know, again, with thousands of trend lines, this is a, this is a vital question. If you're going to use any tool, you have to know, well, why did it work one time, but then it didn't work another time? So I said, let's take a step back. Let's learn a lesson from Walmart. So Walmart failed in Germany. Now, I know this may feel like a big, uh, uh, you know, side, side path here from our main discussion at hand, but I, I just want to give the right context here of what, of kind of how to think about all of this. Because again, all of this, this business is a thought business. So Walmart failed in Germany, uh, like terribly, terribly failed. This is a recent article from your May uh, 2023. So now is Walmart a successful company? I know it's not a, a very uh, hard question to answer, but I just want to show the context. Walmart's ranked number one for the ninth year in a row uh, for the amount of revenue that it produced in a year. So it is the global revenue champion with $570 billion of revenue here on the last time for uh, Fortune updated this. So, I mean, this is a monstrously successful company. So what went wrong? So uh, they had a below cost strategy. This is just a, a recap from a, a website that I took uh, that I showed before. Uh, you know, uh, Walmart and German unions were incompatible. Walmart had underestimated the competition. I think some important things, you know, uh, Walmart failed to take into account cultural differences surrounding shopping. So there's just, you know, there's just so much here that Walmart kind of got wrong. But McDonald's seems to be getting it right. You can see McDonald's is, is at all-time highs and is, is really an international brand, unlike Walmart. But take a look at breakfast from places around, from McDonald's, <laughs> McDonald's around the world. This is Costa Rica. This is Turkey. This is Indonesia. This is Saudi Arabia. I mean, whereas Walmart just didn't really account for the cultural differences and, and you know, like the unions and, and the employees and what, I mean, McDonald's, Taylor, although it's like a burger joint, right? I mean, it's meat and potatoes and that's what McDonald's does. But when it came down to like key um, options for, for, for uh, customers around the world, they tailor fit their menu. So the key to success is context and environment. You know, if, if Walmart failed by not adapting its strategy for its environment, why would you win by applying a tool with a disregard for context? I mean, we must remember that this is a business. And so we all approach trading and we get lost in the sea of tickers and flashing lights and alarms and trend lines and, and uh, P&L. And we forget that we're operating a business. And so whereas McDonald's really had that focus on context, Walmart kind of missed the mark. And so I, I just thought it was just a perfect example because Walmart has an incredibly successful strategy. I mean, they rolled it out across many countries, hyper successful globally in terms of revenue. And even with their kind of scale, their success, I mean, you could just think of the amount of money and strategy and plan they have to implement the business when they kind of go anywhere. For them to kind of fail, um, you know, business is hard, environments are different, it's not easy to uh, adapt, but if, if even they can fail when the environment and the context changes, 
I mean, that's just such a critical pillar to success if you're going to be able to work in different environments. Now, the interesting thing about trading, unlike a lot of other businesses, is that the environment that you're operating in is always trading. Like, I mean, Walmart can be dominant, for example. I mean, it's dominant throughout the United States. But, you know, there's some chains that are dominant, like in the South or the Northeast or the Northwest. And, like, they know their customer and, and they just stay in that environment and they operate there. And, and they can kind of almost somewhat block out the world and be successful for a long time in their niche market. Trading, you're not so – you can't really kind of um, – block everyone else away. The market's always changing. The economy's going to change. Interest rates are going to change. Companies are going to change. Uh, investors, attitudes, sentiment is going to change. That if, that you know impacts general trends. It impacts volatility. It impacts liquidity. And so, so you can't block that out. You can't say, I'm just going to do one thing and ignore it all. And even if you have only one technique, that technique won't work all the time because the market itself is changing. So you can't kind of block out the world like some companies can. So identifying environment is so critical. You know, it's interesting. Years ago, I was um, I started with uh, my my passion for technical analysis. Um, I'm a past president even of the Canadian Society of Technical Analysts. I have my my chartered market tactician designation. I ended up on a an email thread uh, before the days of like these Discord groups with some of like the the best of technical analysis, like all the the legends. And I was like really young and I was like, hey, you know, like instead of focusing on when to buy, what if we just, if there was a way to figure out what the trend will be? And I kind of got like, you know, it was almost like a, a smart answer saying, well, if we knew that, we wouldn't have to figure out when to buy. But I, that, that question always kind of, so I was, it was kind of disregarded, like a ridiculous question. But in my mind, it's like, ah, that, you know, it always sat with me. If I could just figure that out, that really changes a lot. And, and I, so I think it was wrong for that person to have dismissed that question because I think it's a, a fundamental question that, that sets the stage for when different things are going to be are going to work, so taking a look now at that same Bank of America, uh, uh, ICE Bank of America High Yield Index, and, and down here I have the Nasdaq Net 52 Week High Lows. So this is a tool that I've come to really depend upon to help me figure out what environment I'm operating in. Now, basically, all you're doing is each day you're looking at the number of stocks making 52 week highs versus 52 week lows, and you take the net number. So if there's 100 new highs and 20 new 52 week lows your net is 80. So there's more, overall, there's more highs. This is really important because there's different measures of breadth. You can look at the advanced decline line and this and that, but like, for example, the advanced decline line or the amount of up volume versus down volume, every single day, um, a stock's going to be up or down. A stock could be up a penny, it counts as up. A stock could be down 10 cents, it counts as down. To make 52-week highs is a specific event. I mean, there has to be a, a buyer who's willing to pay the highest price of the past year. So someone has to have conviction for that to happen. And, you know, there could be a stock that can kind of like advance, you know, for three days, half a percent, but then fall 10% in one day. So net, net, the stock is down. But in the advanced decline line, you have three advances and one decline. So I feel that, you know, to really measure actually net progress or or, or net, uh, you know, uh, net, um, what's the word, the opposite of progress, net, net declines, I guess you can say, you know, 52 week highs and lows do a better job of really showing how many stocks are really winning, like they're really advancing, not just up on the day, but making, you know, new 52 week highs versus those making 52 week lows. So when you kind of put this together and you see this on this chart, so the green bars is when you have more highs than lows, the red bars when you have more lows than highs. I even kind of took off the stock market in this picture just to show that this relationship between when yields are falling, so, you know, uh, which is bullish for the market in general, which we looked at at the beginning of this presentation. When yields are falling, you can see you get an environment where more stocks are making 52-week highs. So my focus is growth investing. I've done probably everything under the sun from uh, M&A to spread trading, day trading, you know, I've tried all kinds of stuff. And I've, I've really, over time, my passion has always been growth investing. That's all I do right now. And this is particularly important for growth investing because growth investors, uh, growth stocks really take off in an environment where you know, people are a little more speculative in nature. They're actually willing to pay 52-week highs for something new. So new highs, new breakouts. Goes back to kind of the foundational concepts of William O'Neill. Uh, we lost him this year. May he rest in peace. Uh, absolute legend. Whoever hasn't read his book, How to Make Money in Stocks, should absolutely run to the store or the website to uh, have Amazon buy that. And so I, I said, you know, if I can identify these periods of time where we really have this net progress, I'll just be way ahead of the game. So I, I don't necessarily need to know what the direction is or every single wiggle of this high yield index. You can see there's periods here where, you know, it advances a little bit, but 
in general, you still have uh, a period where there's more stocks making new highs. So that's really the most important thing for me in real time to make this decision process, should I be buying or selling, is do we have more highs than lows? So typically, if we take even a, a longer term view, this is going back, you know, way back uh, to 2010, as far as I could fit on the chart. Because a lot of people will say like, oh, the recent market is just so unique because of COVID and the Fed and all of that. Well, it's not that. Again, like that's why I want to start off with the original um, images of what I spoke about last year to this year. The mechanics, the mechanics of the stock market machine are are, are consistent. They, they've been working the same. What's a little bit odd about this environment, and because I think we're dealing with a more difficult economic backdrop to kind of really uh, bring inflation under control, is that, and this is a technical analysis concept, where you know most bottoms are an event and most tops are a process. So it takes time for like a, a stock or a market to kind of top out as there's like this, this distribution or this kind of slowdown of the uptrend. Whereas bottoms are usually an event. It's like things, people get scared, or there's like a fear, there's a drop, a crash or a hard landing. And we turn around, we turn the corner and, and we kind of improve. So if you take a look at other periods of time where we had these like spikes in the high yield index, you can see they, they were all accompanied with net lows. I kind of circled the red backdrop uh, is the same backdrop that shows the, the net lows in the bottom. And so you can see all of these spikes, all major spikes that led to market corrections were accompanied by net lows. What's a little bit different and has made this a little more difficult for growth investing this past uh, several, you know, past few months, even though, you know, markets bottomed in October, we've had a lot of sideways chop in the high yield index, whereas other market bottoms have had this kind of steep rollover where we got back into a new uptrend after the peak fear, the peak worry ended. This this cycle has been a little bit different, but uh, ultimately, if the high yield index does come back to a a, a more a more normal level, I don't, I don't know if we'll see the lows of, um, you know, the kind of like the top of the last bull market, which was uh, really impacted by abnormal kind of monetary policy. If we got back from this 8.4 that we're at now, when I took this, this last chart slide to the 6% range, I mean, there's a lot of downside in yields and that would mean a lot of upside in stocks. Of course, we need inflation to come under control, which hopefully it does. But this really just shows how these net lows have been instrumental in kind of protecting, avoiding this bear market, keeping us, uh, keeping us out of all of this chop. Currently, just very recently, we've had, this is not a, a very good zoomed in chart, but we've just turned back into kind of net highs as this high yield index has started to roll over once more. Again, ultimately we need this to really kind of come lower to get a real big bull market in growth stocks. But this is really identifying the key times when growth stocks are the place to go. Why even focus on growth stocks? Well, they provide the outsized returns. If you're someone who says, I wanna make as much money as possible in the market, and that's not everybody's goal. Some people's goal is, I want the best risk adjusted return. I just want to make X percent and guarantee my capital. There's many different uh, desires for uh, investors. But if your goal is, you know, maximizing returns and growth stocks are the place for that uh, because as they grow, they have the most upside. And the best time to participate in those is when we have these periods of net highs because that's the net highs are a reflection of falling yields. Falling yields pushes stocks to new 52 week highs. But now I want to say, you know, but great stocks are exempt, right? Right? Everyone will say like, this stock, five years, they're going to do amazing. doesn't matter what goes on. Look at what they have. I mean, it's incredible. I mean, this, this stock has to go higher. Well, these are a bunch of stocks. I picked um, kind of like a February 2016. And I want to show 12 stocks. And this is uh, IPG uh, Photonics. This is the Trex company, Five Below, Planet Fitness, these are four companies right here. Let's advance a little bit. We have Top Build, uh, Atlassian, uh, Bowsen, Nvidia. And here we have Lending Tree, Square, Shopify, and uh, Coherent. So you can see these are all the same. Let me go back up a little bit. These are all the same period. These are all one year ending in February of 2016. You can see there's very little action in all of these companies. So, I mean, some of these like Planet Fitness are just rolling off a cliff after their IPO. You can see Trex has is, is been much lower over the year. Take a look at Team, you kind of IPO and rolled over. NVIDIA had this big rally, but then kind of fell over. Uh, BZUN is like falling right into the lows. Top build looks awful. Um, take a look at Shopify. What a horrible company. This is just falling right. I would never touch this company, right? Well, let's take a look at what happens next. So... Clearly, a good company would not be held back by anything. 
This is all one year later. What came next? Well, here's BLD. We went from 28 to 60. Here's BZUN. We went from, I don't know, $5 to 37. Atlassian, we went from 20 to 30, 36. NVIDIA, we went from, oh, I don't know, we'll call it seven, seven to 40. Uh, IPGP, we went from 85 to 163. Five below, we went from 36 to 54. Planet Fitness from 15 to 24. Trex from 10 to 20. Uh, Lending Tree, we went from 80 to 229. Square from 10 to 28. Shopify, this awful company from three to 10. Uh, of course, these are split adjusted. Coherent from 17 to 40. So what changed? Well, this is where that first chart ended. That was that February of 2016. And that, all those stocks were awful because we were in a period where yields were climbing. So as yields are climbing, that's not a conducive environment for growth stocks or for, for most companies, specifically growth stocks. What came next was just this steady stream lower where yields started to fall. And we got into this beautiful uh, pattern of net highs over most of this period of time. So if you would have just looked at all of those stocks and you said, oh, for that whole prior year, I don't, I don't have the whole prior chart here, but you know, mostly net lows, very few periods to really buy the stock, avoid or be very tactical. And then after the, to the next period of time, you're saying, whoa, I got to be invested in these. You're able to capture substantial gains, yet avoid all the drops. So these were all great companies. I mean, look at Shopify, went from three to 10. Was that an awful company? A couple of weeks prior, no. Did it have all the right fundamentals? Yeah. Did it have, uh, you, know, you know, was it a young company? Was it innovating? Yes. What happened? Well, it had nothing to do with the company. Context, environment. The context and the environment changed. If you were applying, um, let me go back to Shopify here. Where was that? Oh, my bad. Apologies for the uh, quick jumps. Oh, here we go. If you were applying like trend line breaks anywhere, like on this downtrend in Shopify, you just kept losing. Even if you're trying to buy these breakouts, they ran up, they rolled back over. Same with Square. If you if you set up here, we had, oh, we have this kind of flat base, buy the breakout. Oh, you get slammed from 13 down to eight. Just uh, an awfully a difficult environment. If you just said, oh, look at Lending Tree, we have this kind of double bottom breakout time, bang, from 130 down to 54. So nothing's working. Then you kind of fast forward a little bit and you can look at all these charts individually. But then tree, that same stock that, you know, that just hurt you with that fake double bottom, well, from 100 to 229. Shop, that stock that gave you fake breakouts from three to 10. That context environment is critical. So let's go back to Roku and those trend lines. So what changed? So this is that first uh, kind of trend line break that we had. And you can see what came next. This first of all took place with a backdrop of net highs. And you can see what came next is this massive advance came on the back of a steady stream of net highs. So there was a couple of small little period right here where we had a little correction very quickly back to net highs and away we went again. And so again, the context in the environment was the difference. Taking a look again at Roku here, you can see we have this trend line break. Uh, the environment context is all wrong. We kind of had this little pop up, roll right over, uh, and we just kept rolling down a cliff. And you can even see there was a few times, like right here with this little bounce off the lows because there's net highs, but this is just a stock in so much trouble and it was under so much pressure because of net lows. Uh, and it's just been absolutely awful. So how does this fool us? So this, you know, all these questions that, I mean, every new trader, every even experienced trader will ask themselves in periods of drawdown is, you know, this tool doesn't work. Uh, I don't know how the markets work. Then after a good time, you say, oh, this tool is perfect. I'm perfect. Well, I can't, I can't miss or... You know, I was too aggressive at the wrong time. I had, I had, you know, too little stock at the best time. And you're always doing the wrong thing at the wrong time because you're always chasing what just worked. So what just worked was the most recent environment. That, that environment may persist for some more time and may keep going. Um, but ultimately, that, that may not be the case. So it's not so much that the tool doesn't work. It's that the context is wrong. Now, growth investing is really a subset of the market in general. So, I mean, even recently, um, you know, the NASDAQ has had a really good year. Um, but if you look at different indexes, the Russell 2000 has been awful. The S&P 500 has been, you know, uh, subpar, especially compared to the NASDAQ. And it's really been kind of like these big mega cap stocks that that really uh, contribute to the, the large, uh, if not all the gains and more of the NASDAQ 100. And so, this is a bit of an odd situation. Uh, typically, the indexes reflect better what's going on 
with the general market. But in this current environment, uh, that hasn't been the case. And growth is a subset of the market. So if you're really focusing on growth in general, your job is not necessarily to kind of just look at the NASDAQ 100, which in most cases, it will provide a good context for what's going on. But you really need to look beyond the NASDAQ 100, like the NASDAQ 100, the S&P, these are also just indicators or, or the indexes. You can use them as indicators or, or, or signposts of what the market's doing. But it won't necessarily always project the environment for growth stocks. And so this is kind of, you know, a whole other kind of complex discussion we can have. But, you know, depending on what you're trying to capture, and again, with thousands of stocks, thousands of opportunities, you need to define what your business is going to be. Just like Walmart failed to define its, you know, its business in Germany, uh, or, or at least adapt it. If you don't identify what you're trying to capture specifically, you're always going to be in this environment where you go from thinking that your tool is good to thinking that it's broken, to thinking that you're great, to thinking that you're awful. And it's really that you need to understand what you're trying to capture, what environment works for you. And then after just understanding, are we in that right environment uh, for what I'm trying to capture? So I think kind of going beyond tools. And again, I, this, I'm not sure I haven't had a chance to see all the other great presenters uh, this weekend. But typically, a lot of presentations revolve around when to buy or when to sell. Uh, and I, I just I just felt that it's really important to kind of have an understanding of how though all of that relies so much on the environment that you're operating in. And, you know, so that, that even if you're outside growth investing, if you're a value investor, well, for someone like Warren Buffett, where let's say he wants to buy deep value when stocks are, are dropping hard, he wants an environment where he sees actually yields kind of skyrocketing and prices coming down. And he'll say like, hey, look, by my model, this company is perfectly healthy. There's nothing wrong with this. So I'm going to take advantage of this moment in time where yields are excessively high because of inflation, which won't persist. And I'm going to buy these value companies and so an environment that may not be great for a growth stock will be absolutely phenomenal for a value investor. And that's why it's interesting enough when you look at performance statistics, there's some environments that where value investors are top dogs. Other times people will laugh at them and say, ah, oh, value investing is no longer relevant. Growth investing is the way to go. Then, you know, fast forward two years later and the value guys will say, ah, oh, growth investors, they just, they just, you know, monkeys who follow momentum. They have no idea what they're doing. It's value that counts. And at the end of the day, it's the stock value that matters most. And it's this yin and yang between the environment we're in that's rewarding different strategies. So I would love to say that's easy to kind of jump between strategies at the right time. That's incredibly difficult. I think there's a reason why if you look at all the best investors in the world, they're not like one second a growth investor, one second a global macro investor, one second a value investor. This business is so difficult and complex that I think you need to be an absolute specialist in what you do. But I, I think instead of kind of trying to argue the case of, you know, this strategy is better than that strategy, find the strategy that fits your personality, fits your risk tolerance, fits, fits your goals. And then after work really hard and not just trying to understand, you know, when do I buy, but under also what environment, what context do I operate? Because when you're building in, whenever you go from passive investing in the market to active investing in the market, you leave the world of being an investor and you enter the world of being an entrepreneur. So by that, I mean, you can no longer look at what the market returns are because if you're an active investor, you're applying a strategy, you're actually applying a business model. That's It's no different from someone saying, you know, I'm going to open up a local bakery. Well, if you're opening up a local bakery, you can't expect to just make the returns of like, you know, US GDP. I mean, you're, you're very specific at how you run that bakery. You have good products. I mean, it's two different worlds. So if you become an active investor, you know, sitting back and saying like, oh, I should have, you know, beat the S&P or the NASDAQ, you should be destroying the NASDAQ in the right environment. Other times you may underperform. What matters is that you have a strategy that at the end of the day for your, your time and effort, you know, outpaces what would have been passive returns. Um, but that, that you're really focused on applying your business specifically. So stop driving yourself crazy, uh, trying to figure out the right tool and the right buy point, understand what is your business, internalize that with your actual beliefs and what you want to capture and, and all of that. And then understand the right environment that, um, will make you execute the best uh, with, with all of this. So how do you really win a trading overall? Again, speaking of a business and entrepreneur, I say the same as every other entrepreneur. You need to study, you need persistence, self-belief, you need to take action, take risk, incremental improvement, and relentless, relentless work ethic. So, you know, it's interesting. All of these just sound like talking points. Um, but it's almost like as I uh, mature as, as an investor and a trader, and, and I, you know, I have other businesses that I'm, I've started and I'm working on, 
it's just each of these points are so critical. I mean, you need to study to build this foundation. Like all the stuff we spoke about today, this took me years to kind of understand and piece together because again, it's this massive learning curve. So you need to have that study. But there's going to be periods of time where it's going to be hard and you need that persistence you know, to keep working at it. But if you don't have like self-belief, if you don't really think that you can ultimately do it, or if you don't really believe in yourself, you won't really have the persistence to kind of get through all of that. Um, and then after there's going to be periods of time where you kind of get scared, markets get rough, your strategy is underperforming. You're going to ask yourself, like, did it really work only because I was in the right place at the right time? So you need to have to always have the ability to take action, take risk. And incremental improvement. This is a business of constantly improving every business is. I mean, what Home Depot offers today is not what Home Depot offered 30 years ago. I mean, the business has evolved and they keep making it better and incremental, but that's how they keep out the competition. And I think relentless work ethic, um, kind of a, as an homage to, you know, William O'Neill, who, like I mentioned, passed away recently. Was, I think everyone knows him. If they don't, again, look him up for a legendary investor. He was known for his relentless work ethic. And, and that's something I always try and bring to, to my work. Um, just constant, constantly focused thinking about it and kind of, especially if you're going to trade for a living, which is what I do, almost like life and, and markets become one of the same and, and you have to, you're, you're always on your mind and, and just trying to kind of follow this arc of these key traits. Um, I really want to kind of go again above buy points and just the overall most important elements between environment and what it takes to kind of survive the changes of environment. And this is really, it's like every other entrepreneur. Again, when you move from passive investing to active investing, you leave the world of, of being an investor and you enter the world of being an entrepreneur. I think we don't, most people don't uh, acknowledge it um, or if they think it for a second, they don't internalize it. I mean, I, I've, I've learned that internalizing something where it's actually part of your core belief and just saying like, oh, I know that are, are two very, very distinct things. And that's something that like a book can't do for you. That's something that, that your persistent application and think uh, thought process will, will do with time. So internalizing these key beliefs Understanding the environment context you have to operate in is what will tie everything together in your system and um, really determine when tools will work, when they won't work, and help you to understand, am I messing up? Am I doing something wrong? Uh, and, and how do I maximize the good times? How do I say, wow, this is the time to really put my foot down? So uh, that's my presentation for today. I'm happy to um, jump into Q&A. Uh, again, this is a real passion of mine. Um, and so, as you can see, this is a, it, it goes beyond just talking points for me. I could really talk about this all day, but, uh, anyways, Richard, thanks for having me on. Uh, you can all follow me at Caruso Insights. I'm on Twitter, uh, even YouTube. Uh, so if there's any Q and A, I'm happy to, uh, to answer Richard. Yeah, Matt. Uh, for, first of all, thank you so much uh, for your presentation. Uh, it always provides a, a different perspective that is extremely helpful for people. Um, as I, I've got a few questions of my own, and then we'll go over to uh, the audience. And if you have any questions for Matt, this is the perfect time to leave it in the chat. I see a few great ones already coming in, so make sure you get yours uh, entered. Um, first, Matt, uh, going back to uh, a chart of the current market versus the new highs and, and the mm -hmm. debt as well, if, if you could. Um, sure, absolutely. Let me bring yeah. that up. Sorry, sorry to make you bring it back. No, I had it ready. I had a feeling okay. that would come up, so I had it ready for you. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Uh, so how are, how are you kind of handling the current envir environment? How are you interpreting things? Uh, new hot new highs are you know showing up a little bit. Uh, what what are your thoughts on kind of uh, where where you where we stand right now? So down here you can see this uh, the net highs net lows tool that I use. This this year I just kind of break out in this bottom panel is just new highs by themselves, so not the net number, just to kind of see how many stocks are actually breaking out. Uh, just visually for myself, but we could hide that for this discussion. So you can see this is the QQQ, and this is what I think a lot of people are talking about at this current point in time. And, and this had a really nice strong leg up, but you, you can see like, whoa, for most of this advance here, uh, you know, we first started getting net lows, let's say February 20, from this point here, it looks like, whoa, this indicator is broken. But again, you need to know your tools and like the NASDAQ 100, I think the top five or six stocks are the majority of the index. So, that, and those have been the ones that have been moving so strongly. If you take a look at, um, the QQQE, which is an equal weight, NASDAQ 100. You can see from when this tool started to go negative, we've been a little more kind of flat. Or if you look at the QQQJ, which is the, um, let me just bring it all here, yeah, uh, which is the next the next uh, 100. So there's a NASDAQ 100. This would be like 101 to 200. You can see this, you know, again, my focus is growth. Most growth is not usually, typically in the, the top five biggest companies. Usually there's like, you know, it's, it's smaller, innovative companies. You can see when this kind of turned negative, we've gone nowhere to sideways. So 
I think um, we're seeing some improvement on the bottom. Uh, hopefully, if inflation kind of keep coming down, we may ultimately get that high yield index to really break lower. And so whereas the QQQ looks a little extended, if you kind of look around that growth, again, understanding your environment, what you're focusing on, which for me is really growth, this is really, I mean, like maybe first inning. I mean, if that high yield index really comes off, this has a long way to kind of go to catch up with the QQQ and everything in general. You can see that in other kind of more aggressive, you know, Russell 2000. This has been really sideways since the net lows came in. If you look at, let's say, ARC, innovation which is uh, known for kind of uh, higher growth you see very flat since uh, during that entire net lows period so I, I think again it comes down to understanding index construction understanding your tools in a lot of environments it's not important because things typically work <laughs> normally you, you know like traditional correlations and all uh, but this is, hasn't been normal and that's caused because of the spike in inflation so the environment changed and that's a whole other discussion but looking at the tool now what's it reflecting it's reflecting that never mind that the top five biggest stocks where there's been a big move there, but stocks in general, growth in general, we're starting to see some strength. You can see stocks like, for example, IoT, which you know had great earnings, these big fast moves, and you can see suddenly like the more aggressive type of stocks coming into um, into play. So we'll see ultimately how they work out. But I think the QQQJ is probably the best representation of a little more of a growth spin to uh, the major indexes. And, and you can see that finally after what's been a, a lengthy kind of correction since February, uh, the net highs are starting to kind of show that that's starting to change. And we'll see if that persists. I think a lot will depend on the forward inflation numbers. Yeah, fantastic. And how, how aggressive have you personally been uh, in this environment? Have you been putting on some exposure and, and trying to capitalize on on the, the themes that are working, AI, semiconductors, that type of thing? Or are you still kind of watching and, and looking for the best opportunities? So again, that comes into like, again, how, how you put out your exposure. The way I kind of uh, put my exposures, I, I leg into positions. Uh, it's actually, originally, a lot of the process came from Livermore in his book, Reminiscence of Stock Operator, where he kind of discusses how he puts on exposure. So I was in cash through, because of the net lows, through most of this period here, which, uh, you know, I have to admit, when you saw the QQQ kind of like running up, was like a little frustrating at one point, especially this last period here where it started to kind of go up. Um, but it's been a, maybe a couple of weeks now. I started to put some exposure on as we first started getting net highs right back here. I started to do some buying. And so I have, I have a good amount of exposure. I'm not on margin yet, but the way I kind of step in is, is I build some exposure when markets kind of pause. Then after, usually as we get a kind of a second push, mm -hmm. I end up on margin as, as I see profit, I build cushions, then I add into strength. Yeah, perfect. And and how often do you check uh, the net new highs, new lows, and also the, the debt levels? How often do you kind of consider those indicators and take that into account and that, that kind of informs you about the overall context, uh, the overall environment that we're in. So I check it daily. Um, and, and that's why, you know, also I, I, I kind of break out the number of new highs. Um, you know, you can get into kind of more nuances of the indicator. There could be periods of time where, um, for example, I'll, I'll look at, let's say, um, uh, let me see if I can find an example here. Uh, you can see here we had like, for example, like net lows was like one day, Mm -hmm. uh, this little red bar. And that was really just because like new highs dried up. So if you look at this bottom here, so it wasn't really driven by like massive breakdowns. So like uh, I like to look at the internals. So I, I look day to day. But if, for example, if we get one day of net lows, it's not like, oh my, I need to be in complete cash. It's like you want to look at, you know, it's a warning shot. Uh, that's why I color the background red when we have like three days in a row or more of consecutive days because there's this continual breakdown. Uh, but I think it's important to look at also is it just kind of like a pause in new highs or are you seeing an actual acceleration in new lows? So if you kind of uh, double click this tool, which you can add this to your charts um, for trading view users, I get this question. If you type in US, uh, US markets, net highs, net lows, you'll see the tool here by Caruso Insights, which you can add to your charts. But you can break this into kind of uh, looking at the highs and lows versus the net number. And if you take a look at, uh, for example, let's say market peaks, uh, you'll see here, interestingly, like, not only do you see kind of like the number of highs like level off as the market starts to sour, uh, but then you can see that the number of new lows really starts to pick up. So like before this, the, the actual index breaks down, you can just see the number of new lows. Like there's very few stocks making new lows. All of a sudden, whoa, you can see this big breakdown internally. Like by the time the market has first like down day from the peak, you can see the number of new lows had, had you know, uh, accelerated to the highest level in months. So I, I kind of look at the overall nuances of the uh, internals. I'll look at it daily. 
Uh, but also I, I really like bigger pictures. So on weekends, I spent, I put extra effort in seeing, you know, what are the general trends? Is, has anything changed in terms of yields? Because during the week, there was a lot of noise. So it's just being sure to never get caught off guard with any big uptrend or downtrend. I mean, I wait for at least three days before I get really worried uh, if there's net lows, right? You know, I want to see at least three days of net highs before I start to get a little more excited to kind of uh, slow my thought process from, you know, bull, bear, bull, bear. You want to kind of try and uh, segregate the actual true trends. Yeah. And and going maybe back to your presentation and, and looking at past, um, you know, trends after bear markets, what, what kind of observations have you made about the net new high, new low index in terms of, you know, it, it seemed to me that it reaches a peak and then it kind of peters off a little bit after that initial burst upwards. What do you hope to see as a trend develops in terms of that indicator? Yeah, I think that's normal. And again, that kind of, uh, so here, let's bring up the actual QQQ for a little more uh, history. So you can see, for example, if we look at the last bear, uh, bull market, and this is uh Pretty, you, you brought up a topic that's consistent with most uh, bull markets, and you'll see divergences at the end. So you can see here, if we kind of blow this up, you'll see that you have, you know, it starts to kind of pick up steam at the beginning of the bull market. You get your peak, usually mid-market, and then you start to see these divergences late market. Um, there's going to be rotations within the, 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 the bull market. Um, and again, those rotations are going to be driven typically by interest rates. So as any kind of a uh, bull market goes on, a real bull market is typically associated with an improving economy. As the economy picks up pace and people get more excited, eventually that leads to inflationary pressures. You know, people are doing more business and buying and selling and inflation picks up. So as inflation picks up, you start to see rates start to finally rise and we start to get the, you know, the opposite of what leads to the bull market. You know, the bull market starts when high yields start to drop and the next bull bear market starts when high yields start to climb. But when that just starts to begin, you know, that sets off a series of winners and losers. So high growth typically in general benefits from falling yields, whereas more cyclical names or energy or, you know, with, with bigger current earnings, they benefit from rising interest rates. They're more attractive relative. So that, that will offset kind of this, um, uh, the highs and lows between industries. So that's why kind of mid cycle is the point where there's maximum participation. At the end of the last bear market, there's some stocks that are still kind of having a hard time with a bad economy. At the end of the bull market, there's some stocks that start to suffer as the Fed starts to raise rates to kind of slow down the economy. And so there's always seems to be that kind of sweet spot in the middle where the economy is improving, uh, inflation hasn't come up yet, interest rates haven't started to rise yet, and then everybody has a good old time. Like this is, uh, investors don't realize it, but this is the kind of part of the stock market that everybody loves the most is that like middle part. And at uh, the beginning, people tend to be frustrated that they miss it. The end, people tend to get upset that they stay too long. And uh, this is really the fun part. And, and I know we're looking at the COVID bull market, but if you kind of zoom out any uptrend, you can see this is the 2016 to 2018. It starts off, you know, positive. You get like the, the best grand old time, like right here. And then as you kind of got to your ultimate top, it starts to kind of like peter off and then you get into trouble. So that's really a, a recurring theme. You can look here, 2012 to 2014, you start off with some reasonable strength. You get the best, the big party. And then even as you kind of run into new highs, it starts to kind of slow down and you go into a bigger correction. So that's really the general arching uh, theme uh, of most uh, market trends. Yeah, that, that's that's awesome. Uh, and I think it's a really helpful visual to have this indicator on um, when looking at the market. Um, take, take a step back and maybe this is more, you know, directly applicable to what you talked about last year. But um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on on the Fed and, and that, you know, the overall macro environment and how that's impacting things and maybe where, you know, that how that could impact things in the future, depending on what actions uh, the Fed takes. Yeah, so the Fed's been aggressive. The problem's been inflation. Uh, it's, it's been sticky on the services front. So, I mean, inflation, you, you can look at goods. I remember during COVID, there was uh, people were all these jokes on the internet, like uh, of a lumber truck saying like, hey, look how rich that guy is because the wood prices have gone up so much. So that's like, the, there's the commodity side of inflation and there's the services side of inflation. The commodity side tends to level itself off much quicker as mo more supply comes in you know, buyers will argue, hey, you got a whole lot more wood there. I'm not paying top dollar anymore. But the discussion is a lot harder to have with employees. So employees would come to you and say, hey, look, you know, uh, prices have gone up at the store. I don't want a 2% raise. I want a 6% raise, you know, or I'm leaving. And, and you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a key employee. So you'll say, okay, 6%. Then after you need to raise your prices to consumers because you have to raise your price for employees. And that kicks off a vicious circle. That's really the Fed's worst nightmare. That's like entrenched, that, that's entrenched inflation expectations. And that's, I mean, the, the Federal Reserve has kind of its own Fed speak, which is uh, economic terminology. 
Um, so for e even investors, like my background, my, my undergrad was in economics. So I, I have a little bit more of a experience there, but for those who kind of are not accustomed to hearing fed speak, it may sound like a lot of gibberish, but uh, at times, but really the fed, their biggest fear with inflation is not even the little spurt in inflation. It's if everyone believes inflation will persist, that alone will make inflation persist because of that kind of vicious cycle. I just described If I asked for a raise, it means higher prices means I asked for a raise it means higher prices. And that's, the spiral that took place in the 1970s, and that's um, every Fed chair's um, biggest nightmare. So I think that's why the Fed kind of, when they realized they made like a disastrous call in 2021 about transitory inflation, they they raised prices here, uh, in, sorry, interest rates really aggressively. And so um, I think in terms of the current environment, if inflation does keep the c coming down, that would be great. If if these expectations don't become entrenched, you're seeing the goods prices already dropping, which is a big plus. So now I think if we just start to see like the inflation for services come back down or trend lower, which would mean that it's not becoming entrenched. People are not expecting, you know, constantly higher wages. Or if, they, if most people agree that, oh, that was a COVID related thing and it's over with, I got one raise and I'm done. I'm not going to keep like demanding raises. I think that ultimately that high yield index will start to really come, kind of come lower with, uh, you know, future lower interest rate expectations and we can get a really sizable bull market in uh, growth stocks again. That's the big battle. That's why every time there's this like CPI report, you see these massive moves in the stock market because everyone's trying to like figure out like, hey, looking forward, is this going to be entrenched? Do we have to stay higher for longer? And, you know, the Fed staying higher for longer or coming down lower. I mean, that has just massive impacts on the entire rotation like we spoke about. And uh, so that's what we're seeing here. Yeah, that's, that's my general thought process. Yeah, no, that's helpful. Um, and going back to the July time period of 2022, uh, we did see new highs, you know, start to come mm -hmm. in, come in here, and there was a pretty sizable rally there. Can you kind of touch on, you know, your your personal uh, evaluation of that in the moment, how you were taking into account that? Because uh, maybe it felt a little bit early, but we are seeing the new highs come in. What well, what were you kind of doing and, and observing at that point? Yeah, so I was actually, uh, so I was long quite a bit of energy and stuff from early of twenty twenty two. I saw that kind of bubbling up, and then after. Uh, with the you know the uh, Russian uh, Ukrainian war that like really got prices flying, but there was kind of like a summer calm and, and you know people will say like oh well you know it, it didn't persist so it doesn't work you know how could, you know if I'm just following along but the thing is the market's a reflection of of everything else like um, so at, at this time things didn't look as bad inflation wise or maybe you know participants believed it was going to level off a little bit sooner new data comes out new things change it's just like you know any company. You know, you could have this product that's doing great and it doesn't mean like, oh, it's a great product. We never have to do anything about it. I mean, things will change. Competitors come out, consumer preferences change. So, I mean, here, inflation data came out to say like, uh oh, it's, it's worse than we thought. And the Fed started to, you know, also uh, say that. And then we kind of rolled right over. So, you know, ultimately, the, it's not net highs that will cause a bull market. Net highs are, ref are a reflection of of what the market is thinking will happen now thankfully markets trend economies trend in general uh the federal reserve the entire economic system is built around kind of trying to get this like nice consistent growth and keeps everybody happy everyone feels like they're doing better in life or the economy is growing and so that's what that's what makes this work in that the entire system is built on trying to get this trend of you know continued slow growth can we get false alarms sure i mean we had inflation we hadn't seen in I don't know, 40 years. I mean, I think the bigger picture is, did you make sure you avoided getting absolutely run over and crushed by growth stocks that fell 90%? Yeah. And you can see we had net high, sorry, we had net lows, like right at the peak of the market. So anyone just using any kind of minimal type of guardrails of saying, okay, is this a right environment would have said, this is definitely not a right environment. Even if you participated a bit here, which I did, and then I had to exit here as we got back to net lows. Uh, me, I, I don't remember now if I made a bit or lost a little bit in this period, but it, it was ends up being because it's kind of like a, a false start. It's just something that you, you kind of forget about thanks to your risk management rules or you made a couple of bucks and you just avoid these disastrous drops that for me, that's the big key. Yeah, I remember I remember doing the pod, the first podcast we ever did with Stan Weinstein right in that November 2021 area. And he, he was talking about you know, very similar things that you're watching the, the, you know, the advanced decline line declining, you know, all, all these indicators. 
uh, suggesting that, you know, uh, we could be ready for a correction. Obviously, we never knew what, what was going to happen, but uh, it's definitely definitely something to keep in mind uh, as we get in a later stage of a, of a bull run, for sure. Yeah, and I, and I think, you know, um, you have to have your tools that you're comfortable with. Yep. And then you need to block out a lot of noise because the, at the end of a bull market, if you even say, like, if you even hint that, like, never mind being bearish, if you hint, like, oh, you know, maybe the gains will slow down a bit. It's like, everyone will be like, oh, what are you, crazy? It's a bull market. And after, at the end of a, a bear market, if you say, like, oh, you know, maybe it's the worst is over. Like, what are you, crazy? Everything's about to fall apart. So you have to really kind of maintain that perspective and kind of use your tools. If you just kind of go with what you hear by most people, I mean, that's why most people in the market don't make money, active traders rather, you know, because they don't have, they, they go by the whims of their emotions and and that they're looking at the most recent environment. So you have to really just, and everyone will have different tools. There's no perfect tool. Again, my tools are geared towards my style of investing, which is growth stocks, which is finding positions and trends. For someone who's, you know, I, for years, I was a market maker and stuff, and this wasn't a primary consideration. I was looking at different things. Uh, so it's just that, you know, understand your tools for your system. And like what Stan was looking at, again, similar to what I was looking at, was for someone who's looking more at general broad trends and uh, right. blocking out the noise. Yeah, perfect. And uh, Michael asked an interesting question, and I was actually thinking along the same lines here. Uh, do you think there's any benefit, uh, maybe not for your style or time frame, but uh, looking at maybe a shorter time period of highs? So th these are 52-week highs, I believe. But, you know, one month highs, six month highs. Um, do, do you think there's any merit in, in looking down that road, developing such a tool, using that such a tool? Yeah, I, I think if you're uh, shorter term in nature, uh, but, you know, it, it's it's always like kind of the the, the fight between getting like a, a useful signal and noise. noise so whenever you kind of like, yeah, whenever you like shrink your, your time frame, there's going to be, for example, um, let me see if I could find like a quick example here. Um, there could be like a, an up leg here where, you know, you'll have gotten your, although this was pretty accurate, even just with the net highs of uh, the 52 week highs, but there, you know, there, there'll be like quick trends, which maybe your tool will capture that this won't. So again, if you're a day trader, you know, or, or whatever it is, it'll be, you know, for example, let's say off of this low right here, maybe it would have turned positive a little bit sooner and, and turned negative a little bit sooner. Uh, that's why you have to just kind of like zero it in for what works for you. For myself, where I'm trying to find kind of more the true trend, Right. Of, of the market trend, I found this works best for me. Yeah, perfect. Um, yeah, I think that's an important reminder. And maybe getting into, you know, a few individual stocks here, um, looking at the, the trend of debt and all of that, how, how does that impact a growth stock? This is kind of what you touched on last year, how, how the overall environment mm -hmm. impacts things. Uh, but, you know, you showed how the market responds and all that. Well, why is that so directly linked? Why are growth stocks so um, so correlated with, with, with what's going on in the overall environment. For, so, uh, so like in, in financial talk, you know, growth stock will be called a long duration asset. So that just means like, you know, um, okay, I won't get too technical terms, but most of the earnings of a growth stock can happen far out in the future. So any, any company, you know, that's really high growth. They could say like, we're making two cents a share now, but if you just stick with us, like in six years, we're going to make like a dollar 50 a share, which is going to be much more. So, you know, at the end of the day, uh, no one questions what the value of a bond is. Everyone knows mathematically what the value of a bond is because they, I'm going to get this cash flow payment at each date and my cash back on this date. I can do the math based on what the interest rates are. And this is what this bond is worth at this second. For a stock, everyone can't get a, a, a fixed price because no one knows for sure what future earnings are going to be. But one thing is for sure is if I have to wait eight years for my earnings, for that money to come to me as a shareholder. Because as a shareholder, all I get is the earnings per share. I don't get the net income. I don't get the cash flow. I get earnings per share. Um, if that's 10 years from now, well, if interest rates are 0%, say, hey, look, I'm, I'm going to get 0% in the bank. So if I wait 10 years to ultimately get ten, you know, $5 a share, it's it's worth it. I'll wait because I, I, I'll have all this upside and, and, I, and I'm not getting any money anywhere else. If suddenly interest rates are five percent in the bank like they are now, you say, "Well, oof, I gotta pay on a, I don't know on a hundred thousand dollars. I gotta pay five. I, I lose out on five thousand dollars a year waiting to hope. Then your mindset changes to hopefully get this five dollars a share eight years from now. And so that opportunity cost changes big time when most of your earnings are far into the future. So you can see as as interest rates change, 
it has a big impact on the cost of waiting. Whereas if let's say a, a company like um, an energy company where has, or they have most of their earnings now, for example, well, they're less sensitive because like, hey, I'm getting my, my big chunk of payment like this year, next year, and the year after. So even if interest rates go up from you know zero to five, I'm getting money real time. I'm not waiting for some future date far into the future. So that's why growth stocks are, in theory, you know, uh, mostly affected by the change of interest rates. Yeah, that, that's helpful. And for anybody who's curious about that, definitely watch Matt's uh, presentation from last year. I'll, I'll probably link that uh, later on Twitter or something. I think it was really fantastic. Um, diving a little bit deeper and, and kind of picking your fundamental uh, brain, Matt, since you're so good at that. Um, we've seen, we've seen a few companies kind of change their guidance and, and everything because of, you know, a, a new catalyst, potentially AI kind of switching things up. Um, what, what happens when it comes to valuation and how funds look at a potential investment in a growth stock when guidance from the company dramatically increases and surprises everybody on, on an earnings report, how do they change their models and how does that impact how they're positioned? Yeah, so every every company is going to have different models, but of course, like you know, um, companies investing in growth stocks are going to have similarities. And we all we all go to the same schools and study the same stuff and look at the same. So there's a lot of similarities. Just like growth investors will look at similar tools, so will big funds running similar models. And forward guidance by companies are important because you know analysts will have their estimates, uh, but a company can't just legally say whatever they want. They can't outright lie. I mean, if they think they're really going to have 100 million sales next quarter, they can't say, well, we're going to have 900 million. I mean, they'll be liable for for uh, improperly uh, representing the facts. So updating guidance is an important thing. It's definitely going to impact the models. Um, but like everything else, ultimately, it, it does have to show up. That, that's why, you know, some people won't understand when a company has a bad earnings report or, or they, they they hit the most recent numbers. They, they beat expectations, but their guidance is a little bit lower and the stock gets creamed. Right. Well, again, everything is, is multiplied over many quarters and years. So, uh, um, a fund manager will look at this company and say, look, I'm expecting this to grow 25%, you know, year over year for the next six years. If the, if suddenly the company comes out and says, well, instead of 25%, we're going to only grow 20, but we did really great now, but we're only going to grow 20. Well, now you have to think of compounding. If, if, if now the fund manager has to go back and say, well, oh, instead of 25 year over year, they've already slowed down now, which is supposed to be their best period. Maybe I should estimate only 15% growth. So now if you take 15% year over year for five years from 25, that's a really big difference when you compound that out. And so that's why the stock suddenly bang drops 30%. So similar with raising guidance, you know, a fund will say like, well, I was expecting 15%, but you're telling me what 25 now, 30%, maybe, well, maybe AI is going to be even bigger, 40%. And then these stocks go on to these incredible moves. Now, ultimately, um, if the if the company can deliver, if you're Apple, and this is you know 15 years ago, yeah, the company becomes the, the most valuable company in the world, and and it has this, and it retains its value. Other times, reality doesn't hit because there's competition, there changes, I and mean, all the all the things that you run into when you're running a business is never ending, and the stock has this massive rally, and then oh, things change, and then they they crash as they can't sustain their position as market leader. Look at Roku doing great. All of a sudden, Amazon, this big behemoth comes in saying, you know, I want to have Fire TV and I want to do Prime Video and I'm going to compete directly with you. Well, whatever I was penciling in for Roku, I got to take something away. And this great stock then has to come back down to earth. And that's why there's these, you know, monstrous trends. And then people will kind of sit with them saying, well, it can't be. It's such a great company. But investors are looking are five years out. I mean, so uh, you can't look at just what's, what's right now. If, if there's a change of guidance, a change of expectations, that's multiplied over years and that that can result in much higher prices or much lower prices yeah that, that, that's super helpful uh there's a good question here in the chat and, and keep them coming guys if you have any questions for matt this is the time to ask um the question was uh please ask matt about some books that are good for understanding economics and the fundamental side of markets you know i, I get that question a lot and i wish i had a good book to refer to because uh, like I did my CFA studies um, and, and and you learn so much like, you know, accounting and, and interest rates and, and how to calculate bond prices and all of that, which uh, some people like their eyes will roll back. But for me, when I was doing that study, I said, whoa, I, I suddenly mathematically saw all these concepts that I kind of intuitively learned. I, I saw mathematically why they work that way, which was a kind of illuminating. But if I kind of just point you to how to calculate a bond price, uh, if I give you a say, read this book, you say, what does this have to do with stocks? So like, I haven't seen any really good books that kind of like uh, tie it all together, unfortunately. 
Um, I started writing a book a while back. It seems to always take more time. <laughs> I hope to kind of have something in there myself. But um, in terms of pointing uh, someone to a book, I've never really kind of uh, had a book I can say is a goal to. Same with economics. Economics is tricky because you kind of end up in economic theory and economists write books in economics for economists. They don't write them economics books for growth investors. So uh, same there. It's kind of like difficult um, to point you to a book. So um, I wish I had a good one to point to, but I don't, unfortunately. I guess you got to take some time away and finish that book. And, yeah, uh, at some point, yeah. Resource. Yeah. Uh, economics yeah. for growth traders. For, for, yeah, two, for, two small yeah. boys at home have kind of uh, slowed down the process a bit, but uh, it's for a good reason. I'm sure, I'm sure. All yeah. right, perfect. There's some good questions coming in here. Uh, Matt, in line of fundamentals, uh, do you feel AI... Um, AI... Uh, I, I guess maybe private equity slightly overheated due to current price uh, to short-term guidance um, over value. And maybe that's a PE ratio as well. Uh, does, that, does that question make sense or should I ask for a rephrase? Uh, well, I mean, like, I, I think he's saying, does it make sense? Like have yeah. things gone, uh, gotten Over overheated? Board. Yeah. It could be again. It's like, it's it, for sure. There's always going to be stuff that's an overheat, come back to earth. It's like the internet. I mean, I, I think I, I think we're really lucky today, actually, that we're seeing this change in technology. Because when the internet came around, no one had really seen such a dramatic change of technology. So, uh, you know, recently. So, the if you look at the way the internet kind of built out and use that just as a template, there's going to be so many winners and then losers. I mean, who uses like uh, Netscape Navigator as a browser anymore? I mean, all, like all the the early winners are almost all gone. Palm Pilot is gone. You know, BlackBerry beat Palm Pilot. Apple beat BlackBerry. It's like this, this cycle. So, it's like yeah, you know, some things are going to be overheated. It's the job of the investor to figure out what's real, what isn't. Uh, if you get it right, the returns are unbelievable. So, I mean, for example, look at Cisco. Cisco had routers and switches, which was laid the like the foundation infrastructure for the internet. Um, they came out in 1990. The IPO. Someone could argue six months later. Hey, this is ridiculous. You know, this had a big move up. The internet's, you know, this internet thing everyone's talking about may or may not come about. And I'm going to sell this again. You're, what's your time frame? Because Cisco ultimately had 118 thousand percent return in the 1990s. I mean, I think about 118 thousand percent return. Uh, it's not a big leader today. There's other companies that are competing in that sector, but at the time. If you just kind of said like, oh, it's up too much, you missed that. So but again, but look, if you're a short-term investor, it could be in the short term. It's, if you're very leveraged, you're very concentrated, you may need to pull back. But I think ultimately, if AI or the promise of it um, has the potential to, to dramatically change things as much as the internet has, which it could, it very well could, because it's, it's, it's what I like about the concept of AI, unlike, let's say, social media, is that it's a big productivity tool. And whenever something is a productivity tool, a lot of money will flow to it. Companies will invest in it. People will invest in it because, hey, if I put ten dollars, I get back twelve. Who wouldn't do that if it's if it's helpful? So, um, it's going to be important to understand who the real winners are going to be. It doesn't mean buy Nvidia today and it's going to go up one hundred eighteen thousand percent, especially given its market cap. Um, but I think kind of just it, it, understanding your perspective, understanding what can be, if AI. Never mind just the AI companies who invent AI. There's people who have to build the infrastructure for AI. There's the guys who are going to use AI, who are going to build AI applic specific applications. There's going to be trucking companies who are going to have more efficient operations. There's going to be uh, call center companies who need less people because they have, and that's going to raise their earnings per share. So just like the internet kind of helped everyone, enable everyone to run more streamlined, better operations and raise everyone's earnings per share, AI as a productivity tool, I think, has that potential as well. So if you're like Cisco Systems, where you make yourself this indispensable infrastructure of, of, of the internet, it's 1990, I mean, yeah, you're going to go up 118,000%. If you built uh, like Pets.com website in 1999, where like you don't really have a business model, you have an awful product and nobody wants to buy it, just because you're on the internet, you're not going to succeed, you're going to go bankrupt. So I think, again, context is really, really important. But I think there's potential there, but and it's up to us to separate the hype from reality, like with every uh, new opportunity, there's going to be a lot of hype and, and falsehoods. Uh, so like I kind of going back to the beginning of my presentation, most of what we do is say no, but figuring out when to say yes is, is like the important part. Yeah, great answer. All right. There's some great questions that came in as well. Uh, first from Modern Growth Investing, uh, does Matt go deeper into fundamental analysis, like looking at management teams, strategy, innovation, uh, capital allocation, et cetera? Yeah, I do. Uh, so, you know, I run like 
mostly quantitative screens. You know, there's there's one video by William O'Neill. I, for, I forget now where I saw him say it, but uh, he was talking about like speaking to management teams. You know, and and Bill uh, was a legend. I'm sure he had uh, big big chunks of stock in these companies. He could have gotten on the call on the phone with any CEO if he wanted to. But it's like he says in the video. You know, at the end of the day, they can tell you whatever they want. I mean, it's got to be in the numbers. I mean, you could have the best product in the world if your sales are not increasing and they're decreasing. You know, you you can only <laughs> explain that for so long. Why is nobody buying your product? So what I like to do is is kind of uh, narrow down my universe of companies that are already executing, and then I have to understand the teams behind them. So for example, one stock I was looking at recently, uh, Floor and Decor FND. I can bring this up right here. So I love success stories. I, I particularly love to read about businesses, and the management team of Floor and Decor is from Home Depot. And so the a CEO of Floor and Decor, I believe, he's a founder as well, but uh, don't quote me on that. Uh, he was the youngest ever store manager for Home Depot at 22 years old. He had a he was the ended up the store manager in Florida, and that was close to where Bernie Marcus, founder of Home Depot, uh, had his like vacation home. And so he became very close to Bernie Marcus, who again, I mean, billionaire inventor of of you know uh, of uh, Home Depot, and he was kind of mentored by him. And now he's gone on to kind of start Floor and Decor, and actually competes with Home Depot in a specialty kind of sub product sub brand. And their plan is to kind of uh, build these new kind of very large stores with very big specialty and in, in floor and decor and kind of roll that out across the U.S. much like Home Depot did. So, I mean, what's better than having like a, a product that's in demand, that's growing with a management team that ha- that was trained by one of the best entrepreneurs of like the past 20 or 30 years with Home Depot. So when the time is right, I like to dive deeper into them. But I mean, I won't just buy and hold a company because, hey, they got a great management team. Like, it's got to all match up. And so I don't read about everyone's background each day, I, I kind of narrow it down first quantitatively to who's already executing and then, okay, why? And like, oh, you got this great team too. And that just kind of raised my uh, level of alertness to the company. Yeah, perfect. And there's a good question from Scott. Um, excellent session. Thanks, uh, Richard and Matt. In addition to net new highs, new lows and high yield rates, uh, what are some other market metrics that Matt monitors? There's a lot of M's there. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I also look at the advanced decline line for divergences. I'm not a big like divergence guy because they kind of persist for a while, but I do look at that. Um, I also maintain like my lists of growth stocks. Usually I usually have about like 70 to 100. And so how the performance of those are going. So I kind of have like the macro view looking at the top level. And then at the end of the day, it's like the stocks that I'm focusing on need to be working and sustaining themselves too. So I try to have too many tools because kind of similar to like, let's say technical analysis. If you look at, let's say, uh, price oscillators. There's like RSI, there's stochastic, there's percent R, there's CC. I mean, there's like a never ending number of oscillators. So if you kind of put up 20 of these and okay, they all have a buy signal, it doesn't necessarily make it a more powerful signal because they're all kind of just a different variation of the same. So uh, kind of my mantra of looking at things is like, I want a specific tool for guidance on a specific, uh, for a specific reason that I'm looking at. I don't want 10 of them because ultimately you end up with analysis paralysis where like, oh, I have I have 10 breadth indicators and, and seven are saying one, three are saying the others. One of the three is my favorite, but the other seven are positive and you don't know what to do anymore. So it's kind of like I want to have tools that are descriptive for certain purposes. And if there's a, if there's a if they're not if it's not making sense, well, then I'll dive a little deeper into what's up with this current market. But I try and avoid too many indicators on my, uh, my screen for that reason. Perfect. Uh, there's a question from Perk here. Uh, why has Matt changed from a day trader to a swing trader? And now he says uh, he's a, more a position trader. So wh- why, wh- how have you kind of developed your style over time? Yeah, sure. So the first book I ever read was How to Make Money in Stocks by Bill O'Neill, which got me obsessed with markets. But I love the charting section. So then I got into charts. And when you get into a lot of charts, you end up getting down to swing trading uh, because like there's more action, you know, and, and, you know, I started as a teenager. So your only goal is action. Like you want to make money, but you want to have fun with you and you want to trade. And so that my first job uh, that I got hired at university was as a market maker and day trader. And it was great, but you know, uh, AI is here. Right? Everyone thinks AI is new. Generative AI is pretty new, uh, but AI is not new in the stock market. So I'm, I was there. I started uh, trading on the desk before HFT and Algo started. And I remember when they, they began, and so uh, it, the shorter you, you, sh- you shrink your time frame, the more powerful computers are against you. So if, for example, if floor and decor is gonna go on uh, a nine month rally, well, I mean, like you, you have plenty of time to buy that stock. But if, if you're like day trading, 
for a 40 cent move. Uh, and I won't get into all the mechanics of technically, um, which the, the speed of light has an impact of how quick you, your order gets to specific exchanges and how it gets split up. Uh, well, the guy with like a $2 billion budget for technology who has microwave tire, towers, co-locations and the servers and, you know, spe specifically built fiber optic networks right down to, to, to optimize the bouncing of the speed of light within the glass, within those cables, you're not going to be first when you want to buy that thousand shares. So I, most guys I knew day trading, uh, the style we were doing, which was kind of market making, uh, their profits were eroded. I was lucky, I, you know, I was effective, so I was good for many years. But the kind of the writing was on the wall where like, hey, if I really want to keep scaling, it's kind of hard when your adversary, your, your adversary is the terminator. Uh, and so because I built enough capital and I always loved growth investing, I had always done it in conjunction. Uh, I thought it was, was going to be the best way to kind of compound my money. And also I found it more intellectually stimulating. Um, and so that's the why I ultimately I kind of made that, that drift over. Um, you know, also with time, like when you're like 21, you want to just like live in front of your screen and like not get up. I remember having like 400 orders open and like having to run to get a glass of water and back. I know I'm not an old guy, but you know, like at 37, it's like, it's nice to be able to sometimes like take a five minute walk without worrying about getting filled on like 400 orders. So like part of his lifestyle as well, that you kind of, um, that changes with time, I would say. Yeah, perfect. Uh, Matt, this has been really great. Uh, as always, um, any last bits of advice for traders out there to, um, you know, analyze the environment uh, and also make the most of uh, a nice new trend if we do get one? Yeah, so I would just really say, um, like, take a moment and stop and, and think about this as a business. And then think about like, what's the best environment for your business. So if, if, for example, if you sell toys, you're going to be like the best entrepreneur ever in December and November. But then in January, if you're like asking yourself, why am I such a loser that I can't sell any toys? Well, you're not a loser. So in this business, unlike a lot of other businesses, you have your PL like flashing at you all the time in your account. And so there's a lot of psychological pressures. I think you can minimize that by thinking of this as a business and thinking of context and environment and, um, it's not to kind of rationalize under performance, but to understand what's going right to what's going wrong, just like any business person will analyze their business because being able to kind of execute with a clear mind and being calm is like 90% of the battle. I mean, most of, you'll see what most successful investors do. They look at bar charts, they look at fundamentals and on the surfaces, like that's pretty simple. Well, how come nobody can pull it off? And then some guys make like billions of dollars. Well, like there's, 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 there's a real same thing like with baseball, you know, like, simple to hit a ball with a bat. Well, why does do some people get paid $20 million a year to do it? And some people have to pay to go play in a league, you know, being exceptional at something is important. And part of being exceptional is knowing when to do it, when to do it a lot, when to do it really amazing and when to kind of back off. And that's what makes this a little bit unique and to, to execute well, you need the right mindset and to have the right mindset, you need to understand your system and the environment and the context. So my, my problem was I would always jump, from tool to tool to be better with my tools. And when I kind of stopped to kind of take a breath and look at like the overall arching process that I'm putting together more like a businessman, I find psychologically it kind of calm me and help me to kind of progress and improve. So like take a step back uh, and, and look at it from a business angle instead of like just a technical angle or a fundamental angle or a strategy angle, look at it like a business person. And I think you'll get new insights that you didn't have before. Yeah, I think that's really helpful. And just to use another analogy, you know, if you're running uh, a sports apparel store, you're going to sell bathing suits in July and you're going to sell, uh, you know, winter jackets in, in December. It's just it's just it's a strategy that fits the context. So I, I think, you know, I, I think that's a great way to think about it, Matt. So thank you so much once again for your presentation. Uh, hopefully everybody enjoyed it. If you did, uh, make sure to leave a like down below, subscribe to the channel, uh, check out Matt. Uh, Matt, once again, where can people learn more from you and, and reach out to you? Uh, if they have any questions or want to learn more, want to learn more about your style. Sure. Yeah. Uh, my website, carusoinsights.com. Um, there's also on, on YouTube, I have a YouTube channel that I, I try. I'm not as consistent as you are, Richard. I try when I can to make some videos so you can look up Caruso Insights or Matt Caruso on YouTube. And of course, Twitter, I tweet pretty often at uh, trader underscore M Caruso. Yeah, perfect. And also for anybody who hasn't seen it, I highly recommend watching Matt's presentation from last year as well. Uh, we'll probably link that uh, in the description whenever this gets posted. <clears throat> uh, but yeah, thanks again, Matt, so much. Uh, thanks for everybody for watching your questions. And we'll be right back with the next presenters. Take care. Thanks.
Okay, welcome back, everybody. Uh, it's my honor to introduce our next two speakers, and we're going to have a little bit more of a casual conversation here, which is fantastic. We've got uh, Dr. Brett Steenbarger, a psychologist, author, and training coach. Uh, definitely uh, going to provide a ton of value there. And we also have Mike Bellafiore, uh, the co-founder of SMB Capital, author in his own right, and extremely experienced uh, trader. So we've got a great mix here: trading psychology, trading mentorship. And we're really excited for today's session. Uh, at the beginning, we're going to have a few slides uh, from both presenters, uh, but then we're really going to open it up to questions and uh, take as many as we can. Uh, so as we go through, please leave any questions you have in the chat. Uh, we want as many submitted as possible. Uh, so every single person watching right now should submit at least one question, maybe two, uh, and we'll try to cover as much as we can. Uh, and with that, I think uh, we're ready uh, to go. Uh, leave a like down below if you're enjoying uh, the conference so far. Uh, subscribe as well. And uh, I'll go ahead and hand it over to uh, the amazing presenter. So thank you both for taking the time to be with us here today. And uh, yeah, I'm excited for this. Awesome. Thank you very much, Richard. Thanks, Nick, for your help. And thanks, Mike, for, for joining me on this. This is going to be a unique session because we're talking about trader development, but the majority of our time is going to be open Q&A where you get live coaching and mentoring from Mike and myself. It, Mike and I have worked together at SMB for a number of years, and I've seen firsthand how traders develop at SMB uh, in large part by being part of a team structure, by learning at the desk, by observing successful traders and emulating what they do and building on what they do. And so uh, Mike will be sharing more about that. And we hope to share with all of you uh, with your questions in ways that will help your trading going forward. So just a few slides on my end, developing as a trader. There's my name and the URL for my blog, Trader Feed, traderfeed.blogspot.com. And also there is a free blog book uh, called Radical Renewal, which is on an interesting topic and something I'll be touching on uh, today, the spirituality of trading. We hear a lot about the psychology of trading. This is about spirituality in trading, uh, a key idea from Radical Renewal is that good trading comes from the soul, not from the ego. It's when the ego gets involved and we get caught up in P&L and wanting to make more and more and do more and, and, uh, and not lose money and not lose money. It's when we get caught up in the ego that we end up making reactive decisions and end up making some pretty poor decisions. So, Three big ideas, okay? And these are, a couple of these are from my own uh, spiritual studies. You know, there's there's a, a story that I, I like about a well-known rabbi. And he got a phone call from a group of women who are at the airport and they were very apologetic. They, they said, I'm so sorry, we can't make it to your religious services tonight because our plane was canceled and we're stuck in the airport. And the rabbi's response in essence was, a person is never stuck. We are always where we are supposed to be. Now, think about that with respect to your trading. Many times, and I know in my own trading, I felt stuck. But we are at a stuck point for a reason. We're meant to learn something from that. We're where we're supposed to be. And so the question becomes, all right, what am I meant to learn here? Why am I at this point? How am I going to use the information of being here to become better. Related to that idea, 
is a, a teaching that I mentioned in Radical Renewal. There is nothing so whole as a broken heart. Now, what does that mean? In the psychology research, it turns out that simply talking to a therapist or a counselor or, or a coach, that doesn't work. That doesn't help people change. What how helps people change is when they become emotionally involved in what they're talking about. And usually at the beginning, particularly, they're emotionally involved because they're in pain. There's something going on in their life. There's something going on in their training that's caused distress. And so they have a broken heart. They're upset. But it's when we are emotionally aroused that we are most open to change, according to the psychology research. And so we can have a broken heart and we can be whole in the sense of wholly open to new things, different things, better things. Our broken heart, our setbacks, our being stuck often are the first points in a change process. And big idea number three, look at markets uniquely. And I give an example below and I'll talk about that. You, this, this is so important. Your trading is your business. What makes your business special? What makes it different? What makes it unique? If you're average in the trading world, you're losing. The average trader loses money. Good enough is not good enough. We have to be distinctive. Well, how do we figure out what we're really good at? How do we figure out what unique things we see and do? Very, 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 very often, our passion points the way to our purpose. What grabs us, what strikes us as meaningful and important points the way to what we're meant to be doing. So I added here a, a little thing to the slide. This is word for word something that I sent out to one of the traders I, I work with. And uh, they were asking about the upturn recently in stocks. And so I sent out this information based on the database that I keep. I track market breadth. I track how many stocks make 52-week new highs and lows. I track how many stocks make three-month new highs and lows, one-month new highs and lows. I track how many stocks are trading on upticks and downticks literally every minute of the day. And it turns out that if we study patterns, we can see real edges in the market that other people, frankly, don't look at. So what I uh, uh, sent out was since 1997, which is how far back my database goes, shows how old I am. We've had 1,354 days out of over 6,000 in which new lows were below 10. New annual lows were below 10 across the entire NYSE. So that means basically nothing is weak. When that has happened, the S&P 500, and I use the ETF, the SPY ETF, outperformed over the next five, 10, and 20 days on average significantly. And I give the numbers. The point being that an edge that few people look at is when, is what is happening to very few stocks or very few markets. If nothing's making new lows, that's saying something, and there tends to be momentum going forward. It's an example of asking a different question, playing a different game, looking at mark markets uniquely, and finding what can make you successful. So with that, I will pass it over to uh, my colleague, Mike. You know, there's a great mural that sits, it hangs in the walls of SMB Capital, which is a quote from Dr. Steenbarger. It's of him saying, you were meant to do something great. 
And that's one of my favorite quotes from Dr. Steenbarger and working with him in trader development and and through the years. We uh I wanted to I wanted to take some time and pose a different way for traders to think about their career and, and ask the question to all of you listening, what if you thought about your trading career differently? Almost all the developing traders, new traders, beginning traders stress over whether I can become a profitable trader. Can I become a consistently profitable trader? Am I good enough to be a successful trader? Do I have what it takes to be a pro trader? What do I need to do to be a successful trader? What do I need to do better to achieve my goals? What do I need to do to work on harder? What do I need to learn that I haven't? What do I need to change about my trading to hold my winners longer? What do I need to change to stop taking those trades that you shouldn't be making? What strategies do I need to master to make more money? I, 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 I. And then if for some reason you underperform, you start to wonder what's wrong with me that I'm not making more? What's wrong with me that I can't seem to make money on those breakout trades? What's wrong with me that I missed that trade? What's wrong with me that I didn't see that Tesla trade that went up 20%? What's wrong with me that I made 500 bucks and somebody else made 50,000? What's, what's wrong with me that I can't build a profitable automated trading strategy? What's wrong with me that I don't have filters to alert me to that trade that just went up 10% or that should have alerted me to the semis which are on fire? Me, 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 me. I, I, I and me, me, me. That's a lot of pressure to have on yourself. This is a particularly difficult game. I, 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 me, 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 and one of the toughest games that, that people play. And doing that at the beginning of your journey, that, that's, a, that's a pretty tough spot to put yourself in. What if you stopped thinking of your trading journey in terms of I, and me, and you thought of your trading journal, your trading journey in a completely different way. And what if I suggested or challenged you uh, that you should, that thinking in terms of I and me may be the reason that you're not doing as good as you want to. Maybe it's the reason that you're not as good as you deserve to be. So there is something that we can share with you that we've learned uh, over the years running a, a proprietary trading firm since 2005. And our firm has focused on building brand spanking new traders into consistently profitable traders and then uh, others getting even better. And this focus on developing new traders. That's why we've been successful as a trading firm. There are other proprietary trading firms who focus on you know, going to find experienced traders who've made a bunch of money and giving them a book and managing their risk and giving them resources. Our focus has been finding traders who we think fit our culture and helping them grow their trading business from the start. And, you know, we have learned over the years that it's a good idea to think about your trading career, not as I and me, but rather 
as we and us. How did we trade that breakout trade in the video? How did we trade that negative news catalyst in the regional banks? How did we trade the momentum opportunities in the AI names that have been going crazy of late? How did we do with our automated model that focuses on triple earnings beats? And what if instead of trading alone, you were part of a team, a trading team, or a trading pod? And you know, what if your career was about mastering that breakout trade in this team or this pod? And your job was to be a contributing member to the solution. The whole game didn't rely on you. You were responsible for helping, but not completely solving. And in doing some research for this, I found an article that Dr. Steenbarger, myself, and Steve Spencer, my other partner at SMB Capital, wrote. Uh, it's a Forbes article. The title is Four Lessons Learned from Training Successful Traders. And, and a, there's a, a quote in it. Hedge fund titan Kenneth Griffin from Citadel said, frankly, you can't succeed in the markets unless you're part of a great team. And, and we agree with that. And so what if we take that breakout trade above that you haven't mastered and your job is to build alerts that identified the best breakout trades? What if you performed back tests that identified the best breakout trades? What if you executed the trades, you executed the trades for a senior trader who had a lot more experience and was responsible for deciding when to pull the trigger? What if the team pooled its talents and traded together? And what if your success depended not on I and me, but rather we and us? And so I'll just go over some advantages quickly. Uh, if you do this, it's more fun to trade together. You have strengths and you have weaknesses and your team allows you to bank more on your strengths. Maybe you can't execute in real time, but you're a great researcher. If you're a solo trader, you'd be forced out of the markets. In a team, you could have a long and prosperous career contributing. You learn more. You're learning from other members of the team. You're learning from more people. You're learning better as the team members are sticking to their experience and their strengths and their niches. And what you learn from them is better knowledge. It's easier to survive the learning curve. It's easier to survive the learning curve. As you're coming up the curve, you can lean on the trading prowess of that senior trader to carry you a little bit as you're just starting. If you make a contribution to a talented trader, he or she's gonna make more and you're gonna be, you're gonna contribute in that PL. There are more paths to being a successful trader trading in a team or a pot. You can be a researcher, you can be a coder, you can build models, you can be the idea generator, you can, you can execute. And so, you know, let's just talk about some ideas. And Dr. Steenbarger, if you would flip to our last slide. So it's just some key ideas. If people always ask, well, how do I become a member of a pod? How do I become a member of a team? And you want to be adding value. On the desk this week, Sebi, who's a junior trader, doesn't yet make a lot of money, saw that there was some unusual price action and coin. Called it out to Max and Stefan. They looked at it. They're like, there's something here, guys. We got to get short. They got short. For those of you trading that name, that was a great trade. But it was the young guy, the junior guy, who's not as good as the other guys, who just happened to notice some irregularity in markets and, and set up a great trade for his, for his pod, for his team, for the desk. I think sometimes people feel like senior traders or proprietary traders only network at their firm. And have so one of our best traders is a great networker, Raf. He networks with people outside the firm, inside the firm. He was networking with people inside the firm, outside the firm before he even started with us. He's one of our best traders. He 
talks to so many people on the street that he gets a an unusually powerful feel for what stocks are going to do. The other day I had this amazing feel that Carvana was going to be one of the best trades potentially of the year based on him tapping into his network. And for those of you who watch Carvana, it, it went up a ton. Uh, and he, had a, he was in a great trading opportunity. He's putting himself in position because of his network to make really good trades. If you reach out to somebody and they say, you know, they, they don't respond, like, who cares? Like, Dr. Steenberg and I have been doing that for years. There are going to be people who don't respond, even as uh, high as, you know, even with the uh, amount of experience and the platform that Dr. Steenbarger has, there are people that don't respond to him. And there are certainly people that don't respond to me. It's, it's you know, I wasted what I wrote an email and somebody didn't respond. That's, that's okay. But there are a lot of people that do respond. We actually know each other through email. I want to highlight one, one really important best practice that we're seeing on our desk. And I think this is the biggest takeaway from these key, key ideas. On our desk, guys are getting together at the end of the month and they're go, going over easy money trades. They're, they're looking at the easiest and best opportunities from the month. They're putting them together and they're discussing them at the end of the month with a whole bunch of people. They're getting all these reps and all this review on the best trades, and they're starting to internalize even better these A plus setups. You know, they're they're meeting, it's on Zoom, they're preparing materials, they're going over the trades, there's questions asked, and there's just a tremendous amount of learning that's going on from this review. People are watching tape together, they're doing daily report cards together, providing feedback. And just to give you an idea, when you think about a team, maybe you can be the technology expert. Maybe you can be the idea generation expert. Maybe you can be the execution expert. Maybe you can be the research expert. Maybe you can be the, the leader of the team. Maybe you have the most experience looking at markets. Maybe you're the guy who brings the energy to the team. And so when I think about a team, those are some parts that make for a successful team. And maybe there's a part that you can play in that. And none of that, none of that relates to you formulating a trade idea by yourself, pushing the buttons by yourself, making decisions solely by yourself, exiting an exit solely based on your system, based on your ideas, putting all the pressure on you to be successful. And Dr. Steenberger, I know you've been involved in, in helping build a lot of really great teams. It's exactly how hedge funds work, is with the team concept, and people start at junior levels, and they get mentoring at the desk. They provide value to the team. Uh, but what many traders don't recognize, Mike, is that that teamwork is possible for individual independent traders. One of the great advantages of the online media is that we can network with others literally around the world and form our own virtual teams. We can join trading communities and find kindred souls uh, within those communities. So we don't have to be at a hedge fund in order to gain the benefits of working in a team. All right, should we should we shift to some questions, Richard? Yeah, I think that's great. And I'll go ahead uh, and stop the screen share just so we can get a clear view of everybody here. And we've got plenty of great questions coming in. I encourage uh, even more to be dropped in the chat as we speak. Uh, to open things up, there's a pretty good one from Nick that kind of, I think is a good starting point for today. Uh, and he asks, uh, both a trading strategy and uh, psychology are important in their own rights, but as a new trader, should you be focusing on both psychology and strategy at the same time, or one versus the other, or one first? Yeah, it's a great 
Great, great question, uh, Nick. Mike, did you want to go on no, that? No, I was going to say, since we have one of the great trading psychologists in oh the country my. here with us, we, we should start with you, please. Well, you know, if you don't have a good trading strategy and you just work on the psychology, then you're going to feel better when you lose money. <laughs> You know, you'll be calmer losing your capital. Like, that doesn't make sense. No, you know, this is like any performance activity, like a sport. You have to work on the skills. You have to develop your talent. And then as you develop your skills and talent, as you gain experience, yes, then the psychology really impacts how you use that talent. But psychology will never substitute for a genuine edge in financial markets. Yeah, perfect. And and Mike, anything to add to that? No, I'm going to leave it with Dr. Seenbarger on that one. <laughs> yeah, perfect. So coming to you with the question, Mike, uh, there was a really good one uh, that was submitted. I forget who asked it. I'd have to find the exact question. Uh, but basically, when a new trader comes to your desk, uh, do you have a book list or a set of resources that uh, you present them with how what's kind of the the onboarding experience to get them up to speed and you know set them up for success uh on, on your desk so we have a training program uh, most traders who join our desk come through our internship program so if you're in college you reach out to recruiting and apply for an internship on our desk and generally people are reaching out if they're a freshman after their freshman, sophomore, or, or, or junior year to do an internship. And before they actually show up here, in, we're in New York City, and uh, train with us during the summer, they are sent a training program. They're sent an equities training program. They're also sent the beginnings of some uh, technology training, automated trading training so that uh, when they get here, they know a little bit more than, than uh, if they didn't know anything. So but we're going to teach them the fundamentals of trading. We're going to teach them stock selection and some trade setups and execution and how to review their trades and um, the basics. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk to them a little bit about some tape reading. So we're, we're going to set them up for success to get the most out of this experience. They go through that training. We can actually see who does it and who doesn't. So don't show up uh, if you haven't actually done it. That, that has happened a couple of times. Um, and then they go through our training program. They go through a, a, a summer internship with us, which actually we're, we're doing right now with, with some guys. And uh, there, they're sitting in on our AM meetings and seeing how we prepare, how we how we choose our stocks. They are sitting in on our meetings, which review the open, the setups that were most advantageous to take. They are sitting in on our tape reading review sessions, which essentially is a skill that we think is valuable for active trading. They are sitting in on automated trading lessons so that they can build technology. How do you build alerts? How do you build scripts? How do you build basic automated trading models? They are receiving uh, lectures from other senior traders, uh, maybe even some more developing traders on the desk. And uh, they're getting a chance to participate in, in all those meetings. They're trading on a demo while they're here with us. Mm -hmm. And by the end, we're grading them on their stock selection we're grading them on their setups. We're grading them on how they've done with their automated trading. And they're competing to gain an invitation to be a senior intern and come back and, and intern with us one more time. Yeah, great. And for hmm. anybody out there, oh, would you like to add something, Dr. Just a, yeah. a quick, quick addition to that, Mike. Not only do they get a reading list when they join, in order to get into the internship program, they have to have done some reading. They have to have gotten some background. And there are lots of good trading resources out there that help you 
understand what trading is all about so that you're knowledgeable when you take the step of joining a program. Yeah, and I remember something that Dr. Steenbarger said a, a long time ago when we were thinking about who to hire for our interns. And, and, and look, there's different ways to hire people. But one of the things that made a lot of sense to us was Dr. Steenbarger saying, if somebody in college today hasn't at least started trading, that's a signal that they're probably not interested in trading. It's so easy for them today to do some kind of trading. And, you know, we think that we want to be around people that are interested in trading. Trading is kind of this unusual niche thing. Not everybody wants to be a trader. And you, you want people that are, for whatever reason, interested in price movement and stocks and why they go up and why they go down and looking at charts. And there are just some people that like that. Right. And we want to we want to identify people like that, because if you like what you're doing, you tend to be better at it. And if you like what you're doing, you tend to have more to contribute to the other people here and and to the firm. Yeah, great. And but uh, having said that, yeah, there are firms that there are firms that do not hire people that have any experience. They want a blank slate. Um, and so they you know that but that's the way we think about it. Yeah, excellent. And uh, I think this this will open up uh, an interesting avenue for both of you. Uh, There's a question from Michael uh, is being results oriented from the ego. And how do you get off the results? in something like trading when you see the results every day? How do you focus on the process instead? And Yeah, uh, and this yeah, is, you know, so this was to me or this was? I think, uh, I think I'd love to hear both your perspectives, but Mike, if you'd like to start. Yeah, so, right. and I'm gonna, so I remember, oh geez, this was, this was a while ago now, when we had a cluster of consistently profitable traders on our desk and I felt like we needed to push them to do even better. I, I felt like we needed to push them to hit some higher levels in their P&L. And I remember reaching out to Dr. Steenbarger and saying, let's have this challenge to, to push people to make $30,000 in a month. And we identified the traders who those were. And, uh, I felt like you needed to put this number in front of people, these results in front of people to get them to be able to do it. And I remember Dr. Steenbarger writing back and saying, you know, that's an interesting idea, Mike, but let's have them focus on the process. You know, what are the things that they need to do to achieve these goals? And let's have them grade themselves and whether or not they're actually doing these things. And, and let's not, put so much focus on this number because what if they don't hit it? Does that mean that they've, they haven't succeeded? Is that going to demotivate them? Do we want, do we want to have traders focused on their PL or improvement? And so, and Dr. Steenbarger has been involved in, in almost everything that we've done at SMB. And, and if you've read his posts, he is always talking about, the importance of trying to get better and 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 your process which leads to results i i do have to say that steve and i at our core believe in those principles like if you just were to ask me how do i get better at anything if you said you know mike how would you get better at uh chest press you know i, I would immediately start thinking about a four month program and the things that went into that to make a little bit of progress each day so that in four months I was able to actually make the, like, we just think that way. And I do think we, uh, that permeates through our mentoring and our development at the firm. We tend to be patient and we want to see guys who are working on their process. Couldn't agree more, Mike. Um, 
just a, a little added note, Richard, you know, one thing that I emphasize that comes from the research in what's called positive psychology is that for most trainers with some experience who have gone through some good learning, you already are making some great trades. At some point in time, maybe not often enough, but at some points in time, you are already trading greatly. Identify what you're doing when you make money. Identify what you're doing when you trade well. Reverse engineer that. Figure out your strengths. Figure out what you're good at. Create a checklist that tells you what you do when you're at your best. That's really the focus as opposed to the absolute P&L number, which in large part may depend on market conditions. Yeah, I, I think that's very helpful. Uh, to switch gears a little bit uh, and get more on the psychological side, uh, so this might be perfect for you, Dr. Schienbarger. Uh, there's a question from Miguel. Uh, how do you address psychological factors that can influence a trader's risk management decisions, uh, such as fear, greed, or overconfidence? Yes, um, it, it's an important question, and Miguel, and, and that's why going through the right learning process is so important. You know, I strongly encourage traders when they begin their careers to first trade in simulation mode, first trade in in paper trading uh, so that you are making the right decisions, doing the right things, not putting your capital at work uh, at, at risk. And you are making all your mistakes when you are preserving your capital. And then as you do well in simulation mode, then you start getting smaller and you start gradually growing the risk taking so that you become accustomed to the risk and reward. Many, 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 many times people have too much of a reaction emotionally to the wins and losses because they're trading too large for where they're at in their development. They, they're so eager to make money and they have stars in their eyes and that leads them to take risks that they're not psychologically prepared for. And for for demo trading, do you, do you, do you think that provides a good environment to kind of experience? Obviously, it's good for the mechanics of trading, but, you know, even a $100 account, a $1,000 account, there might be emotions that come into play with that versus a demo account that you might not feel uh, adequately and that can influence the process. Any thoughts on uh, demo trading versus just starting with a, a very small amount relative to, you know, what you could be trading with. Yeah, yeah I, I see that. Uh, good question, Richard. I see that as a continuum. You, you start in pure demo mode, just like, you know, uh, so basketball uh, was, was my game in school. You know, you practice running plays and you're doing that not in the context of, a game against an opponent, you're not even playing a game, you know, scrimmage game, you know, uh, within the team. You're just walking the plays, running through the plays first, getting accustomed to them. And then you start running the plays in a practice session where you have half the team playing against the other half of the team. And you get really good at it. And then you put it into practice in real competition. So it's I see it as a continuum. It's uh, <laughs> crawl, walk, run, as they uh, say in the business. Perfect. I can add two thoughts to that. Mm -hmm. Dr. Steenbarger has advised a lot of our traders to think about risk this way. Don't lose enough in one trade to ruin your day. Don't lose enough in a day to ruin your week. Don't lose enough in a week to ruin your month. Don't lose enough in a month to ruin your quarter and don't lose enough in a quarter to ruin your year. And the second thing that I've learned in, in working with Dr. Steenbarger, who works with very sophisticated hedge funds and, and large institutions, it's something that he taught me, was the idea that if traders exceed their loss limits, 
even for the day, that that is a fireable offense. And I bring that up because that's just a, a, an illuminating thought for an independent trader to be exposed to. You're going to set, first of all, I'm sure there's some independent traders who don't set all of these risk limits. Professional traders, we do. And secondly, I sure they, they don't think of it this in, in such an extreme that if I were to go over my risk limits, I should fire myself or you should get fired at a firm. But it, it, it's, it's really grown on me and it really makes a lot of sense. As a firm, we give people, let's say you have a $50,000 intraday loss limit. We've given you the right to lose $50,000 intraday. We have not given you the right to lose $50,000 and $1. Now you are violating our trust. And one of these days, those numbers are going to be higher. And how can we trust you when those, num when those numbers are higher? But as an independent trader, same for you. This is your money. You're running a business. You've hired yourself to lose maximum $500 in an intraday. If you lose 501, you're going to have to give yourself a timeout and make sure that you can stay within those time limits or else you can't hire yourself to trade your hard earned money. And just to add in, this is something we've talked with traders about. Uh, you know, I teach at a medical school, uh, among other things. And so I work with uh, physicians who are developing surgeons or experienced surgeons. <clears throat> can you imagine a surgeon saying, well, I've, I've done well 90% of the time, but every so often I go on tilt and I <laughs> WTF. <laughs> you don't go on tilt when you're a surgeon. Why? Because life is sacred. And you've got to view your own capital the same way. This is sacred. And there are mistakes that it's a lot that you're allowed to make, that it's normal to make, but you're not allowed to violate what is sacred. And that is what keeps people on the straight and narrow uh, in the medical world. And I think the same ethos applies to the trading world. Perfect. And, you know, touching on losses and diving a little bit deeper into that, and I did see some questions about this. There will be times when you're trading where you'll be experiencing a drawdown. You won't be trading as well as you could be whether and even if it's within your acceptable risk allotments what would be your advice for traders to handle drawdowns uh work through them learn from them and eventually you know continue to make progress overall uh, i love to hear this both from the psychological perspective as well as uh mike your your training perspective and mike i guess we'll we'll start off with you so i learned this lesson last year so in 21 and in 20, we were really fortunate to have a tremendous amount of success. And guys really made life-changing money. It, it was you know, humbling to see. It was, it was really rewarding to see guys do so well. Um, it, was, it was just great. It was amazing. And then we had uh, two... Uh, 2022. And if you remember, 2022 was, was really good for the first half. And then at the very end of, of 2022, there was a, a change in Fed policy. And I think I got these dates wrong. And if, I think I got these dates right. And if not, I'll, I'll change them. But when the Fed started raising interest rates, uh, that's when I, it was, it was actually when the Fed started raising interest rates, that's when the market changed. And so in 2022, that was the, that was the year when, when things got a little bit different. Um, so let me edit that, that first comment. And so at the end of 22, we said to traders, Hey, the market's going to be different. Buying pullbacks is not going to work as well. Lean on shorts a little bit more, short the pops. In, in essence, you need to change your trading strategy. What worked in the past is not going to work in this market. And I think we we're pretty early in 
putting that idea in front of our traders. I think we were like days in, in terms of, of, of catching that spot on. But the thing that we didn't do, which we should have done and which we would, would do going forward, and not to say this is an easy thing, is we actually should have changed the risk rules and the risk parameters for all of the traders because we were now in a different market. Traders who had made near $20 million in a trading year did so in a different market than we had at the end of 22. We're now entering a completely different market and we should have theoretically made them prove that they can make money in this Fed raising interest rates market and earn more risk when they were making money in this Fed raising interest rates market uh, and, and, and we didn't. And so what we experienced was some of our traders did draw down more than they should have because they were looking at their risk limits from 20 and 21. And, you know, I think some of their drawdown was, a, was, was not necessary. And so, you know, we've, we've certainly turned the corner and, you know, guys have, are, have started to do really well again. The regional banks really helped. February was really great. Um, but I would just suggest, think about the market that you're in. Think about the regime you're in. Have you made money in this regime? And if you haven't, you should earn it. Start small and, and build it. If you made money in the past in a different regime, that, not, that shouldn't count as much as you think. And as Dr. Steenbarger says, we're always learning and we're always new, we're always new traders. Yeah, it's so important, Mike. Um, you know, Richard, actually, I'll, I'll respond to this more from the trading perspective, because I think doing the right kind of trading helps the psychology. It's not just feeling better, will help you trade better. Three types of markets. One, trending momentum markets, directional. Mm -hmm. Two, cyclical markets, mean reverting. So we're in a range and up and down within that range. Three, rotational markets. Capital is remaining pretty much constant in the market, but shifting from one part of the market to another. And that's what we've been seeing recently where certain sectors of the stock market have been attracting capital, some of the tech names, the AI names, of course, and other sectors people have been running away from. So the overall index may look quote unquote choppy when in fact there are meaningful movements within that. So we shift from trending to cyclical to rotational and back again, and we have to pick up on what Mike is referring to here is the regime changes. And many times our drawdowns are not because we're trading badly. They're not because we have a terrible psychology. The drawdowns are because we're trading this type of market at a time when we've transitioned to this type. Yeah, I think I think that's a really good point. And, and to dive deeper, if if you are in a drawdown and and you're trying things that are not working, you're you're losing confidence, all of that. Do you have any recommendations to kind of build that up slowly and, and get back to where you're confident in your execution, you're confident in your selection, all of that, uh, so you can work your way out of that drawdown? Because you know when they're drawdown, there people say there's a financial drawdown and then there's like a mental capital drawdown as well, where you're 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 losing what made you great your confidence your execution all of that so any any thoughts on that dr seabarger yeah uh, at uh, one hedge fund where i worked full time for a number of years every trader was required to come up with what is called a drawdown plan in other words if i draw down x amount then i cut my risk taking and i go through a review process a learning process so that as you are having more and more trouble 
in your results, you're getting smaller and smaller and doubling down, doubling down on learning. And that's how you figure out, wait a minute, the market's changed here. This is a different regime. So you, you're quick to get small and you're quick to build it back up as you start to see things and as things make sense to you. And and that sizing back up, that almost seems like the harder part for some for some traders. The the building back up to a normal position size after you know keeping that risk really tight and uh, and making sure you're managing your position positions and managing your risk. Any thoughts that or words of motivation or or advice for people who are sizing back up? And uh, Mike, if you, if you want to jump in here, feel feel free. You just yeah. want to look gradually. You want to size up step by step by step. You make money at this level, go to the next level. You make money at that level, go to the next level. So you, you don't all of a sudden triple your sizing uh, at once and possibly lose weeks worth of profit with, with one bad trade. Go ahead, Mike. So we find on our desk, you know, we're actively trading. So this may not be true for hedge fund traders or maybe some value traders or some longer term traders. But for active traders, we find one of the things that we have to teach our traders is that they don't necessarily have to draw down more to make more. And if they really do study their best trades, and as I said before, we have these easy money monthly reviews that the guys are getting a lot of benefit out of. If they go back and they study the best trades from the month, the easy money trades for the month, you know, almost universally they're coming back and they're saying, I, I didn't need to draw down almost at all. You know, if they really became laser focused on their entries, they really don't have to draw down very much at all. And you'll, you'll hear them talking about them. You'll, you'll hear them say, you know, one of our traders, had a $400,000 a month last month, and his largest drawdown was $20,000. And he accredited this really good month to focusing on his entries and not really drawing down. And so I just want to put that out there. It, it, you, don't have to, it, it, you don't have to necessarily draw down a lot to, to make more money. So when guys are sizing back up after they're trading well, they're, they're recognizing that if they're starting to draw down, that's probably means they're wrong and they should just get out and not fight that trade. And then uh, they can be big. I mean, an active trader gets really big, really aggressively at a moment and it should work pretty quickly. And if it doesn't, there are, there's a trade decision to be made. And if it goes against them, it's probably there's, there's other trade decisions to be made. So that's what we see for active trading. Yeah, I, I think that's that's really helpful. And one thing that I wanted to ask you guys, uh, since Lance brought it up last week and I thought it was a really great topic, uh, he, he discussed his daily report card and and kind of you know that continual process of grading yourself to stay in tune with, are you following your rules? Are you following your plan? Um, I'd like to, to hear both your thoughts, uh, Mike, more from, you know, what should be on a report card? How should you grade uh, your trading? What should you be looking at? And then Dr. Steve Barker, maybe the uh, the emotions, you know, uh, what you experience in the day, the journaling side of things. Um, and uh, yeah, Mike, we'll maybe start with you on the more trade so, side. Yeah. So the daily report card is an idea uh, from Dr. Steenbarger. Okay. The genesis of the, of the daily report card is Dr. Steenbarger working with Shark, one of our top traders at the firm to get better at uh, certain parts of his trading. And Shark would write a daily report card to Dr. Steenbarger and Dr. Steenbarger would give him feedback. And it's a, it's a really efficient way for a coach and a mentor to provide guidance to somebody else. But it's also a way for the trader to, to be tracking intensively the thing that's really going to move the needle. And so one of the things you want to be asking yourself is what's the one thing that I can do that will have a significant impact on my trading? What's the one thing that I can do this month that will have a significant impact on my trading? And that is what you can 
center the daily report card around. So maybe it's maybe it's you're overtrading. You can de you develop a daily report card over judging yourself each day and giving your score self a score as to whether or not you're overtrading, and you'll start to keep track of the things that you do that help you not to overtrade, and you'll keep track of the things that get you in trouble. And you'll learn about that and you'll get better at that one thing, which will propel your progress going forward. And so that's an exercise that that all of our guys are doing on the desk and, and is, is pretty helpful for, for making some progress. Absolutely, Mike. It uh, is part of what they call in the psychology research deliberate practice where you're performing, you're reviewing performance, you're learning from the review, you're making improvements, you're reviewing again, learning from that. And so it's a continual process of refining what you're doing, both by identifying what you do well and building on that, and by identifying what you could be doing better and changing that. I want to shout out, uh, give a shout out to Lance here and uh, those uh, watching uh, who are not familiar with his work, Lance Breitstein, uh, he has some really good YouTube videos out. He, I think, has added two things to the daily report card idea. One is, you know, the credibility of being a successful trader himself so he can give very concrete feedback. That's very helpful, but even more so, I think, Mike, he has done a great job of making the traders accountable. In other words, making sure that you're being honest, that you're doing that report card, that you're learning from it, that you're accountable to you, you're accountable to uh, the capital that you're running. And it's that spirit of accountability that really distinguishes successful performers really in any field. Can I add just one quick thing? So I tend to be the type of person who likes things very organized. So if you say to me, our traders should do a daily report card, I'm going to create a template and I'm going to say to our traders, do it this way. And then what's great about having somebody like Dr. Steenbarger helping us is he will look at that and say, that's great, Mike, but people learn in different ways. And as long as they have the spirit, of the daily report card, there's lots of different ways they can do it. For instance, there's some people who get a lot out of actually speaking in in, in terms of a, rev, of a review of a review after after the day. So they'll get on a headset and they'll just talk to their team, and that's their daily report card. Um, and so it doesn't have to be in a certain way in a certain template. It, it just needs for you to be intensive about one thing that will really move the needle for your trading. And are there any common, um, you know, ha having mentored so many people, are there any common things that you see a lot of people find value in including in their report card? Any examples of metrics they watch, things they think about during the day, uh, mental exercises they during, do during the day? Uh, and maybe Dr. Steenbarger to start? Yeah, and, and, and Mike, as you know, with the report cards of the traders, uh, the... Uh, platform and the one that I'm most familiar with is Trader View collects the data on your trading and spits out to you how many winning trades do you have? How many losing trades? What was the average size of the winning trades? The average size of the losing trades? What was your profitability on your long trades, your short trades? Uh, what was your profitability as a function of time of day or as a function of what you were trading? So you can look under the hood, so to speak, to see where your mistakes are coming from, where your good trading is coming from. The important element I find is that it's just as important to review the successes as the things that need improvement. And so anything that allows you to get under the hood and figure out where the successes are coming from, what you're doing when you're trading well, what you could be doing differently, better, uh, that's going to move you forward. Yeah, perfect. 
Mike, anything to add? Yeah, I will highlight that a lot of trader improvement comes from you understanding your, your best trades and people like me saying to you, you have a good trade. I made a lot of money in wall and me saying to you, great. How can you make more? And then Dr. Steenbarger has been terrific advising traders to take a, to ask another question, which is what are you doing before trading that brings you to your optimal state to perform at your best? So it's not just what you trade well, but it's how you trade well that you need to be going over to, to, to make the most money. Yeah, that's actually perfect because I was going to ask about routines and, and what you guys would recommend. So, uh, Dr. Steve Margaret, maybe starting with you, uh, what are some of the common things and routines that can help traders reach that optimum level where they're trading at their best, wh whatever their potential is? Well, what the research in psychology tells us is that our performance in general in any performance field is going to be best when we are at our best in our mindset. If we have a good amount of psychological well-being, as it's cause, uh, called, a good amount of happiness, a good amount of fulfillment, a good amount of energy, a good amount of closeness to other people, we are going to be more productive, but we're also going to be more creative. An important part of success in the trading world is seeing opportunities that other people don't see. There's no edge in being consensus. So if we are in our most positive mindset, if we are living a life that gives us lots of positivity, that's going to be helpful to our trading. If all of our focus is on trading, if all of our focus is on p &L, then our mindset is going to rise and fall with our trading results. And that's a pretty vulnerable place to be. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, and I, I will say that you, you want to have a, you want to be thinking about your performance holistically. One thing that I will add to that, and, and that this is not in, in, in any way contradicting that statement. It's just that inside of that idea, it's pretty evident based on the idea generation that certain traders and groups have how well they're going to do. The, the group that is doing the best at our firm right now, if you pass them by on the trading desk, you will notice they are talking all day long, sharing ideas, generating ideas, uh, debating whether how big they should be in ideas, debating whether they should take some profits off, debating other stocks they should be buying. They're talking all day long. It's different than other traders on the desk. They're talking more, they're sharing more, they're, they're generating more ideas. And in fact, this the same cluster of people we took to a, a Yankees game recently, I was in front, they were in back. They talked the entire game about trades, trading, trades that were coming up. They were game planning at the Yankee game where I was just trying to enjoy the game, but they were super interested in trading and generating and sharing ideas. Yeah, excellent. Um, I want to touch on, cause I, I saw some questions about this, about finding your edge and finding your style too. Cause um, every trader is going to have their own time frame, their own style that works best for them. Um, I definitely want to hear both of your perspectives. What advice would you give um, for traders who are are just joining this or are trying to really concretely define their style, uh, their edge, um, and you know how how they can make sure it's the right one for them? And uh, Mike, maybe starting with you. Yeah, so I remember Dr. Steenbarger espousing the education that you get at an investment bank. Uh, for trading. And I remember thinking, wait a second, I'm a proprietary trading desk. I think we're doing some things well here too, but you know, we're not, we're not an investment bank, but I remember him, I remember listening to him talk about why 
the training at investment bank is uh, so powerful and it's it's because you get a chance to uh, gravitate amongst different desks and you get exposure to lots of different types of trading and jobs inside of an investment bank and so look we are an active trading firm and we're going to screen for people we think will be good at active trading even as active traders we are giving our traders our interns exposure to lots of different ways that active traders make money and there really are lots of different ways that people make money as active traders some people are scalpers some people are momentum traders uh, some people are good at trading m a opportunities some some traders are good at breaking news trades some traders are good at breakout trades some traders are good at filings some people are good at low floats there's there's so many some people are good at reversals some people are good at uh, stocks that are basing on multiple days that are eventually going to explode so there's just so many different ways that you can make money and we believe it's important to expose our traders the different ways people are making money in markets as active traders and let them choose the type of trader the type of niche that they're going to trade Totally agree, Mike. Uh, you know, the analogy that I use comes from my background uh, teaching in a medical school. You know, how does a medical student figure out what kind of physician they're meant to be? Well, in the medical education, they rotate to various specialties. They spend six weeks in psychiatry. They spend 12 weeks in internal medicine. They spend six weeks in surgery, They say, et cetera, et cetera. And so you taste all the different fields, all the different types of medicine, and you figure out what speaks to you. And I do think there is advantage in trying different markets, trying different strategies, trying different time frames to see where your strengths lie. In general, and this is drawing upon Daniel Kahneman's book, The thinking fast and slow. In general, there's a difference between people who are slower, deeper thinkers, big idea people, and people who are faster thinkers who see patterns quickly and act on them quickly. The slower, deeper thinkers often are good investors. And the fast pattern recognizers are often good traders. We want to figure out how we are wired, what kind of way of processing information is best for us, because that's what's going to make us most successful in financial markets. Yeah, I, I think that's great. And when, when traders are seeking an edge and learning a system, uh, I think a common issue, and you guys would be the experts on this, uh, is they, they're they not fully accepting a system, they're not fully following a system, and there's a lot of randomness that pops up in their trading. Um, any thoughts on uh, improving discipline, improving following your rules, and making sure that you're, you're true to your system, true to your process, uh, so over time that consistency can ultimately lead to profits, uh, because inconsistency, randomness can lead to big wins, but you know it can also lead to big losses as well on the flip side. And uh, Mike, maybe starting with you. I actually think that's an easy answer. Mm -hmm. I think it's an answer that people don't like hearing. There's a, a viral video today going around of Nick Saban who gives advice on this. And he says, if you want to be more disciplined as a football player, you have to be disciplined in your life. Discipline is a way of life. If you want to be a disciplined trader, you have to be a disciplined person. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Yeah, that, that make, and in fact, there is research in psychology, Mike, uh, to that effect, that people who are what is called conscientious, it's one of the five big personality traits, people who are conscientious tend to be disciplined and tend to carry that forward in different areas of their lives, including uh, trading. Um, I will add that if you learn the right way, and practice, 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 especially first in simulation and then with very small size, you develop positive 
good habit patterns. There's a sense in which we don't want to rely on discipline to do the right things. We want to rely on positive habit patterns. We want to do things so often the right way that they become part of us. So if I get up in the morning and I take a shower, and I do that every single morning, every single day, it's not because I'm disciplined. It's become a habit. It's become a part of my life. That's how, how we want to internalize the right activities in trading. Yeah, excellent. And and doubling down on going back to the report card concept and just kind of self-analysis as a trader, when, when you're looking back on your trades and trying to identify whether it's a good trade, a bad trade, what would you recommend traders think about? Because it's not necessarily at the end of the day, whether you made money on a trade that it was a good trade or you, you lost money, so it's a bad trade. Over time, obviously that's true. Uh, but on a singular trade, how, how should traders look at things to approach that analysis to get the most out of it uh, and either make new rules, make adjustments, and ultimately you know, seek that continual improvement? And Dr. Steenbarger, maybe starting with you. Yeah, and if you have developed some rules for your trading, then you can go back and you can say, did I follow those? Would I take that same bet again? under the same conditions. Uh, that's really the hallmark of a good trade. Everything in financial markets is probabilistic. There's nothing that's 100%. And so there are going to be times where we follow a very good process, do all the right things, and it doesn't work out that particular time. It's like playing poker. You know, you, you draw some really good cards, but someone else might have something better. But you're saying to yourself, did I follow these rules? Did I make the right decisions? Did I size things the right way? That's really the important part of the review. Mike, anything to add? I think he said that very well. Yeah, <laughs> perfect, perfect. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add yeah. one little piece, and it's back to your idea, Mike, of the regime change. Many times I know from my own trading, I'll put on a good trade and I lose money. And after cursing and <laughs> I'll, I'll say, this should have worked. Yeah. Normally this works. Yeah. Maybe something is different now. I, and, and I will add, I will add to this as well for independent traders. I do think that's where it's really helpful to have a senior trader who is collaborating with you or somebody more experienced who's collaborating with you, who can say to you, Hey, that trade was worth it. That trade wasn't worth it. I think it can be a little bit tough if you're alone and starting and new and you're an independent trader, if you don't lean on the team trader. I mean, I know that lots of the really good trades on the, on the desk that are made, sometimes they can start from, a junior trader generating the idea, but but they really need that senior trader to say, yes, this is a great trade. Like we really should risk up here. Yes, we should be continuing to hold this position. That just comes with being involved in markets for, for many years to be able to provide that kind of insight. Yeah, excellent. And uh, there's a good question from AQ um, here. So I'll go ahead and find it. Here we go. Um, so after so many years in the market and trading, uh, he'd like to know, Mike, you know, what keeps you motivated and what, what, what keeps you interested in the markets, uh, at this point, is it still money or something else, something bigger? And maybe, uh, we could also touch on your motivation for teaching and, and helping other traders develop as well. Yeah. So it, most of my job right now is running the firm and what keeps me motivated is trying to run the firm better. It's trying to find uh, traders that fit our firm better. It's it's focused on how do we train those traders who come the door better. It's how do we provide more resources to the traders that are here uh, better, uh, and and also uh, assisting the people that uh, help us do that at the firm. So we have great support with Carlton and Jeff and 
uh, all the guys and Dan Gudlowski and the team leaders. And uh, I, I try and help them um, do their jobs a little bit better. But the, the most rewarding thing in, 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 the, in the jobs that I have now is looking for people that really want to be a professional trader. Like I, we know who those people are. Sometimes people send an application in and they say they really want to be a trader. And then somebody else sends an application in and they've shown that they really want to be an active trader. That, that, that those are the people that we want to work with, you know, give us a guy who, who has prepared prior to coming to us to really be an active trader. Give us a person who truly wants to be here and truly wants to get better. I mean, that it is so much fun. It, it it brings us so much joy. It's so joyful to be able to work with somebody like that. I mean, at no point do you ever think it's work. It's it's a fun experience. It, it it's almost as I feel as if I'm grateful when I get a chance to work with somebody who really wants to do this job and is really working hard at it, and 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 start to see them do a little bit better. That that's that's quite a bit of fun. That'll never go away. Seeing, seeing guys start to come up the curve, that that'll that'll never that'll never stop being fun. Fantastic. That's great. That's great, Mike. There is a uh, very good book by uh, David Brooks called "The Second Mountain," and his idea is that people who climb the mountain of success, they get to a peak, they get to a summit, and at some point, they decide that they need to climb a second mountain. And that second mountain is different from the first one. So they find new challenges that are meaningful. Very often, the first mountain is all about success, financial success, and so forth. The second mountain very often will be of what Brooks calls a moral nature of improving the world, improving others. So for example, in the uh, world where I work in finance, it's common that someone will succeed, succeed, succeed in their trading, and they will build a team. And their second mountain is to participate in the growth of other traders, tackle new markets, different markets. And so now they have a whole new set of meaningful activities. I think that transition's a really important one. Yeah, I think that's a that's a wonderful perspective. Um and I'd like to yeah, I'd like to back. throw in a I'd like to throw in a pitch if I could then. So uh some of the work that we do is with Traders for a Cause. Traders for a Cause raises money for lots of great charities. They hold an annual event each year in Las Vegas. This year we're holding it uh, in November. Lots of great presenters from like like with your conference here come to Traders for a Cause and share knowledge about trading. It's a great great time to network, meet successful traders, and and get ideas to help you grow your trading business. And uh, it's it's a fun event. And so there are there are people in the trading community participating in something like that for Traders for a Cause. And I do think Traders for a Cause is trying to role model how traders who have made money can give back. And I think also we mentioned Lance on Twitter is at the one Lance B who presented for you. He literally became a successful trader. He achieved, he achieved all of his financial goals. He, he achieved his, his dream of being a successful trader. And then he kind of quit. He pretty much quit. I mean, he does trade a little bit still, but he quit. And what did he do? He spent his time building out his personal charity. So he runs he runs a charity called the Impact Competition, which is an amazing charity. I sit on the board of it uh, to be transparent. And he traded his time in front of screens for that second part of the mountain, Dr. Steenbarger building out the impact competition to which, which has a lasting impact on local communities. That's very inspiring. 
Yeah, fantastic. And, and we mm -hmm. dropped the link to Traders for a Cause in the chat for everybody watching. Definitely check it out. Uh, Mike and Dr. Sinabari, this has been really amazing. Uh, just one last kind of closing question. Uh, do you have any advice out there for, for traders who maybe are struggling and want to find their way uh, or really just for traders who want to level up and reach that next level of, of performance and, and success? And uh, Mike, maybe starting with you. So go to our YouTube channel. There's a lot of there's a lot of really great education that's being shared by our traders on the desk that can be super helpful. I'm told it's helpful from the comments and from the emails I get. So you can just go to SME Capital, SME Capital's YouTube channel and, and get a whole bunch of, of really great free education. And the second thing relates back to what Dr. Steenbarger was saying before, and this is advice we give to a lot of our traders, which is find what you're doing well mm -hmm. and capture that as a part of your trading business that you can risk money on and find the things that you're not doing well and eliminate that from your, your trading business and start to see the results of that. And you should be tagging and measuring in something like TraderView, all of your trades, and you should know where you're making money and you should know where you're not making money. Microsoft wouldn't sell a product that it knew it was continually losing money on quarter after quarter. They would extinguish the product. Apple isn't gonna roll out, isn't gonna continue funding a project that's losing money day over day, week over week, month over month. They're going to also be putting more resources and money into the things that are working. And so you need to treat your trading business as a, as a business and start to have that data in front of yourself and, and start to make decisions based on that data. Do more of what's working, get rid of what isn't. That's great advice, nice, Mike. Uh, if, if I could just add a different perspective, the important thing is not to be successful in trading. The important thing is to do great and meaningful things with your life. And if that's in financial markets, that's wonderful. If it's outside financial markets, that's wonderful. There was a time early in my career where I traded full time. I actually made some money. Didn't like it. Something was missing. Because I'm a psychologist for a reason. Being in front of screens all day didn't give me that same fulfillment as being part of people's lives and helping others. We're all wired differently. And sometimes trading doesn't work out for us because it's not our path. That's not a failure. That's an important discovery. The important thing is to figure out what is our path? Where is our passion? Our passion will define our purpose. Our purpose will define our path. We're meant to do what we're really good at and what speaks to us. Great if that's in markets. If it's somewhere else, that will be great too. Fantastic. Well. I want to thank both of you for your time and, and for sharing your thoughts. Uh, I, I think uh, there's been some really val great value shared here, and uh, hopefully everybody watching got something uh, meaningful out of this. And if you did, uh, please consider a donation to St. Jude's. Uh, check out Traders for a Cause, S&P Capital, uh, both Mike and Dr. Steenbarger on Twitter. Uh, and we'll be right back after a quick break for lunch. So get some food, get something to drink, and I'll be back and ready for more great presentations afterwards. So thank you both. But once again, Mike and Dr. Steve Barger, it's great chatting with you. Thank, thank you, you so much, Richard. Yeah, thanks for organizing this, Nick. Thanks for helping with this. Um, been great. Yeah, perfect. We'll be right back. Take care.
All right, so it's time for the lunch break for day four of the Trader Line uh, Trading Conference. Here's a quick reminder about the schedule for today. Uh, we'll be coming back with Ross Haber, then continuing on with John Brody, and then finishing things off with Tom Basso discussing all weather trading. A really great end to this day. Um, I hope you guys have already learned an incredible amount, uh, and we'll you know continue things and keep it going uh, later today after lunch. So we'll be right back at 2 p.m., with Ross Haber talking about the consolidation pivot and optimizing training execution, really getting into the details should be a fantastic presentation. So make sure you're back here at two. Uh, and just another quick reminder to please consider a donation to St. Jude's um, using the link down below the chat here. Uh, $1, $5, $10 is great. Uh, if you're finding in the finding value in this conference, please go ahead and give back as well. And with that, uh, we'll be right back. I'll play uh, a video during lunch so you guys don't get too bored. Uh, but we'll see you back here live at 2 p.m. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Trail Line Podcast. I'm your host, Richard Moglin. Joining me today is one of my favorite people to talk to about the markets, Jim Ropel, who is the founder of Ropel Capital Management, as well as GrowStockMentor.com. Uh, Jim, always great to have you on. Uh, it's great to start off the year here uh, with some optimism as well, which I'm sure we'll cover today. So uh, thanks so much for your time. Oh, dude, I'm fired up to do it. I think you do such a great job as an interviewer. And so I'm happy to be here. I love doing it. And um, let's get it done. Yeah, let's dive right in. And uh, I actually went ahead and asked, you know, our viewers, our listeners, as well, people on Twitter, uh, what they'd most like to ask you. And I probably the most asked thing was, uh, what advice would you have uh, during the next, you know, the start of the next bull market, whenever that comes, whether, whether it's right now, and we'll, we'll definitely discuss that. Um, but what advice do you have for the next bull market so you don't mess up that transition and, and you make the most out of, you know, the next big run? I would not be in such a tremendous hurry to run because you're probably going to make more mistakes. And I would say have faith in yourself because if you don't, you won't have the confidence and you'll, if you don't think you're worth it, you'll blow it. Believe in the system, believe in yourself, believe in the American system that we operate under the golden goose of capitalism. You know, I'll just, I repeat this all the time, unless it's crushed by socialism we're going to have another Starbucks, another Tesla, another BlackBerry, another McDonald's. The, the the system we live in just births all these opportunities for us. And everyone's like, you know, the next 20 minutes, the interday chart. If you, you need to, everyone, I started in 87, in 85, actually. And I've compounded my money out for that well I, that's not true because i was i was a big loser learning how to do this for a long time but i'm 58 years old today and i love 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 what i do i believe i'll do it for at least 30 more years and you know if there's a bull market every 3 years that's 10 more bull markets and if there's 20 more tmls in every bull that's 200 opportunities to go from first class to private jet or from bike to car or, you know, rented house to beautiful condo. These, so believe in yourself, believe in the system and chill. I mean, it, I ran the numbers the other day and I'm going to probably get this a little wrong, but if you had $50,000 and you compound it out at 15% for 40 years, that's $16 million. Okay. Now, let's assume that along the way, you have a 100% year like you did in 2020 or 07. Mm -hmm. And 15% is pretty simple for, you know, for somebody who's not running a tons of money, you don't have to hit too many Broadcoms and Teslas to get seriously rich. Um, confidence in yourself, confidence in your system, confidence in the American way. And just chill. It's going to happen. Stop with the micro focusing. That kills me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but my key point to compounding though is you have to make sure that you know you, you don't get devastated in the bear markets when they do come. So do you have any any tips and advice to make sure you know that your drawdowns are within reason? You know during those periods where we're just chopping sideways or or you know pulling back hard like we did in throughout twenty twenty two. So 
I mean, it's not a secret. Bill O'Neill was really guiding light for me. I mean, everything I know, I learned from him. I didn't innovate anything. The, yep. the Japanese had it right, just knock somebody off. And he was great at standing on the accelerator at the right moment. But he would change his position fairly quickly, very quickly, if things weren't working. So following the rules, you know, your simple guardrail is the 50-day moving average. Yeah. If you're only dealing with securities above the 50 in an uptrend, you don't use too excessive of margin. And you stay in the leaders, you know, the high comp rating stocks, the more, more so the high RS. There's a huge debate in the can slim hedge fund world right now. It's raging. I had an hour and 30 minute call about it today. And that is how important are, is a new high. And I, I personally believe N and can slim is imperative. I believe every time you give up one of the variables in can slim, you reduce the probability of success or you make it more difficult on yourself. But simply following the sell rules, when the market starts to go south, keep a running tab of your last 10 stocks. Are they higher or lower from where you sold them? Let the market tell you how many climax runs in 2000, in the, in the 2000 top, I was so fortunate. I hit a huge string of climax runs and I just sold into them. And I was fortunate to get out. It was easy to get out that way. The drawdowns that you sometimes have to take between the high and the 50 day are significant before they break through it. Yeah. So uh, experience in a hedging strategy Look, you, you're just not going to do as well the first couple times you go through a bull and getting out as you are after you've been doing it for 30 years. Yeah. Um, but you'll learn and you're going to, most likely you're going to make a lot of mistakes for the first five, six, seven years. I mean, it took me a lot longer, but I think it's only because I tried so hard. It's not because I'm smart. It's because I put my hand on the hot burner and Pavlov, you know, to burn the hand. Yep. <laughs> and but I had to relearn those lessons. Read John Boyk's book if you're really yep. tired and you want to go to sleep. Um, it chronicles how I lost all my money a couple times before I oh, listen. I'm taking 20 minutes to answer your question. How do you stay in the game and compound? You don't lose in bears. And it takes some learning and some experience. Um I think if you, if you're, listen, if 15% is fairly simple, easy, it's, it's hard work, but it can be done without a lot of excessive uh, ex, ex, talent to start to do 25% or 30%, you're going to have to use a lot of margin. And I think if you can get out of a bull market as it's cresting and capture 80% of what you earned. In other words, only draw down 20% off the top. You're doing an excellent job if you're using heavy margin. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to have excellence, how about outstanding numbers? You're going to have to use margin. But at the bottom of every disaster hedge fund is almost always margin. And ignoring your sell rules. Um, and so, look, okay, I'm going to, you got to give me a little leeway here. Yeah, go ahead. Peter Brandt, Nicholas Darvis, and Sequoia. Three absolute monster compounding machines, gigantic. One thing they all had in common, I'll give you, it might, might be a little hard to guess, but give me one guess. I'm not putting you on the spot. Yeah, yeah. They didn't watch during the day. Mm -hmm. They put their buy and sell limit orders in. Tomorrow I'm going pheasant hunting with my really good friend. I'm going to give him a few stop orders, buy stops and sell stops. I'm going I'm going to hunt pheasant all day. I'm not going to watch. So all this crap behind me, all these charts, I put that stuff in here 20 years ago when I was a rookie. I it's all I I really think it's a distraction. Mm -hmm. So how do you get out? You pick your sell stop before you enter the trade or before the market's open and you let the market take you out. You remove the emotion because when the 
it's like the book it's like in bill's book when you have a turkey trap you know with the stick yep. and a turkey walks in and there's another one and one walks out well do you wait for the next turkey to walk back in or you pull the stick down you know you got to set the number if it's three turkeys you pull it right have a 20 minute answer to a one second question no it's, it's expected but it, it's awesome and um taking a step back uh, we mentioned before we press record, or you mentioned that, you know, we're kind of at a potential turning point here in the market. So, you know, looking at the big picture, what are you kind of seeing both on the macro side, as well as, you know, what the existing leadership and themes that could be emerging right now? What are you seeing with regards to the market? And, and what do you think about the overall health right now? I think it's, a, we're at a critical juncture. I mean, I'm always ready to flex with the market, no matter what. But oh, here, for the first time in over a year, and I, I write this newsletter called Growth Stock Mentor, and I have a lot of bears in there holding balls underwater and just pictures and graphics and springs compressing. The very first page ahead of any kind of, uh, text, I put a, a bull. It's the first bull that's been in my newsletter in over a year. Mm -hmm. But at the exact same moment, we're in a high, high danger point. The S&P is at a little over 4,000. It's right at, at long-term downtrend line. 4,100 is the prior high. There's all this resistance. We are dead in resistance. It is the likely place for a top. But if we break out, we could have a strong move up. The issue I see is I don't think anyone's been scared out. The public has been buying stock. We have not. The VIX hasn't spiked. The put to call hasn't spiked. The internal buying pressure is not that good versus selling pressure. It is improved. The new highs are just barely exceeding new lows. They've just started to improve a little bit, but they're only a little bit better than they were in August. Mm -hmm. I mean, okay, look, here, the dominant, we can talk about the dominant fundamental factor, which is critical, but we'll skip that for the second. Mm -hmm. Volume matters greatly, but it is trumped by price. But that's trumped by can you make money? And it's very, very difficult to make money right now. AXOM, AXOM broke out and it reversed and pulled back in. You know, we, we've had significant rotation under the hood where it's the industrials and then now all of a sudden growth stocks are ripping. Don't, it, it can't be lost on anybody here. The Goldman Sachs most short index, which is the most heavily shorted stocks has been rocking. It's up 17% for the year. Well, that's a short covering rally. We are in a short, that that is screaming short covering rally. Without wearing anybody out or, or, or scaring them out and the public's buying, no VIX, no put to call, no heavy volume bottom panic. It's hard for me to believe the market's gonna let everybody just make a killing. Um, but I'm a trend follower, but beyond that, I have to be able to make money and I've only made money in, in my, in my gold and metal positions. Mm -hmm. And my number one idea, which is for advanced traders is if we've had a long run into resistance, if we have a gap up reversal on the indexes, I am going short. I've been, I've made more money doing that than almost anything in the last year and a half. <laughs> yeah. And just for everybody watching, we're recording this on Monday after the close, just for some perspective. I uh, will have to see how this week plays out. Um, I'd love to hear, Jim, what are kind of your top ideas right now, uh, your top positions, and what, what kind of themes, overall themes, are you most excited about if we do get, you know, a, a sustainable rally that, that does progress, um, you know, further from this point? So there's fundamentals, which I believe in but I must have them corroborated by the new high list. I mean, your new high list is the gold bar list kind of combined with relative strength. If you have any idea, I'm going to give you a thematic idea. If the stock's going to work, it's got to get into the new high list. And if it's going to go from 50 to 300, it has to make a new high all the way there. So whatever I'm going to say must be corroborated by new highs and, and, and it's, you know, great relative strength. But I think mobile eye, any stock that can come out in a really, really bad bear market, it, it might be one of the only that has uh, come out of any significant quality. It is, and listen, Tesla can go dormant for 10 years, and I think it might. It's had a double TML, a TML mm. digestion, and a TML again. 
there's only a 2.7% probability of a TML reoccurring. And it, it did it. It might have, it's one of the greatest stocks in history. It, it's, it can go dormant for 10 years and, and still have great sales. But Mobileye is just selling them components for, you know, for the, for the, for the, for the, uh, our, the, the vision the, system. Autonomous driving. Yeah. Yeah. So I like that very much, but it is choppy, very choppy and uh, erratic. So the, it needs to calm down a little bit. Uh, I'm huge in gold. My biggest position is gold and silver. I like the miners better than the the uh, GLD or SLV, but I own them all. But your miners are high beta gold. And, uh, you know, semiconductors had a great day today. I think, is it ACLS is looks mm-hmm. really interesting. And there's some others. I mean, I almost bought NVIDIA today, but it's so far off the high. It's disturbing. I like DR Horton. And that's a leading indicator for the economy. You know, uh, it seems so counterintuitive. How could mortgage rates go from 2% to 6 or 7 and the home builders are starting to catch tr- get traction? And that's a leading indicator for the economy. Maybe they're saying that rates are going to fall in the end of the year. Uh, ugh, I like oil service stocks. I like Schlumberger a lot. Uh, I think Tidewater for a super small mark, micro cap looks interesting. Um, there's a bunch of ideas right now, but here's the thing. You do, Well, here, on a more thematic look forward, something like Nor- Norvo, Nor- Nordisk, they have this drug called Ozempic for obesity. Mm-hmm. 75% of the population is either overweight or obese. I don't, I, I have a lot of friends and I only have one. I call him the thin man because he's such an odd, unique person. Everybody I know is five to 50 pounds overweight. This drug, the, the total addressable market for an obesity drug is it's got to be the biggest market in the world. It, it, in my opinion, I mean, what, what does 75% of the world need besides food? An obesity drug. Uh, and the drugs, the biotech drugs that we're seeing are more curative than treatments, the new ones that are going to be coming out. So I think biotech is going to be absolutely ripe and rich with new developments. But I, I, I learned a lesson about that. I'm going to jump off screen for half a second. Yeah, no worries. I, I keep this right by my desk all the time. And can you see, does it say Senecor on there? Yep, I saw it right yeah, at the top. Upper, look, Senecor rises on FDA victory. So they had a drug called Centoxin, which was supposed to cure septicemia, which is what most people die from in the end. But the review committee, I'm sorry, the, the full FDA committee declined to give it an approval, which is a super oddity. Biotech without an FDA approval and sales is a minefield. These are mostly research labs with no product, no sales force or anything. It's live or die by clinical trials and review committee. So absolutely, in my opinion, you have to have a basket of these to spread your risk or get through the FDA process and then sales. There's Mm -hmm. plenty of room afterwards. Amgen, one of the greatest winning stocks in history. First earnings report, a penny, 32 cents against a penny. There was a 32,000% increase in earnings. And the stock went crazy from there. So again, the addressable market was amazing. But biotech, I think, is phenomenal. Um, I don't think electrical technology is going to slow down. And I can't not discuss crypto. I am extremely bullish on crypto. I have a crypto hedge fund. I am long crypto big time. So I'm not just talking. I'm I'm with you in this thing. So I, I think the, I'll tell you this, I think the largest market cap crypto coin might not even be ICO'd yet. I think there's there will be, in my assessment, c- coins that are going to have trillion dollar market caps, single coins. And I'm not talking about Bitcoin. The con- the industry is in such infancy. The whole market cap is a little over $1 trillion today. Microsoft's bigger than that. Mm-hmm. So the upside here, we're in about 1990, 94 in equity terms. And I, I worked at Morgan Stanley. I was uh, did a lot of IPOs in the late 90s. Uh, and I watched the build out of the internet. And I see the roadmap is almost identical to the build out of the internet. And so 
you know, imagine today, well, let, let's put it this way. In 1995, if you would have bought a million dollars worth of, with, of uh, spread it all over the internet, you'd be a billionaire today. Yeah. So if you, if you just buy a, a, a mixed portfolio of high quality crypto projects, and if they, you know, get too far off the highs or fall out of the top 40 market cap and you just reallocate back in there, I think you've got an absolute, I think this is, I, I actually think this is as big as, as biotech, maybe bigger. How about that? There's a no, few ideas. Yeah, that's good. And, uh, you know, to touch on the risk with bio, uh, biotech, I think CPRX today, Gap Down, uh, that was a name that I think a lot of people are watching. It happens. So you, you got to be, you got to be ready. 30%. Yeah. yeah. Well, the, the stock I told you about, Senecor, on the FDA review committee, it went from like 18 to 60. And when the FDA shot it down, it fell to five. Yeah. It's all or nothing. You're, you're, it's all or not. And that's a perfect example. I was going to, I should have called that out. Yep. Yep. Oh, I got you. I got you. Um, to follow up on, on crypto and everything. Um, what, what's kind of your overall, uh, you know, strategy with that? And is it similar to how you approach, you know, stocks you're looking at, both the fundamentals as well as the price action, or do you have a more of a long-term approach with your, your crypto portfolio? Crypto is basically liquid, well, not really liquid, but public venture. They're, they're deals that probably should be private and remain private, but because of the decentralization and the, the you know, there's no control, these companies launch coins. So you have to look at it more as a venture type investment. I do follow trend in everything. But, you know, the number, my number one indicator, I'm not a venture or an angel investor, although I do have a lot of money in this stuff, is what is the developer community? The number one coin for developers is, is Ethereum. Mm -hmm. And another one that, I, again, I'm, I'm talking my book here. I'm long an ocean load of a coin called ICP, which was trashed so severely. It came out at four or 500. It went down to three. I, I hold all of it. I've never sold any of it. I took a little tax loss on some stuff I bought way high, but I, I mean, this much, I'm, I'm long. Their developer community is exploding. The, the, the develop, as crypto imploded, the development community, community continued to grow. Mm -hmm. And I hear all these people, it's a scam, it's a fraud. And I'm talking about people who are on TV who should know better. They're screaming from the rooftops at the dead low that you're an idiot if you own it. And, that's a total bottom signal. Um, look, equities need an FTX. We need the Lehman moment. Now, crypto's had the Lehman moment. Three arrows, Luna, all the supposed in the know people saying it's a scam at the dead low. We have a huge run up. I'm not saying the bottom is in, but I I, I think we may retest it. I don't know, but we're going... I believe greatly we're going to go way higher. And I think crypto is going to bottom way before equities. I don't believe equities have bottomed yet. Um, so we need the public to vomit up their stock. And they have not. We need that FTX moment in equities to put the bottom in. Yeah. And listen, if we don't get a Lehman moment and you see 30 stocks break out in high, high quality and go, I'm not going to wait for the Lehman moment in equities. I'll yeah. follow the trend and the leader. How many leaders are emerging? Major, major signal. Like Bill would go, time to put the hammer down now. He was an expert at, at knowing when to take a big position or to, or to probe and test. And don't be so macho that you have to buy the thousand lot. Right. Bill O'Neill traded hundred lots all the time. And if he could trade a hundred, so can you. <laughs> yeah. And I want to ask you, you know, during this bear market, um, what are kind of your routines and also screens that you're running, you know, to, to try to keep track of emerging leadership and stocks that could become big leaders? You mentioned the new high list, which I know is a big one, but is there anything else, you know, gap ups on volume that you're looking for? Huge. You know that, yeah, yeah. But that usually comes in earnings season, which we're in, and earnings season is, earnings season could be the clue that breaks the, the S&P out of its downtrend or, or rolls it over. Right. This is big, but leading RS line absolutely points you. It's like a divining rod to water. It just, it sends you right to where you want to go. RS is critical. Gap ups, like you said, comp ratings. I mean, 
liquidity up, up to down volume. I run up to down volume all the time. And then I run uh, volume percentage up on the day. And you really can kind of tell, like I watch pre-market a lot mm -hmm. because I want to see what ripping. And it's like, it's it points straight to the needle in the haystack where everything's doing little, uh, very little activity, but then you have one or two stocks that are going goofy. That's where I want it. And then I, I'll watch the first 30 minutes and then I'll try to get away from it. I'll work out and go about my day and try to read. Uh, and I like to more check in than stare at the market. You know, yeah. I think it was Ed Sequoia or some, you know, legendary trader said, watching the market all day is like having a slot machine on your desk. You're going to, you know, start pulling that arm. So ask me the question again i totally spaced did you ask my routine yeah routines and screens to kind of track leadership and, and emerging leadership number one screen new high list relative strength up to down volume earnings get a surprise is an integral part of every tml i mean the definition of a tml is six to eight quarters of beaten rays if you put 20% of your whole account in a stock and you can sit through five to eight beaten raise quarters, you're going from one bedroom house to three bedroom house, you know, first class of private jet. Yeah. How many times do you need to do that in your whole life? If you did that, if you're 40 years old and between 40 and 80, you caught six of them and handled them right. And again, this goes to duration of hold the average person holds a stock i think i saw a study by the new york stock exchange the average person holds a stock for what, 20 days or 10 days or something how are you gonna how is someone sitting for five to eight quarters of beaten rays if you hold the stock in an average of 12 days that's cuckoo livermore it's the big money is in the sitting yeah i don't want to live on a razor's edge you know um I was building a house a long, long time ago in 99. And um, I told my dad, I wanted to knock a tile out and put a clear glass pane. So I, and with a shelf on the, so I could watch quotes while I'm mm -hmm. showering. And my dad's like, have, have you lost any sense of quality of life? Do you want to live on the razor's edge? And, and, and I, it, it didn't really resonate with me. I was still in the get rich business then. Yeah. But if you sell every gap up and every wiggle and jiggle, you have to put the money back to work, which means now if you have good risk management, you have to watch it like a hawk because you're always one second away from being stopped out, which means you're 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 chained to your computer. Who wants to live li like that? I mean, you're that's no. It, how about it might be fun, but it's no way to make a fortune. It's the mm -hmm. sitting. Yeah. Twenty minute answer. <laughs> no, it's good. It's good, and um, you know. There's actually a highly requested question that that I thought was really interesting. What were kind of the the five biggest stocks that changed your life? The the true market leaders that you really handled correctly and you know help helped you really make progress in your account. So it's so funny you to ask that because somebody last night put an article. I was in IBD in the it was a full page thing about my Broadcom trade and it was the first stock I made a million in one trade. And that was in like 99 or 98. So, you know, what is it, 20 plus years ago? That was the foundation of my war chest. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, I'm going to diverge from things. I grew up, I'm wearing a pair of jeans that are ripped straight through the knee. But when I was a kid, I got a couple pairs of jeans a year. And if I tore the knee out playing football, my mom would have to put a patch on it, like Wrangler blue jeans patch. I didn't have any money and I thought, and I live in a pretty wealthy town and I saw these rich kids and I was like, God, I want to be rich someday. And when I opened after the Broadcom trade on New Year's in 2000, I opened up my laptop and there was like $1.3 million in there. Now, if you would have told me five, 10, 20 years before, if I would ever in my whole life have $1.3 million, whatever the heck it was, I'd be like, I'm golden. I'll never be sad again. Well, that is completely not true. It's not true at all. The happiness in my life has not come from money. As a matter of fact, it's made my life more difficult. The happiness has come from my friends. That trade kicked ass. And I, I go back to it and I'm like, that was it. That was the start of everything. 
And I just took that money and compounded the crap out of it. And I had some bad drawdowns along the way, but so Broadcom was huge. SanDisk, mm -hmm. which I caught in an IRA, my wife's IRA, which is ballooned that thing up. Um, read John Boyk's book. Most of the big ones are in there, but my hedge fund made 30 million on Baidu coming out of a bear market. It had just an enormous string of weeks up in a row. Um, and the, the key was knowing the fundamental story. I read that something like 30,000 Chinese were going online per day. Mm -hmm. And then I found out that the government thought that Google was the um, going to dethrone the uh, the premier. So they, they canceled it and they rerouted all searches to Google to Baidu. So now I'm like, the government is funneling all these requests to them. And I'm like, you know, it, it just was such a un amazing fundamental story with an unbelievable total addressable market. The earnings were there. And I just, I took the mother of all positions in that thing. I was much more of a cowboy back then, much more so. Um, I, I would don't think I would ever take a position that big again. Uh, so, just read John Boyk's book. Most of them are in there, but yeah. every one of them had one commonality. Thunder earnings, massive total addressable market that I deeply, deeply understood. And I will tell you that some of these stocks that I bought, I bought because of gap ups on volume that were so thunderous. Uh, say, oh my God, uh, NVIDIA. I caught NVIDIA on the first gap up explosion breakout. And I think I bought like 270,000 shares in a day. And my my girl who runs my small fund, Eve Bobak, calls me. She's like, what are you doing? She's like, you got a giant position. They're going to report earnings after the close. She's like, you've lost it. I go, yeah. I go, they're going to report it. I go, this, this is, this is not, they're not going to miss. And they crushed it and it exploded up. And I, over the coming year or so, I kind of, it depends on how you look at it, but I trimmed off a little bit before every earnings report. So some people would say you would have never been able to sit with that much exposure as it, it, it the thing went wild. Yeah. So it maybe helped me sit, but had I stayed with that, <laughs> I was, you know, have been crazy. I, I had a lot of, a lot, lot, lot of stock in that one. So that's one that I don't think is in the book or it might be, I'm not sure. Yeah. And I don't know. All right, welcome back, everybody. It's a pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Ross Haber, our very own Ross Haber, uh, Chief Market Strategist at TraderLine. Uh, he's a former William O'Neill and Company Portfolio Manager. He also ran a hedge fund uh, for many years. And uh, yeah, really lo looking forward to this one, Ross, talking about the consolidation pivot setup and just on a more general level, trading execution, which is such a crucial part of trading. So uh, thanks so much for being here, Ross. And yeah, really looking forward to this one. I think it'll help out a lot of traders watching. I hope so. Um, well, thank you very much, Richard. Always um, always fun doing a uh, little presentation and chat with you. Um, so as you said, we're going to be discussing consolidation pivot today. We're going to be going through some examples in different kinds of market conditions, whether we're buying into strength, whether we're buying on weakness, where we might set some sell stops, that sort of thing. And then we're going to go through just the importance of execution techniques in general, not as it would apply to the consolidation pivot, but pretty much execution across the board, right? So for those of you who don't know me, here's a quick background and in a little more detail. Um, here, if you wanted to take a look, but essentially I started off in the retail brokerage business where the first book they gave me to read was Bill's book, How to Make Money in Stocks. From there, um, a client of mine um, 
let's just say he was a big William O'Neill follower, fan, whatever you would say, introduced me to the firm, really. She was um, my connection to William O'Neill and company. I started in his institutional sales department, so went from retail to institutional. And long story short, within a rear, within about a year, I became um, a portfolio manager instead of working in institutional sales. And um, needless to say, that's probably one of the best, if not the best experience of my lifetime. I, it's definitely a, a tough one to be, uh, can't, it was very, uh, not only did I get to sit next to Bill um, as much as I needed and ask all the questions I wanted, I got, I got to watch one of the most phenomenal bull markets in history, followed by still to this day, one of the longest or the longest bear market in history. And so now as I've grown old from my mid twenties into my fifties, I've got a little more experience under the belt and can kind of share with you the, um, you know, the subtleties and, you know, the art of trading, at least from my point of view, right? Because at some point we can all read the book. We can all very clearly understand um, the most common fundamental fundamental characteristics of the big leaders. But at the end of the day, what I think the, is the uh, most important, important part of the whole uh, methodology is those qualitative factors or or the art of of trading. And this is part of that, right? So this is, re there's really very little here, if anything, that wouldn't fall right under the how to make money in stocks umbrella. I've just kind of given it my own twist. And so that being said, um, you know, there, here's my biggest lessons learned. I think Ray said it not, not, but a couple of days ago when he says it all the time, and this couldn't, couldn't be more true. Um, we are professional loss takers. Uh, picking stocks is the fun part we get to do when the environment's right and everything's working. But at the end of the day, if you go out to any trader on the street that's made a huge success of themselves over a period of time, they'll tell you all the same thing. Don't lose money, protect your money. You know, it, it, that is what it's sur surrounded around. So that applies to everything. So watch the leaders is a little more specific to the way Bill teaches his methodology. It's a trend following or growth methodology. Um, price and volume, again, is, is very bill centric, but I would also say just in general, I, I would say it's fair to apply all of technical analysis for the most part. Everything is a derivative of price and volume. So learning how to interpret price and volume in and of itself, just purely um, everything else, Bill used to say it, everything else is a secondary or tertiary uh, indicator, right? Um, and here's another one. And um, he, he, all the time, the tiny details, he drove this home um, like crazy. Actually, Mike Webster reminded me about him saying this all the time just a few days ago. But uh, it's those tiny details, understanding where you've got some wedging action in a handle, let's say, or something else subtle that the, your average, you know, Joe that has knowledge of technical analysis might not pick out and might, you know, re and it, it's amazing how uh, those little things can, can, you know, really make the difference. So this is really the, the key lessons that stuck in my head, but more than anything, manage risk watch the leaders that those would be the tattoos across one arm and then the other if i had to pick two so now let's go a little more specifically into the model books um <clears throat> this is really where the consolidation pivot came from or the, it's basically just an early entry technique up the right side of the base um and that and we'll get into the details of that in just a moment how that um evolved from really a, uh, a shared simultaneous idea into what it is today. And then uh, we're going to talk about what I was saying before, just with um, uh, entry tactics in general, not only is it going to be um, key to this presentation, it's just going to be key to Bill's whole methodology in general and, you know, to leading stocks in general and why that, you know, for me, it's all about those leaders. Watch the leaders. As Richard knows, I think we had this conversation a few times now recently. A lot of people, for example, in terms of breadth, and I won't get too out of shape here. Um, to me, the most important thing is the breadth of what I consider the leaders of the market, which can be anywhere, let's say, from 70 to 300 names. 
Um, whereas there are some broader breadth indicators like new highs, new lows, that sort of thing. And this is just, you know, along with watch the leaders, why, you know, why it sticks in my head and what Bill used to say, I guess the reason behind that is every major bull market in history is led by at least a few groups of these, most of the time, traditional style growth stocks. These stocks move in groups. Um, and so I, I have just watching the everything outside of that doesn't, will is noise to me. Whereas if I focus on that very select group, I feel like that is where they are trading ahead of everything else. Everything else is old news compared to the clues you're taking from those stocks as they trade in real time. And I'll just leave it there. And, and you will go, go ahead, please. Yeah, I was, was going to jump in. Uh, for people who aren't aware of the model book study, uh, can you kind of touch on you know what that is uh, oh, and, and, and the project? Thank yeah. Thank you for that. So a big part of what Bill does and did is historical precedent analysis. He went back basically over every major market cycle since the beginning, beginning of time, figured out the most common characteristics of the biggest winning stocks. Um, his definition were an institutional quality name that doubled or more. So we're, you know, eliminating all of that low quality junk off the bottom that institutions can't buy and can't, you know, which is all part of the methodology. And we're not going to get into those details now. Um, so, and in doing so, while I was there, I just had, as I mentioned earlier, I just happened to be there uh, for one of the best bull markets in history. So when that market um, topped and there was work to be done, studies to be done, research to be done, I was very lucky. Um, I got to work with Mike and Charles, who were two of my best buddies while I was there. And honestly, we sat in one tiny little office together. For, I don't know how many days in a row working on that thing. Um, and that is where a lot of this came from and it's also also after studying lots of these model book, books older ones while i was there the one i made with mike and charles those guys went on to make lord knows how many more for a bill which is it's a phenomenal um exercise to do on your own even if you did 10 stocks it's it's amazing what you'll learn and what your mind will assimilate in terms of price volume action these were just some of the uh keys technical traits, I would say, that just kind of stuck in my brain. And so that picture, when I'm looking for stocks to buy, obviously I have my own, my, the Ross Haber, however, I, my perspective of what all of the, all of the, all of those model book charts look like, what appeared to be um, the ones that I would want. There's, you know, the ones that look like this. And so those are the ones that I personally look for and will also discuss that so here here we are here's the details of it all and this is really what happened we were all sitting in there i don't know we we're probably i don't know how many months we were into it i don't know who said it out loud but one of us quit it was completely it, we all wandered together i i can tell you after going through stock after stock after stock and looking and looking you it was almost hard not to go why aren't we buying these stocks earlier than we are um and this goes back to now, right? And a lot of this has to do with, well, you know, but we'll get into that, right? So here's why. There, and the, the rules have changed a bit, well, quite a bit since I was there, which the last time I was there was uh, the end of 2002, so 20 years ago. Um, and during that time, it was almost taboo to buy a stock before it, it broke out of a proper base through its base breakout on volume. And if it wasn't doing that, you didn't touch the thing. And let me tell you something, there's nothing wrong with that. That worked incredibly well, and it still works incredibly well in the right environment with the right stock into strength. Um, nevertheless, things, you know, when, when you, you eventually run into the size problem, not the one that the institutions run into at tens and hundreds of billions of dollars, but you do, get to a point with some of these stocks where it becomes a whole lot less viable to put in a, a market order as a stock's breaking out um, of a proper base. And it also makes it very hard to use. There is a way to use progressive exposure, but the way volatility works these days, sometimes it may be very hard to uh, 
to make that happen. So originally I had it stuck in my brain, you know, why we, we want to stay away from those. And that's because they don't work as well. The high, the lowest price isn't always the best price, all of this sort of stuff. And it made in plenty of sense. But then I started to think if I'm starting, if I have an idea of what these stocks look like, both fundamentally and technically ahead of time, and I'm seeing when they act like this, when it's the right stock, you know, seven or eight times out of 10, it doesn't really matter if I start buying early up the right side or if I waited for that proper base to form. So I've, I kept that in mind. And uh, I took my second read of Stan Weinstein's book, um, which which is um, stage analysis, okay? And he is phenomenal at what he does. And to Stan Weinstein, a stage one base is very different than, and where he would begin to buy a stock is completely different than where Bill O'Neill would. And it's not because someone's right and someone's wrong. It's just a different way of doing things. And so between the model books, my own observations, what I learned from Stan, I was very lucky I've had a relationship with him for a very long time. And I uh, kind of was able, that is not kind of, that is exactly how the consolidation pivot was born. And I was lucky enough to be able to, and I've said this a million times, when I make an observation or when you make an observation in the market, immediately people want to know, have you done a back test? Show me the back test. I can give you a handful of reasons why back testing only goes so far and why it's actually not necessary. At least for me, what has always worked, if I notice something, I do it small. And if I can replicate it small, I make it a little bigger. And if I can keep doing that over time, well, it works until like it doesn't. And I'm always managing risk along the way. So in the way that I learned to manage risk under the, you know, in how to make money in stocks, the can't, you know, the canceling philosophy, I, you know, actually tightened it up a little bit so that. A, we can take on a little more risk by buying these things earlier up the right side, but we also have to, you know, carefully look at Stan Weinstein's stuff. He he is bought, where Stan Weinstein is buying stuff and making tons of money doing it, might I say. Bill O'Neill would tell you it's a junk off the bottom trade, leave it alone. The lowest price isn't the best price. So moving over to the hedge fund, I found myself in that position where I could no longer just wait for a stock to break out of a base. And so that's what I did. I just started much smaller. So I use progressive exposure to get into a full position in an account. So what I was using was like layers of progressive exposure. So let's say I wanted to buy, and you have to anyway, right? Because let's say a quarter or a third of a position used to be maybe triple a whole position um, at O'Neill, and I will break the first quarter up into thirds as I buy it throughout the day. Now something could change. Um, there are times, depending on where a stock is, well, I will put on an entire 25%, but it's got to be in a special spot. It's got to be a special kind of stock. It has, you know, all, all of the things have to line up for me to be willing to put on a 25 or 30% position and sit there. Um, especially if it's early up the right side, because technically you do have more, um, overhead and that sort of thing. But I would tell you now that you're definitely taking risk off by, as long as you're managing risk, playing that game by working your way in early, you get, the benefits are huge, you know, and which is why at the end of the day, I'm always saying buying right is your number one defense because it really is. Um, chasing stocks makes a big mess in your account and that's a whole nother thing. But yeah, discipline is, is, um, has been more key than over, I'd say even over the last decade with volatility through the roof and margin not being needed in the way that it used to before. So enough blabbing on there. Let's get into exactly what is a consolidation pivot. So here we have the consolidation pivots marked by the dashed lines. The dotted lines are just would show you the top of a base of a base breakout to new highs. And it's not always in this case, it may be the high of the handle or in the in the some cases, it's the middle of the uh, double bottom. But in most cases, when you're looking at cup shape bases, cup and handles coming up the right side of a double bottom, which in, in fact gives you that much more um, confidence because you've got that shake out there. It's a whole nother thing working for you if you've got, you know, the shake out. But regardless, buying up the what we're doing as we move up here and you can see we're starting to and work on a base. 
and you can see the stock tries to go up. It doesn't quite happen, and we're still there's another low, um, a lower high, and now we're start now we're not doing lower lows, right? The the trend changes from lower lower highs, lower lows to higher highs and higher lows, and even as you break the the averages here, so it winds up. You know, maybe we thought it was making a base here, and we could have bought this. Honestly, it, it and I probably did buy that consolidation pivot and get stopped out at some point. But I wanted to stop here, start here, just because we can kind of go through a few here, and you can see the benefit. Me, even my nine times out, more than half the time, I'd say when I do get stopped out of a consolidation pivot and something like this, I wind up at least making a few dollars. And when I get way ahead like that. You better have a rule that doesn't let you let go of all that money. So, but nevertheless, you've got two points here. You've almost got like a consolidation pivot within another one because the large, whoops, the large, I'm so sorry, the larger base here, right? That's your new high base breakout. Also, the larger base for the larger, this is a consolidation pivot for the larger picture, whereas this one here is for this smaller one within the larger one. Does that make sense, Richard? So that's yep. why we have two spots here. And technically these, A, this is not a cup and handle just because of the way that it's shaped and whipped around. Technically you're probably within the spot where um, a handle could be on a base breakout. It just so happens that this isn't a proper cup and handle base. So that makes your breakout here and this, the, the, the ability to enter significantly earlier here a big deal. My goal always is to get most of my position on before a proper base breakout. And if it's something that gets there in a way that I'm happy with, I feel like it, a lot of, there are some breakouts that I stay away from depending on how they get there. And there's somewhere I'll polish one up, polish off the position, so to speak, right? Add maybe take it from 25 to 30% or 30 to 35%. And as soon as it gets extended and starts to wiggle around up off that 10 day moving average, I immediately sell the extra that I bought, if not, you know, another 5% and then wait to see what happens and hopefully be able to add that back at some point. But that allows me to lock some, some gains in and let it bounce around a little bit. And then that, you know, then I continue pyramiding the position if I can, assuming this is a stage one base, you've got a state, you've got a consolidation or mini base, if you want to call it that it's not proper because it is not at least five weeks, which you need for, at least a uh, flat base to be official. But anyway, this is still all one basing structure to mm -hmm. me. And Grant, all this is much higher than here after everything that goes along here. Again, it's that same sort of thing. You can see we've got a chance to buy it halfway up before it even, I'm guessing, right? 50% give or take just by eye before it even gets to those highs. And if you did buy the gap up, you can see what's happened here. I mean, you're, you're in the clear. Um, and so that's, you know, ideal. And if, let's say you decided you didn't want to, uh, and it, it saves you from having to buy the breakout, even if you do, you can, there's, it just gives you so many more ways to be able to um, adjust your position and manage your risk, I guess you would say, before you're getting to that official base breakout. And, and you can see in both cases, these work, you know, uh, we would say this was a, a failed breakout, and I guess technically it was, right? We shook back below, but I, I want to point this out, and, and it's a basic rule. It does not necessarily participate, um, uh, apply only to consolidation pivots, but it's very important. When Bill did those, did his big study of the biggest winning stocks, and he said, let's say 70 to 80% of the time when you buy a stock breaking out of an early stage, you know, proper base with all of the can slim fundamentals, the, the reason that it's seven to 8% isn't only because that's where the math magically works before you start to get, it is, but that isn't the only reason why. The reason why is his study showed him not just those fundamentals, but showed him that seven or eight times out of 10 those stocks should never ever fall seven to eight percent below, and it did. So that accounted for a breakout failure, maybe too. As long as you never went seven or eight percent below, you're good in his book. It takes a lot more patience these days, and it's not necessarily the most efficient and effective way to do it. But keep that in mind. Um, there were two; those were two main reasons. And so, while you might look at this and go, "Ah, it's a big failure," 
If you followed his rules, there was no, there's absolutely zero reason to have sold any shares, even if you bought the base breakout, right? Yeah, so but, wanted... yeah, and and going back to here, the the key with the consolidation pivot is that it's a style of buying where you can keep risk even tighter than that seven eight percent, and it allows you to enter at a spot where you can manage risk tightly and logically. And you can see on that first base breakout, it's already expended a lot of energy getting to that point up the right side, and it eventually does revisit. So. It's just a different way of, of positioning in a promising name uh, at an earlier spot where if you're wrong, you keep your loss a little bit tighter. And for many people, that style may work a little bit better than Bill, who is you know the champion at picking the stock, the breakout, the best in the market. So um, going back to the consolidation pivot, it's kind of definition. You're basically looking, Ross, for you know a resistance, a key resistance point where the stock pushed up pulled back up the right-hand side of the base. Is that kind of how you would define it? Absolutely. I mean, I would almost qualify them so many parts of the time as some ugly looking mini cup and handle base, right? And you're yeah. getting some sort of handle if handle-esque area or a double bottom-esque. What they are are all um, pivots to my eye that would apply to an actual proper base, except they're not a proper base. It's just one that I feel is a new big leader for whatever the reason, all of the price volume action leading up to that point, all of the stand wines, you name it, everything else aligns for me to, to, to say it's okay to start buying this one early. And it also, yeah, and like you were saying, and thank you for finishing off that point for me, I started to, um, yeah, it gives you, you can be wrong three times and get, you know, in and out, in and out, maybe, you know, maybe it costs you five or 6%, but you were able to be wrong three times before you actually got in and up. And then some, you know, the market becomes more cooperative. Maybe you waited and you bought the the fifty day pullback. And you know, there's a million ways you can do it. Um, just depends on what you're looking at, how you're looking at it, what you're prepared for that day. Yeah, so great. The, the, yeah. And so now we're going to get into a few examples. This is the first one. Um, AVGO. <clears throat> Broadcom semiconductor equipment stock. It's one that's working in today's market and. Here we're looking back, you can see um, the bottom here in the middle of October, which is more or less where the NASDAQ has put in its most recent lows. So, And then note uh, it there is key, right? That, you know, we have to assume the market's cooperative because it's not always the case, you know, in a bear market, for um, instance, that, yeah. Correct. So <clears throat> the, we're assuming that this, let's say, let's call it, right. So let we're not in... We're not assuming in this case that we're coming up trying to build the bottom and things are volatile. We're going to assume that let's call this a second stage base that developed, like we said, in a in an average healthy uptrend. You're making money in your portfolio. And so you're not having to do anything like uh, uh, that would lean towards being more cautious like you would in the current environment. So perfect. we'll just leave that there. So ABGO. You know, it's one of those names, and I like I said, it's got it's liquid, it's high priced, it's the institutional quality. Um, it's one that I know could have if it wasn't in a model book before, right? So we're looking at the, you know, the, this is what brings this stock into view. Besides that, it begins to show up on my screens along with the semiconductor stocks, right, which were leading the market. And so I, I'm watching these stocks as they come in, as they come in until they start to do this um, attempt to go higher and actually give us some consolidation pivots. So that's our background there. So here's our, here's your whole base. And this is just another example of here's our, our dead low from October. And if you had the inkling to which you wouldn't have um, here because of the current situation, but if this was a, a stage two base, you're making some money, the group's moving along, um, ABGO is a leader, and this is one of, let's say, ABGO, NVIDIA, and the other big leader, it, Rambus, I'm just going to make it up, are all looking similar and pushing off the bottom, um, big volumes coming in, that's going to give me, you know, we've had the also the general market give us its clues that a bottom is in, so on and so forth. So that's what's going to let us at least begin here. Now, this is super early. Okay, this can fail. Well, why do I say that? Because I'm looking at just this longer term uptrend line, which is going to be the real 
the real point of demarcation, but you've got some space in there. So I'm willing to, to give it a shot to see how it acts, right? With a really tight sell stop, I say at its 10 day moving average, but what happens and you'll see, we're gonna, I'm gonna get into this when we get into entry um, tactics and technique. Once I get to this point, I'm immediately moving over to my intraday charts and I'm watching there how things shape up and making decisions that that sort of thing. Um, so let's say I did that and we're moving up, we're moving up. And you can see look, no, no, it is not a coincidence that this is where we begin to struggle, right? We struggle and fail this pink bar, struggle and fail this pink bar. We, we actually start to push through and then this is what actually a creates our next consolidation pivot just underneath that 65 day exponential. So even here, if I saw that happen and I didn't start selling it s somewhere in this bar, I'm not waiting for a second day under the 23 day. If I bought it with the gap in the way and it's hanging down here and it's really starting to crack, you know, let's say you drew a really short term um, uptrend line. I'm getting out of the way. I don't, there's no way I'm losing money on that trade. It's just a rule. So if this happens, I'm out of the way. Um, some people might, you know, worst case scenario, let's say you do wait for the second day because that's your thing you want to see. If it can bobble around, that's fine because you're making money on other stocks and you want to give it a chance. You can sell it here and you're still, even if you sold it at the dead low of the day, not the end of the world. But the idea is to not let a uh, gain turn into a loss, especially after you're looking at um, it's struggling one, two, three, four days, and then it reverses and closes back below two key moving averages and that line again, that's just an automatic get out of the way. Um, so, and you can see that is your first early spot, not the best early spot, right? So your lowest price isn't always the best price. It did, you know, the market got the best of you here. Market was super whippy and volatile. It was not easy to make progress not even in the in the leading stocks. So you can see here now after, frustratingly for those that you get shaken out here, it's almost like a, it's the little own island candle, right? So we've got a gap down, we gap right back up out of there, reclaim the 23, once again, fail to make it through that longer term uptrend line. So as that's happening, I'm looking where is our next potential consolidation pivot? And that is going to be right there, right? So I have that line drawn already as these days are forming and I am watching for what's going on here. And to be quite honest with you, I am looking right here. I'm trying to, did I miss drawing in? And I hate to be doing this right now, Richard, in the middle of a um, the volume looks like here we may have been able to sneak in a share or two. Um, above that consolidation pivot and the 65 day, if I'm not mistaken, it's this volume right here. And while you don't, you do not have a five day consolidate or a five day pocket pivot for me at this point, oftentimes. And again, this is an observation that I made. I've never back tested it, but this is just something that I do works for me. If the volume is bigger than the prior day, I'm probably going to at least add small mm -hmm. if I get something, a sig but that's significant price action, right? We're getting, it's not a perfect hammer candle, but you're closing in the top, you know, third back above that point where you failed last time at 65. And so sure enough, um, it doesn't work and you, you test that 50 day one more time. And if you're, you're lucky, right? You only close slightly below volume declines. And at this point, you've got a ton of support there, the 10 day. And this is where my original rule will now, you know, come into play, right? We've had the volume push it through. I would, again, if I <clears throat> bought this, I'm still going to be holding it with the sell stop at the 50 day or using that 50 day as um, that would have been the original. And I, anyway, at the close, that is not a sale to me. It's only barely below. You got the 10 day right below and price support. So to me, that would be different than um, the one that, uh, you know, something here that reverses and fails. And that's upon and a pickup in volume. That, yeah. Right. So that's the reversal fail, close at the low, pick up on volume. Whereas this one, yeah, it's not great, but it backs off. It It's still fine to me. Not ideal, but worth leaving alone. And you can see it never goes back below. Right. I, I work. 
for the most part, I do what Ray does. I'll ne the second, and oftentimes, in, um, I won't even give it a close below. I'll just get out as soon as it breaks the low of that that first close, and then I'll figure out how to get back in after there, depending, right? It just depends on the average. But if I'm this close to, um, you know, just trying to build a position, I'm going to be I'm going to be more careful. And Regardless, I yeah. not. Yeah. yeah, I was going to ask. Uh, I think uh, something people might be wondering is how many days have to uh, pass after uh, that high that forms, that forms the pivot of the consolidation pivot. How many days have to occur for you to kind of identify that level at, as a key potential so resistance point exactly, and buy point? It's a great question, you know, because I, I look in my head. I'm going to say this. I mean, you don't. It's not going to be an immediate, you know, this uh, recovery of one bar. Two would more or less do it because I'm not. I'll be honest with you. I don't have a rule for it. But let's say we exploded back above on this first day up and clip. I don't care. I I would. If the volume was there, I'd be forced to buy it back on that bar or at least start some, assuming I could manage risk, right? Yeah, because you're still and, super I mean, early because you're still below the base. You could build that position at, right. at future spots up the right hand side. So, yeah, perfect. And, and keep in mind, like this may look like this chart is really blown up. I want to make this point like 478 to 470 is $8, but $8 on a $500 stock and is not that big of a deal. So these ranges probably look a little bigger um, than in your brain they they do. They certainly do to me, but keep that in mind. Um, but that is the idea. And again, um, oh yeah, so I don't have it on this chart, right? We were only at point A, here's our first buy. Here's why we don't have it there, because I started talking about um, B, both out getting there. So this is what we're talking about here, right? So here's our second consolidation sell stop at the 50 day. And like I said, it, it closes just slightly below volume declines. I'm giving it that normal rule of I got to see a second day below. And so that keeps you in there. Mm -hmm. Here's our third consolidation pivot. And look, mind you also, we're operating under the 50 day. We're operating under the 200 day. In a million years, I'd never, you, you wouldn't be buying, even be thinking of buying these stocks if you were 26 and you just learned, you know, the original rules, which is you stay away from all this stuff right? Because there's too much overhead and um, it's not going to work as well. That can be the case with many stocks, but not always the case, especially with a lot of um, true model, you know, those true model leaders or true market leaders. Yeah. Um, and one thing I'm noticing before you go on uh, is looking up at the deep view relative strength line, you can see how it's at an uptrend right before this consolidation pivot at point C that we're talking about. So, you know, we're starting a relative strength phase there a little bit. So that, that's something key that that's a characteristic that even though we're lower in the base, even though, um, you know, it's a little bit early, we're starting to see this, this stock perk up and uh, potentially push higher. And not to mention, you've almost got a perfectly smooth transition in base stages. Yep. Yep. <laughs> if you look at that there, you know, you're going, these are the Stan Weinstein beige state state the stage color. So everything lines up there. And so anyway, sorry about the chart confusion there. So, and if you look here, you start looking here, it, it's amazing what the tricks your eyes, your, the, the, the tricks your eyes will play on you. You start look, it almost starts feeling like you're too extended here. Meanwhile, you're like barely off the, this is still junk. This might get Bill's attention here, right? This, it, it's, this is putting it on his watch list, but I can assure you he will be very careful about buying that stock below its 200 day. Um, so that to me is a is a big deal. At the end of the day, it's not a big deal. I'll tell you exactly what, what Bill would say, right? Um, I used to complain about 50 cents on my fills. Like I was just saying before, he doesn't care if he buys it, let's just reduce it by 10 at 47 or $48 or $51. It's, if it's supposed to go to 300, it does, who cares, right? So, and that also is where it's, it's very easy to lose sight. So. Anyway, this is still super early and you can see what happens here. You can buy that gap up um, and it just never looks back. Um, and so, that, that's a key okay. question uh, that people might have as well. If there's a gap up through a consol called consolidation pivot, and we'll probably get this into trading ex execution part, but how would you mm -hmm. go about purchasing that? Uh, well, yeah. If it gaps up and through, 
I'm, I'm going to leave it alone. The fact that it actually gave you a chance to to use that pivot as a guide is is kind of a big deal to me, right? Yeah. Um, is there however, a, is there a threshold a within? It's within I would bit. say this, right? Yeah. So my, I typically don't like to continue to buy, Bill would tell you 5%. Um, it depends how much you're willing to, 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 to give above there, right? I want to give it a, call it a percent, at least a percent to wiggle below mm -hmm. my consolidation pivot. So giving it a percent to wiggle below, how much are you willing to do doing that? Or you can make it a, a line in the sand and say, is it, is it two and a half percent? Is it 3%? Are you, you know, that sort of thing. And I, just so you know, let's call this, if the, the, if this was a high volume entry, I would handle it differently. Then I'd be worried it's just going to take off like this because I've studied raised high volume entries and very few of them undercut, right? So I'm going to try and figure out a way how to buy that then, um, uh, you know, even though it gapped above, but I'm going to tell you nine times out of 10, my style, unless I have a super, um, good reason to be buying the gap up and i feel like i can manage the risk you know even if it's the gap up and the lower the gap the next day assuming that's reasonable just depends yep. um so it depends on the stock depends on the situation but more often than not i want to be able to i want to cross of the line right i don't i don't want to deal with the gap yep, if i don't perfect. have right? um, so and here right and like you were asking before right one two three I mean, I'm, if I had to, like I said, I'd buy it as good as two days. I guess more is better. You get a little mini cup. Could have added a few, depending on your style. It could have been very easy to also stay in here, right? You're adding a tad three, if I call it 533, you shake to, to, you know, call it from 53 to $51. Depends what you did back here. Again, depending on your style and how you manage risk, you, you could have bought a few here and maybe you were stopped out. Maybe you weren't, right? Then the stock finally goes on to, and I, while this is not a proper cup and handle here, if you wanted to call this a full base, you, you might even go so far as to say this is much closer to a proper base breakout right. than consolidation pivot. This is still, you know, very close to this point. Um, still earlier than the all time high and you can use it as such as you can see and it wiggles around and you can what you're noticing now is abgo has a clear respect for its 21 and 23 day moving average or 21 day simple 23 day exponential and then that can be part of what i play into going forward right and then you get your final base breakout and um you're off to the races and then you know you employ pyramid and whatever your tech your your techniques are from there for managing the position right? so so the key benefit of the consolidation pivot is even if you don't buy that first point a that we that we bought went over if you buy that second or third one you've also you've already got a healthy profit before it's experiencing that volatility at the standard base breakout and you can use the moving averages as your guide at that point because they're they're above your cost. You can just it's it's stress free. I know you're always a big proponent of a stress free trade where uh, it's right. easy to stay in. So it, it gives you that you that peace of mind. Yeah, divide it between, and a lot. I'm sorry to cut you off. So so sorry. I'm just looking at it saying you can divide it between the ten and twenty three. How do you know that? Well, you can just look. It shows you that you can do that. Yeah. And so I assume that it can, it will continue to do that until it stops. And in the case of model books, you'll see that is one of the key characteristics that I'm looking for in a big high price liquid stock trades in an organized manner. Um, more often than not, will manage, well, I'm sorry, um, respect key levels of support. And what, so if it shows that it's developing those levels, then I'll follow them, right? Yeah, perfect. So... Exa next example here, we're going to take a look at Apple. And for the purposes of this example, um, now we're talking about the current environment or, you know, where this isn't from that period. You can see here, this is March of 2020, but the environment, we're going to assume that we're in here. And actually, this was the beginning of that. So really, it is. This was the point where we were talking about where we put in the bottom into that 2020 run, right? So keeping that in mind. You know, the reason I say that is where with the ABGO, we're in a more cooperative market. It might be cleaning up mistakes. It's, here, we're going to tend to be a little more careful. That's all. So that's 
And again, consolidation pivot, I, I, I love that because it's giving you all of these chances to get in as the stock develops. And mind you, if this does happen to be one of those canceling perfect breakouts, you should be able to buy it here. And it might, even if it retests, no matter what, um, seven or eight times out of 10, and it does work, it's never getting back to, it's almost to the point where anything you bought that was 8% below, if you still got it, you're, it's almost like free money up here, but if that makes sense. So that's, uh, I became quickly addicted to buying my stock as low as possible with risk managed as tight as possible. And we'll get into, you know, technique tight and logical, a tight stop, you know, on a stock sticking up above its 10 day is worthless, right? So here we're looking at Apple, super liquid, high quality stock. Um, and here's one thing I, I wanna point out, right? Look, it was nice and tight. And, uh, you know, as it's, it's respecting its moving averages, look how wild and whippy it becomes. We're starting to put in a button. And then you can notice, I mean, relative to here, even relative to changes, yeah. see it gets clear yeah. change in character. And uh, it, I, I personally think it's even a little easier to see on a chart that has been so blown up and spread out. But uh, let's go ahead and move on to point A. You can see super early on market, I'm going to assume is following through right around here, maybe a little bit earlier, maybe a little bit after, I don't remember, it doesn't really matter. Um, but you can see here, and I just wanted to show you one, um, you can easily just get, get your, the gap down risk never leaves you. However, that, and sometimes it depends again, depending because of where we just discussed this market is, if I see this breakout and failure and we're just, ah, I'm probably gonna stick, not stick with it, although there, if it was a smoother trend, a stronger stock, this happened higher up many, I'm going to say eight, nine, 10 times out of 10, I leave those alone for an open. And a lot of times those can just be fake outs. I would just say that. So it's not a necessary. So again, depending on your brain, how you handle things, it could be either way and you might get stopped out in this. If you did hold it, you're going to get kicked right out of here below it's 10 day or, you know, that anyway. So I just wanted to point that out. But fortunately, it doesn't change anything, right? This consolidation pivot is still there. At this point, it now um, coincides with its 23-day exponential. Sure enough, you get a, a gap and push and close through. But anyway, that's going to be point B that we're looking at next. I'm sorry. So we're clear here what's going on. So the next point we can possibly um, buy some Apple is a reclaim of that consolidation pivot, as well as its 23 day um, moving average. So that's where you buy it, simple. Where your stops 23 days, basically break even, um, just like that. And you can see that works out quite well. You could actually add to it the following day if you so choose. However, not the hottest close, right? Volume picks up, but you are, cl you are clearly holding the pivot and it's 23 day, a little bit better than it did um, then off its low and we can see so you're automatically kept in to this trade here you're clearly making your money back if you did get stopped out on the first one and once again this is still to me you can see we are still so low off the base it's very easy to go oh i saw the stock down here at 52 and now it's at 68 forget all that that'll that'll keep you away from investing in in the best stocks out there trust me i don't care if it went to 68 it can go to 680 in the right market or whatever it is i'm not saying apple's going up another 10 times from here but that's the mentality you've got to get out from this is super super early especially if this is an early stage base it, it, it's still early up here mm -hmm. so again spot c problem here is we don't have um enough volume to accompany it, it didn't increase from the prior day. It's not a um, a pocket pivot or anything like that. So in general, believe it or not, just that, and if I'm not mistaken, it is this third mm -hmm. bar here, this mm -hmm. little one here, that's just gonna keep me away. It, if it was just bigger, but still below average and still not a five day pocket pivot, I buy it. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. If it's a pocket pivot, all five day pocket or 10 day pocket pivot, normal pop, bonus. But as long as it's bigger than the day before through a consolidation pivot, that's my rule. I'm buying it. Um, doesn't have to be above average. Doesn't have to be a five day. Just has to be bigger. So based on that rule, I'm not touching it here. Um, 
it gaps up. Now I'm now I'm upset, <laughs> right? Um, what did I do? And sure enough, a few you know. So now you gotta wait. Um, so here's where it gets real tough. Are you gonna? I don't know if it pushed through here, but you, you know, and that's where you gotta be careful in these areas. You've gapped up and. You know, we've got some resistance here. You're starting it, right? We're way above that 10-day moving average now. So that's why, you know, I wouldn't really make, yes, it's the second day. I don't even know that it went through there. But I don't think I, it did, yeah. I, I, I'm not sure that it did, but that is that is one I'd be very careful with. If I was going to do it, I'd add small, and you can bet your bottom dollar I'm not going to. That's going to be one close below the 50-day just because it's of where it stands. But anyway, we shake out constructively right below the 50, the 65, like lo and behold, we get support and close just a hair below that 23 day. Um, but a few days later, we reclaim that um, the next consolidation pivot, right? Um, just barely, but volume picks up. We got the five day pocket pivot and sure it doesn't make it easy here, um, but it doesn't necessarily kick you out of the stock. You can see as we move on here, um, it never breaks the 10 day. Yeah. Oops. Yep. Did I lose it? Where are we? Yep. We're back. Okay. So, and then, yep. Never <clears throat> from that point, we've got a little pop above here. Me, I'm probably going to buy that whether I hang on to it or not. I know me, I'm probably going to give it at least a 10 day on the closing basis up here, just because it's nice and tight at this point. It's hardly down there. I'm, I won't be taking much risk and, I'm just going to let it have that. That's an easy, leave it alone for me. And then here, again, I like the way this stock is breaking out. It wasn't too fast up the right side. It was nice and organized. So there's a, and Richard, you know, there's a lot of breakouts that I just won't touch, even if they're super powerful and they cross the right point, either they just got there too fast or whatever it is. But this is one where I'd say you'd be silly not to at least put on, you know, polish off your position on the base breakout there. But you can see, um oh so that's the next example gonna, yep yeah i was just gonna say you can see it's, you have so many chances to get in before this base breakout and let me tell you something if you're extra patient and careful you're, you're not going to have as many opportunities buying base breakout still works it's just a it's a big it's much more of a patience game that's all um so let's go on to our next example which is aehr this one we're looking at just more in terms of how you might look at a consolidation pivot um, on a buy or on buying it on weakness as opposed to um, on strength. So right here is the first place we could have. Um, well, I guess let's start here. You've got... <clears throat> We're starting the right side, building the right side of the base here, right? So this is, I guarantee you, I've got that shorter term declining tops line across this stock. So in and around here, the stock's setting off my alerts. Um, and I probably got my first um, consolidation pivot in here or in here, wherever it is. Um, now, mind you, this is like, it, this is, I, you see how I have the cup and handle drawn? That is not a proper cup and handle. It's cup and handle-ish. It's too low. Um, the bottom's not quite right. What have you. Um, you get basically the cup and handle-ish breakout, but volumes, everything's great except the volume's not big enough to break out there. And actually... It's, it is. It's below. It's below I, average, I, but it's a five-day pocket. Oh, I lied. Yeah. No, it is. It is. It's yeah. just barely passable. Because you can see there, it is bigger. That's where I follow that rule. And look, tests your patience. But you buy. I'm buying that sell stock, and I didn't put it in there. It's going to be at the ten day. Did I mention over here? Yeah. So um, for, first step at point A. Can you talk about the constructive action there at point A, where it's pulling back into the the fifty day? Yeah, and then nice close. Absolutely. Yeah. So this is almost like if this were a cup and handle. I'm sorry, thank you. <laughs> I kind of skipped right over that. This pullback here, your your um, ideal handle in a cup and handle is uh, for the stock to drift in. Let's say two or three days. Volume should be lighter, preferably declining, and it never hurts to get this constructive little shakeout and hammer. You know, to form the bottom of your handle there. So as this 
you know, not to mention, look at that shakeout below the 50, below the 65 exponential, below the 23, the, the you know, the uptrend line, and then you hammer close back above. And that, and you even have that con other consolidation pivot potential drawn from the left side there. You've got a lot of confluence of potential absolutely. support. So there's a lot I of things lining up there. Yeah. That's a th right. So honestly, in a stronger market, because remember, this is not, this is, uh, we're trying to put in a bottom here. In a strong market, I'm buying that hammer candle at the close. Um, in this market, I'm going to give it a little, you know, a, a little bit more of a, not now, but prior to the, the character change we saw last week, let's, you know, we're, we're going to be a little more careful. We're going to wait to this point. And like I, it says here, volume's just barely passable. And luckily, you hold in, never go below that. Um, long-term trend line or what we call the de declining tops line. It holds the 10-day, that line, and goes on to break out. Actually gives, um, let's continue on, that constructive pullback and retest comes on declining volume. And you'll see that um, that gives you, like I mentioned, remember I was talking before, now this isn't really a break, but you try to reclaim. This is kind of that in the wick situation where I'll leave something alone. This is further up the right side. Like we just discussed, there's a whole lot going on here that we didn't have in the prior example where I think we, um, I pointed out it was much closer. It was much, it was a much different situation where um, we saw a little area where I, I'm going to go back. Should I go back to it, Richard? No, let's move on. Yeah, let's All right, keep going. But anyway, so, I'm sorry. so anyway, that's, this is a little bit more of an advanced sort of thing but playing keeping this consolidation pivot in mind you can still buy it above there right because you got a little in the wick play and if you really wanted to push things because you're still super early here this is your next consolidation pivot which i guess i could have made another slide for i would buy not if i missed it here i would buy through this high with a sell stop and you could break it up either between either at the 10 day or if you wanted a little more room 10 day or the prior consolidation pivot yeah i love for no, all good. I love the volume on this one and also the, the group, the theme, obviously it was hot. So we, we're not really covering stock selection, but we always want to be focusing on the, the most promising stocks and the most promising groups. So I think that's right. worth mentioning. So AEHR, semiconductor equipment. So it's, you know, AVGO, it's not, and uh, it's not a big, big cap like an AVGO or an Apple, with, but however, You'll notice that you know these are also all the sorts of stocks that are leading the market right now. So yeah, perfect. Yeah, yeah. I, you're right. The volume, the volume came in there. You almost you can't ignore buying it there. That's an almost you have to be willing to lose that money. And honest, that's what I'm doing as I'm going through. I'm looking at the next consolidation pivot. I'm seeing where I am. If I do, I still really is this still a leading stock? Am I willing to make it bigger? How much more do I have to add? Am I willing, you know, how much money am I willing to lose to make it bigger here? Da 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 da. And I'm just doing. I try to do that with as few stocks as possible. The more you have to manage, the harder it is to really stay on top of them. And that's also a big thing that Bill used to hammer home. Like I'll tell you, three, four, five, six, like four to six stocks is enough. So yeah. Um, Perfect. Yeah, I think this provides a really good, you know, overview of how you interpret the action of the right hand side. And, and now let's go ahead and dive into the specifics. What are you actually looking at, you know, in the moment, as a stock is approaching this consolidation pivot, because uh, something to keep in mind is probably a question some people are asking are, you know, do you buy at the close? Do you buy as it pushing through? Um, so let's, let's dive into trading execution and, you know, what you're looking at. Are you looking at volume? All, all, the, all those questions that a lot of beginning traders have. How do you personal handle, personally handle it? And uh, let's dive in with this example um, of FTNT. Okay, perfect, perfect. And uh, you can see, I actually wanted to start off here with um, stock that's working in today's market, something like we were just talking about. This is one of those breakouts I just wouldn't buy. You've got that wedging and wedging pattern typically, is, as I said, ideally has declining volume. It gives you that wedge, so to speak. Yeah. You know? Um, most of the time that will be, and again, that's the details, right? That's those, the tiny details. You want to be aware of that. Um, it, it is breaking out the volumes there, but that failure on top of the wedge is going to get me out of the way proactively. I've seen it too many times to, to sit there. So I'm going to take my teeny tiny little profit and figure out how to get back in it. If I did, you know, buy it here, that's got me out. 
regardless, mm -hmm. that, that's the kind of stuff you want to stay away from. Um, and what happens after a wedging breakout fails? Well, a nice shakeout typically is needed to clean up that base. If I'm not mistaken, I think so. There are times when wedging bases do break out. And so if you, you've got to, you know, you can manage that risk. It, it's very important. However, um, I lost my, I, I went back and I lost my reason for why. I, I think it was, a, you know, touching on, you know, why that wedging action is, it catches your eye and why that might lead to a shakeout, even at, after it pushes through the, the, the pivot, why it might pull back and, and what you're looking for there, I think. Right, right. Um, so in any event, that is exactly, this, this is not any sort of ideal shakeout. This is a violent shakeout from the reversal from this high to the low of this, what I keep calling a hammer, a hammer candle, right? Kind of supposed to look like the hammer. It's a little bit low. Um, uh, however, the, the action here is that we sold the, all, we were all the way down here below the 23 and 50, just hanging out above the 65, which doesn't appear to be a favorite for the stock looking to the left. So um, anyway, we got support above and managed to close back above all three of those moving averages and back above that 23 day exponential, which it does have a bit of uh, an affinity for and continues to, to, de to develop more um, as we go along. Regardless, it's just Good to see that although we do have this big violent shakeout, this is an incredibly um, construct healthy and constructive bar here. So that to me cleans up this whole mess. It undercuts that wedge. It undercuts so much that it you know this is if that didn't shake out weak hands, nothing did. And so we reclaim the twenty three. We tighten up. We continue to hold it. And so when that volume comes, because mind you. This is super volatile action. It's still one of the um, better software stocks out there. And you can see this is just recently um, along with CRWD and PANW. So um, I think we both bought it on that day. I, I've kicked it out. I think it, it didn't. Obviously, we had a little bit of a shakeout to end out this week. Um, yeah. Yep. And then, yes, yeah, we bought all. Uh, we're going to get to the best part is I bought it on this day and I added to it here. Mm hmm. Um, I was very, so anyway, I wound up getting very lucky. All the, the stocks that I wound up buying, I sold uh, a lot based on feel. Um, and I, I took money out of the market instead of letting it go. And a lot of it is this. A, I had the feel. When I get that feel again, and we're not in the middle of making a bottom, and I have a bigger cushion, only up a little bit for the year. So I need more cushion to kind of leave things alone. So while I'm trying to build cushion, I'll, I will take, and also, as we discussed, I will get into it. I was out for most of the week prior and I was kind of pushing things coming back in um, after I should have. So now let's take a look at what this might look like step by step using the initial setup and trend line we've got drawn here. Um, so once we see this constructive and super constructive shakeout and hammer candle happen, we continue to see constructive action here all above its 23 day exponential, the 21 day simple is coming up through. We've got this repeat volume that you're starting to see show up on the upside volume after the high volume edge here. And so this is letting, and you can see how powerfully this went through. So if I see big volume take it through a second time, to me, that is a high probability, low risk scenario that I wanna be a part of, right? And so let's discuss what this might look like um, so I am, in general, I try and leave the first 30 minutes of the day alone. However, and when I see enormous volume, and this is going to be one of those days I can tell it's significantly above average on these days, the majority of the time, you know, immediately that it's doing huge volume and it's going to, it's not one of the, the average huge volume that dies down as the market goes into the day. Right. So when I see that, I don't care if it's the first three minutes or the first 30 minutes. What happens is <clears throat> I will get an early alert on here. This is the final alert. I will draw early alerts on my charting system in deep view. And then I might even continue to what I then do is after my alert is drawn in deep view, I draw an alert, an early alert that lets me know because I want to know when this stock is moving 
so I can keep an eye on the volume, right? So early alert lets me know we're getting some upside movement. What's volume? If I look at it and go, holy cow, for where I didn't see it pre-open and I notice it's trading significantly more volume than it normally does on the open, I'm going to my intraday charts. So we turn on the intraday chart, we're going to see it right you know, this is about that point my alert's going off early. This is the, the trigger I'm looking for, my actual actionable trigger. Here is prior to that trigger. Now you may ask, Ross, and I get this all the time, how do you know that your stock is doing a ton of volume? Well, fortunately, if you, you know, there's many systems now that will show you relative volume so you can get an idea of how much heavier that volume is for that time of day. But you'll t I'll tell you, most of the time, you can just look. This is the session you can, and I, I can promise you every, the sessions that you look back, you can just see how much more volume there is here. It would almost appear that the scaling is broken if that wasn't the case, right? So, you know, immediately at this point, you're doing a whole lot more volume by 11 o'clock than you've done here, here, and I promise you here and all the other days where, so it's not difficult to tell. So that alert goes off. And my brain goes, hello, let's, you know, and so now I immediately start drawing trend lines, marking off consolidation pivots, major trend lines, you know, uh, from larger time frame to smaller time frame. And so you can see this, I'm applying the consolidation pivot here, you know, on an intraday within, right? So amazingly, we're looking in this tiny, right, little space right here. I'm trying to find a, con you know, the consolidation pivot on just, Oops, just that day, just in that little space right there, we can, so that plays, you know, into your, uh, not just your daily and weekly trades, but it can be used for managing risk here too. And based on that, you know, you got the perfect example. Um, this is still a little bit early, although depending on your style, you could have gotten away with buying some stock here, but I like it because you've got the reclaim of, your longer term trend line, as well as a consolidation pivot here. So in my eyes, the odds of success of buying here rather than here are much greater and well worth the 30, 40 or 50 cents it's gonna cost me, right? I'm also gonna be able to manage risk that much tighter because if I buy it through this consolidation pivot, I can now manage it off that long-term um, downtrend line, which makes life very easy because it's tight and extremely logical. Um, so mind you, this is intraday now, depending on what part of your position you're buying here, it doesn't really matter. Let's say you're buying a third of a position here. You were going to buy 3000, we're buying a thousand shares of it, you know, in this area, or let's buy half of it, 1500, right? Um, maybe we're buying half of it here, 750 shares. And again, I'm just watching it on that intraday chart and you can see we're coming up to the highs from pride there, um, that we have good. marked back a few days ago, which is that same basic level that we're watching from all the way back here, right? We try if the big breakout didn't work, you tried poking above a couple of days here, here, you know. So this is, I mean, if you want to call it one, two, three, four, there's almost the fifth or what fifth or sixth try. We're finally breaking out there. And so it's perfect. We've got by the time we get to that base breakout, at least I'm sorry, if we had waited. You know, since we are being forced to wait until this point, that's as early as you can really squeeze yourself in there. Um, with experience, depending on the stock, depending on where the market is, again, um, it may not be piecing into a third of a position sometimes because it's already, I wasn't able to get in earlier because it did, you know, all of this stuff that messed up my beautiful base or what could have been a more beautiful base. I'm forced to wait for here. That's as, you know, early as we're getting in with what um, we have to work with on this stock at that point. So maybe I do decide to put on a full 20% position here just because of that. And so maybe I put on 10% here, 10% there. And at least, um, you believe it or not, that adds a, that little bit of extra cushion when you're initiating a position adds a, does a lot for your brain, probably more so than it, you know? So anyway, that's, um, how I'm doing it every time. I have alerts on my stocks and it doesn't matter whether they're coming in on weakness or going out on strength. Um, 
as long once that alert goes and I have early alerts on everything and I'm looking and I go, OK, this is in focus. It's going on. <clears throat> I keep a bunch of intraday charts up, but it's going on that main screen that right in front of my face so I can watch exactly what's going on. And sometimes I can get sometimes it does that and it immediately turns around and fails. And I go, Woof, good thing I left that alone. And, you know, more often times than not in a good market, if you're looking at the right stock and the right group and that sort of thing. Um, it has made my trading infinitely uh, easier and better. And like Richard said earlier, I'm looking for that hassle-free trade. I, I, The closer you are to picking up nickels in front of a steamroller, um, the more I don't want to be sitting in front of the market, right? And that is something. And I will tell you, there was a point, I don't know for how many years it went on, I never missed a tick of the market. And at some point, I got a little bit older and decided, you got to figure out how to live your life a little a little bit and understanding environment um, and being able to use this makes takes stress off your life to to say the least not only does it you know make it easier um, managing risk financially but it does wonders for the brain at least for me were you going to say something richard yeah so i think people might be wondering on those first initial buys where was your stop loss how, how are you managing risk on on those right. buys in general, I'm maintaining that um, my sell stops from the daily chart, which were the 10 and 23 day moving average. Um, I just happen to remember and we can take a look. You can see the 10 day was at 68.41, the 23, 67.78. You're buying above both of those in here as well. So I will keep so and I this I think was what I was discussing with you before. If it's one of those times where I'm trying to put on a big put, um a big position all at once. Um, I will make those, I will be much tighter and more granular with my stop losses, right? I will make my stop loss this lower, this declining tops trend line, which probably wouldn't mean much on a daily, certainly nothing on a weekly. But if I wanted to really be super careful and I said the 10 day is still just too far because I'm scared or whatever the reason is, um, I would, the super tight would be here, then maybe. Um, uh, one of these pivots. intraday consolidation pivots, you know, something that makes sense from here. Um, I, as I'm looking back, I easily, we easily could have and should have drawn another line across here. This would be another key spot. And so from this, again, you can still use the 10 and the 23, but if you wanted to keep it super granular because you're trying to put on massive size and you can't afford to be wrong in a big way, um, that's how I do it. Either, you know, the consolidation pivot that I missed drawing over here, um, or it could even be the low of a prior day, something significant. And in this case, maybe it would be if you, you know, if it took out the low of that prior day, I probably want to be out of most of it if it was huge and risk buying it back again, since it is, you know, anything that isn't, it's liquid enough, right? So I'm not, not anything that's manageable. Right. So and it, and it allows me to waffle back and forth really in the, and be really granular. If I can, though, I, I don't like to get too, too crazy. I'll just try if I can employ the original daily sell stops to me trying to get in on the intraday chart, I will. Yeah. And I've, I've watched you kind of, you know, you, you try it once it pulls back, you're, you kick it out and then you're never afraid to buy it back if it sets up again intraday. And I think that's an important point. You're keeping your losses super tight and logical, even on the intraday time frame. So even if you, you're putting on, you know, a large position at a, at a point, you're keeping your losses very small and it just has to work once on that day, that specific day for, to, to pay for all those and to, to establish that position. Right. 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 And sometimes, you know, let's say I've got uh 20 or whatever, 15% on here and I'm trying to get on 10 or I got 20 here and I've got another 10 or 15 to get on. Um, I'm managing my stops on that different than I am here, right? right? I'm trying just to keep, you know, um, but if I get in and up then, right, all of that changes. That's when you start raising your trailing stops and all of that. So this is it at its most granular level. And if you didn't, you know, intraday charts are just about anywhere. I don't, I don't think there's a trading platform out there today that doesn't have them, right? So as you're entering your trades, you typically have some intraday charts right there and 9.5 times out of 10, you can enter your trades right on those charts. I don't do it that way. I don't know how I do it old man style like I learned in 1990s. So Yeah, perfect. And now I think let's go to the next slide because I think then you show kind of a different situation, a pullback type buy. 
Uh, so if you could talk to, you know, what's, what's the same, what's different, how you approach that, I think that'd be helpful for everybody. Uh, and I think, uh, today, uh, we both kicked it out, uh, because it fully broke down. Uh, but you know, it's a good example of, of two different types of buys and also managing risk in the same example. Absolutely. It's one of those ones. And I think in this case, I bought it. I wish I had bought more. And so I was looking to add to it when it came back in. So it sets that alert on my, you know, I set these alerts on my daily, my intraday. I'm watching as it comes in, right? I have my early alert before it gets to the one that I want to see. I see volume is clear. You know, you can just look, does it match one of the lighter days or yet? It's clearly lighter than it was yesterday. That's ideal. If I'm not missing, was it an inside day, Richard? Uh, we don't have it up there. I think it yeah. might have been or close to one. Um, but nevertheless, that's so now I'm on the intraday and I'm going to get I never keep a line in the sand at that on that. But as a reference, you see how I made this prior consolidation pivot red. That's kind of where my danger zone if I'm trying to buy in and around this line. So I may start buying it as it goes. As it touches it, maybe a little as. You know, it just depends. A lot of times I wrote here, I will wait for a stock to to go through. Now, mind you, it's very tricky here because I don't want my position from over here to go negative. So <clears throat> I will start to add, you know, assuming I'm within all of my rules as what I like to do is I watch it shake below reclaim. And not only do you get the reclaim of that pivot, you'll see it's a very favorite thing of mine to see it. I get the reclaim of both that um, trend line. Again, that is not a major trend line. We're looking at part of a day on a five minute chart here. Just be, be wary that these lines on a five minute chart relative to a daily or weekly are quite different, but I still use them for, you know, I need as a guide. And so this would be my first attempt at adding volume is still light. the daily, you know, I'm constantly looking back at that daily chart still looks, um, fantastic. I know it is, but anyway, so we continue to move around that pivot point. We never come to the prior consolidation pivot. Um, and so, you, you know, you, as you watch throughout the day, it's, just, and again, I'll watch it stop and see that reclaim. I'm a big fan of watching that reclaim. Um, and this time it works a little bit better because when it comes back to, test that pivot a third time, it just shakes below a little bit and you've got that um, constructive looking, you know, closes back up in the upper end of the range, so on and so forth. We continue to, to tighten in. We've almost got, it's not in a fit, right? A, almost a VCP pattern going on here within the day. And then we don't have it here. Look, but long story short, this is how I'm doing it. And as long as volume is light and I'm looking at the daily chart, and it's still constructive relative to the prior day. That gives me an opportunity, let's say, because I'm doing it piece by piece. Let's say I wanted a 20% position and all I got on here was 7.5% or 8% because I'm just getting going. I'm going to use this as, and it doesn't mean I'm going to get it all the way to 20% here. Maybe I get it to 12 or 15% of that 20. What eventually happens is, as Richard said, we got kicked out of the stock and I probably wound up losing a little bit of money by the time it was all said and done, right? Um, and I think that, I mean, that is really it. And so whether you're buying um, a pullback to the top of a prior base, a key moving average, a consolidation pivot, it doesn't really matter. It's really just that price volume action one day versus another. And then all of those things are just guides for managing risk. More so there's nothing magic about them except that, you know, the, and again, personality of the stock really matters, which is why I'm always looking to see um, which averages it begins to respect. What did it look like on the left? Is it tighter? Is it looser? Um, that whole sort of thing. Anything else I'm missing there, Rich? No, I, I think that's good. Uh, we do have some questions here uh, to finish things off. Um, first things first, uh, Rye actually, I uh, wanted to ask this question. Uh, is the earliest uh, possible consolidation pip, uh, pivot uh, typically from the launch pad setup, which is the curling of the moving averages for anybody who's, who's aware. If you go back and look at the examples, uh, all the moving averages are bunched together. They're tight and then they're starting to yep. curl upwards. Uh, so is that typically, say, yeah. 
Yes, I would say, um, yeah, most of the time. And sometimes the first consolidation pivot may be as those are forming and it might take the second one, right? You'll see it go through, it'll fail. And then as the averages actually converge, get tight, you know, and begin to expand to the upside, you may get a second one. But yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm always going to prefer buying it through, right? When you're forming those launch pad setups, it's usually at the end of all. So you've got that declining, you know, or yeah, the declining top, tops trend line, those moving averages, and quite often your first or second consolidation pivot, which is usually very, very close to the bottom of the base. And if that's not close enough for you, um, I don't know. I wouldn't even know where to point you to get much closer than that. I don't have to do it. But um, yes, yeah, so yep. that, that's spot on. And if you can buy it after that has already happened, you just have that much more. You're you're not at all in free. There's no steamroller to worry about at that point. And so that's, you know, bills that the lowest price isn't always the best price. But in some time, there's a reason it might. Be. And especially then when you're buying early up the right side, the second consolidation pivot is not late. Get that? You know what I mean? So. Yeah, perfect. Um, from Michael, uh, when a setup triggers through a consolidation pivot, uh, what are you looking for to execute besides relative volume and volume? And and you kind of went through that, but uh, is there anything else you're really watching closely? Um, it, you know, so the volume's volume? got the volume's got to be there, but but you'll notice on these consolidation pivots, we've got a lot more lee leeway in terms of volume. And let me be very clear. And I think we might be. I don't know if we have a presentation. I know we've discussed it, but anyway, on a base breakout. I want to see something significant, um, a, a, at least a pocket pivot, more volume than average. It's got to be um, super big if it's going to be a classical big base breakout, typically 20% or more if it's, it's you know, I've let them get away with as little as 16 or 17%, but I'd much prefer 217% on the breakout. I don't want to have to play that game, right? Yeah. Um, um, what was the uh, question? I'm sorry. Basically, basically, what are you looking at right as the stock's pushing through the pivot? Right, right. So, uh, again, if it's a consolidation pivot, as long as volume is going to be bigger, as long as I can look and go, we've traded this many today, we did this many yesterday, can I reasonably expect it to be bigger? However, if it's, you know, something further up in the base um, on a, on your proper base breakout, I want to see that 20% or more, preferably double um, with the consolidation pivots, as long as it's bigger than the prior day, we're good. But yes, it is really that volume. And then, of course, the price action. Um, if you're low down, like I was showing in the bottom of the base, the market's just trying to get started and you get a bit of a failure at a moving average. Um, I'm not going to give that as much leeway, especially if it happens at a 65 day exponential extended above the 10. And there's a gap underneath versus um, a healthier market and a stock that's building its second stage base that has similar action, but without the gap and much more, you know, so there are, but it's still, the breakout doesn't hold, but it, so there are, um, it's the price action too. And based on that stock, how it acts, where it is in relation to um, the cycle itself, its personality, um, all of that. But volume is the key, is the, is where I focus in on. Yeah, perfect. And that, that kind of answered Tommy Sella's question, which uh, which was, is it important uh, slash required to have big volume through a consolidation pivot? Uh, if so, how much percentage of volume um, and such as that? So you, you, you kind of already covered that. Um, it gives you a very good, it gives you, a, and believe it or not, I, I mean, so far, I mean, you guys tell me if you run into trouble with it. I haven't run into too much trouble with that simple average. And here I'll give, so anyway, that, not that simple average, that simple rule is on those early consolidation pivots, as long as volume picks up from the prior day, that seems to be uh, where the sweet spot is at. Perfect. And and do you find uh, that consolidation pivots are more successful if it just pushes through and immediately, you know, makes progress? Or does it not really matter if it like stutters a little bit near that pivot? What, what's going to be yeah, just, just like that. I, there's no difference between I would say this and and at any other um, pivot. Yeah, case. you want to see you know yeah. the the blast through is better, right? Um, it's early up the right side, so then of course that's going to require certain things to have to happen on the daily and weekly charts for the base to still be sound and what have you. But sure, the higher the volume, the easier it goes through. 
um, the tighter, the more liquid, the more organized, the better. And, you know, as a market gets more and more mature and the leaders become a little bit more obvious, um, I'm going straight for those stocks that do trades, tight ranges, typically high priced, super liquid. They trade in an organized manner. We all know what Whippy looks like versus one that trades in a nice tight, you know, stair stepping pattern that, and yes, they're a little, they may be a, I'm not going to say they're always slower. There are plenty of them that are slower, but there's plenty of super powerful, powerful TMLs that act like some of those stocks that might be slower. And so that's just, those are my favorites, so that the ones where you can get Tesla kind of power. And that's a perfect example on that. Once, you know, when it was trending, it just makes it really easy to trade. Once it breaks a key level, you're pretty good to just get out of the way. Yeah, Short term. Yeah, so. Yeah, and then there's uh, two two questions here from Manoli. First, uh, um, would love to know Ross's criteria for a minimum length of consolidation. So I guess you know how long is that is that consolidation under the pivot? Does that kind of matter to you? It really does, and I guess at, as we're the ones, a lot of the bases maybe that we're forming now along, or as we were forming, right? We made the bottom of the market in October. We're coming nicely up the right side now. Um, so yeah, the deep, the, I guess it's gonna really, it's gonna depend, right? Because I think you, you get those deep V-shaped recoveries in the market. The stock's a company. I don't know if it's the chicken or the egg there. Um, you know, but uh. uh Right, you know how we always talk about a rounded as opposed to let's say a jag a jagged bottom something smoother and a little bit longer obviously i i mean not obviously but something that takes weeks and months right to build as opposed to something that just in yeah. the long longer is better i do not have a uh a minimum um and for it's a great for, yeah. for the for the consolidation pivot itself, so up the right hand side, it forms a pivot. It doesn't matter to you how long it it stays below that pivot and how tight that is. Right. Or... So to me, it's a, a day two almost. So the next day is just you know it, it is a higher high. Um, the day after, you know, so let's say it makes the consolidation pivot, we make a low and then go again. That's questionable. I don't. You know, Richard, I think we are, I'm going to have to make some rules for that because I don't I don't have them. Those are awesome it's more it's, it's more your eye, right? You kind of going by it's the field. It's totally yeah. my eye. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I and mean, again, that's that's great, though. It makes me now I want to know the answer to those questions, Manoli, because that's those are phenomenal questions that my brain just never keyed in on. So um, I'm going to have to take a look at that. And uh, that will be more of an observation that I'm going to make over time now that that's in the back of my head. As I look, I will not be doing a um, complicated or extensive back test for sure. Um, and a, a similar but, kind of part two to that is uh, maximum depth of that consolidation to so that contraction. Again, again, that might just be something going forward, right? Yeah. All You know, I want to say that... But, <laughs> What if you could take the daily can slim rules and then take them, strengthen them by um, proportionately, proportionately percentage wise? Does that make sense? I mean, yeah, maybe, as, maybe we'll do a study. A basis, we'll yeah. So, yeah, I mean, that's going to, yeah, that's definitely going to take a study whether, because um, I haven't looked at those, that's going to definitely take a study between, because that's the difference between stocks that might turn around in like a week and a half to three weeks off the bottom, which we've seen happen and just go straight up um, versus the ones that take a little more time. And, you know, those those markets like Bill said, it'll wear you out or scare you out. And that has definitely been the case since October. It has not been smooth and easy, although we've seen a, um, it's been a little bit more cooperative over the last couple of weeks. Still got a long way, a little a long way to go to show me that the market's cleaning up any mistakes. It's definitely not doing that yet. Perfect. Um, but that, but that, that's the best I can give you. It's, it's by eye. We're going to have to take a close look at that. And it's a great question. So. Yeah, great. And then one last question from Eric. Uh, what are some signs Roth monitors to avoid a fake breakout, large upper wick uh, after entering the position? For example, does he watch lower time frames to ensure continued uptrend on that time frame, higher highs, higher lows? In such a situation, if it does uh, pull back intraday, uh, how long does he wait to sell? 
Uh, so as I'm doing it intraday, as you should, I mean, we can go back. Let's just go to uh, the beginning of A here as. So I'm automatically, as we're putting it in here, my sell stop is going to be that, you know, 10 day moving average at a, at a max. I might even draw the line here. So, and this is where Manoli's question is, and it, it's a good one because you could get really um, granular, right? And set, right? Because that's what kind of forms that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that way, you know, you've got to, that, that's so anyway, that I see. But as I'm doing it, I am always, I try to keep one, you know, at least one super tight, but usually two. I'll keep in my in mind because I don't put cell stops in the system. I meant alerts and then I'll do it along the way. But it's going to be between this, whatever, what is this line? 444 and the 10 day moving average. Um, and then depending on how things ha it's so the question was so if if it push if it, if it pushes through and then reverses basically uh, what are you considering to determine if you sell it or not it's good so like i was saying before a lot of it's going to be the stock where we are in the overall cycle where this this isn't a breakout reversal but this is a reversal that's a huge problem for me and i'm getting out of the way of because we're so near a bottom there's no you know maybe we've had a follow through day at this point we're looking at a gap um there you just that's too dangerous for me if i bought here mm -hmm. um whereas i'm trying to find this right here i have no problem with this here because i've got i now have a lot more confidence it's pushed through a ton more um resistance granted we're failing at that 200 and uh, my little consolidation pivot that I drew there, but just barely. So honestly, this I would not sell. And, you know, I would try and use that 10 day on a closing basis um, at the end of it. Right. Um, and then that's just me. And the reason is I just feel like I have a lot more um, or a lot less to lose and a much easier way. I don't care if it falls to the 10 day from here, necessarily, depending on where I am from this point, I guess, right? I'm assuming that I've gotten in, I've got some cushion, the market's moving up now, I've got some confirmation in the group, other stocks are looking like this, maybe one's through, are you with me? Versus um, right here, this is just the first push off a potential bottom of a market that's been going straight down since um, November 2021, right? Mm -hmm. So it's going to be a lot of that context, Mark, you know, also this is a significantly worse failure to me. So it just, and this isn't fair because it's not a breakout failure. Um, I would say if the, the, the massive ones that turn pink, I guess, and reverse and just fail, they close, you, you, you wouldn't buy it in, in a million years versus one that may do this it's a super ugly close this even though it's a blue day is a that's stalling that's an that's a cumulative action assuming the market or that volume increased however i've seen enough times now that you can get a stock that'll stay up in that wick and continue to build and mm -hmm. get support above in this case it didn't do it it immediately came in and uh tested the 10 day for a few days gives you a chance to do it again and now it's going to test you even further right um it, and it, again, these look big, but they're not all that big, right? So we're looking at about 536-ish and a 10-day uh, five, low 520s. So you're looking at maybe $12 on a $512, $530 stock. That's a, super, that's a super tight. You know, even here, if you're buying it from here, I'm sorry, to the 23, it looks like it's a whole lot of room, but it's not. So, uh, okay. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. So I, I don't know how other than it's going to be uh, it's the, I don't have a rule. It's going to be my the the art of of trading to me. And I'm going to make a judgment call based on, you know, where we are in the market, that stock, the group, um, the way that it failed, where it failed, how I can manage risk, all of that. I don't think there's any way to do it. I, but I have found there there was a point where I would just automatically sell any failed breakout and that didn't work for me yep perfect 
So that's why I kind of keep it to that. I've tried to make a, a and to be fair, after all of that babbling on, I've tried to make that rule because I try to make a rule and just be consistent with it. But that was that was hurting me to just sell every failed breakout. That was not a good rule. So now I try and, you know, do waffle around it using the tightest, most logical stops possible and then um, context clues and qualitative clues. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, yeah. context definitely is worth taking into consideration. Um, Ross, thank you for your presentation and the q and I, I think um, we can pretty much call it there. Any last words of advice for, for people watching around consolidation pivots or, or just kind of trading in, in general? No, uh, don't ever... No, don't let FOMO get the best of you, especially now. Don't worry about people making money off the bottom. I've said it a billion times. I'm going to say it again here. We are still super early. There's the opportunity of a lifetime comes every other day in the stock market. I learned that one from Chris Catcher, and he, he couldn't be more right. The It took me a long time, but as I got older and forced myself to let go of FOMO, because it, it, I get, you know, you, you start to not like that feeling on your, on your heart of the, uh, you know, watch what's going on. And so um, I would say, don't worry about someone making money on a stock you were watching that you missed. I do it all the time. Take a deep breath. Just be patient. If you can't come up and this goes back to my, I think this is my number one rule. Never buy a stock unless you know where your sell stop is and why. So if you can't answer that and feel really good about where that sell stop is, you shouldn't be buying that stock. And don't worry about FOMO. There's going to be opportunities galore. So that would perfect. really be it. Patience is very important right here. It's not cooperative. Yeah, perfect. Uh, well, Ross, thank you. And uh, to everybody watching, leave a like down below if you're enjoying it. Uh, and we'll be right back. Take care. Okay, welcome back, everybody. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our next guest for the Trailline Conference, John Brody, an extremely experienced trader with multiple decades in the market. Uh, he'll be covering uh, money management and the mental aspects of trading. Uh, John, thank you so much for taking the time. It's, it's always great chatting with you. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Yeah, of course. And uh, to kick things off, would you mind kind of going a little bit into your background for, for people who maybe aren't familiar <clears throat> with you? Uh, we obviously did an interview previously, but uh, I'm sure it'd be great to kind of add that perspective uh, as we get into our discussion. Sure. So I've been, this is my 30th year trading, uh, short-term momentum trading. Started uh, with Stephen Schoenfeld uh, in 1994, late 1994. Been, was there for about 20 something years and then came over to Kirshner where I've been trading for the last few years. Started, I've always kind of been in, I would say risk asset types of things. Uh, I played poker for a bit before I started trading in my really early 20s. So for me, it was kind of a no brainer to go into trading um, mm -hmm. and basically I've been doing it ever since and love every day of it. Yeah, perfect. And what, when we kind of chatted about what, what you want to discuss, you kind of wanted to focus on risk and, you know, capital preservation, because is that job number one, pretty much? Yeah. So for me, for, for me, risk, uh, pr preservation of the capital and mental aspect of your trading, the basically psyche is really the most important. Um, as you get into your trading career, now, obviously when you first start off, when you're trading one or two years and you're learning how to trade, 
you have to get the fundamental skills to trade. I mean, that's first and foremost, but as a professional athlete would do, you need to have the proper mental mindset to be able to trade day in and day out, because I am an active trader, and be able to constantly, I would say, tweak your, your strategies to fit what is going on in the market. So for me, a market that's trading at a 30 VIX or very volatile with giant swings is much different than a market that's trading at a 12 VIX that just kind of grinds. And you have to be able to adjust those things kind of mentally as well as just technically with whatever trading style you do. Being a short-term momentum trader, my ideas may not resonate with someone who swing trades or position trades or mean reversion trades. But the one thing that will resonate with them is basically the, the preservation of capital, managing the risk, and your mental mindset. And that's why I think it's it's very important. Um, some of the um, important things for capital for me is that I think of them as kind of my army. You know, right? So my, my money that I have, that I have access to, to trade and deploy are kind of my troops. Or if I was playing poker, it'd be my chips in a no limit game. Mm -hmm. uh, that's strength. When you have capital, you have strength. Okay. When you're weak on capital, you're weak. And being in a weak position to trade makes it very difficult to make money. Okay. So for example, if, you know, I try to tell people they should have some money saved up before they trade because the job that I'm in, it's not guaranteed that I get paid. You know, I earn for what I, what I make. So if I go on a, 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 a four or five month stretch where I have an off year where I make a tenth of what I usually make, you need reserves because without those reserves, you'll trade differently. You'll trade panicked. You'll be scared. And believe it or not, you may not realize it's happening, but you'll trade completely different and you won't be profitable. Yeah, perfect. And you, you mentioned the 50-50 the method and, and last year. Uh, would you mind kind of diving into that and maybe getting into your performance and how you're, how you're doing right now? Yeah. Sure. So the way I trade, all I have to do is go 50-50 to make money mm -hmm. and good money at that. I don't need to have an 85% win percentage. Uh, I know people that do, um, but they their losses are usually bigger than the wins. For me, my winning days are always bigger than my losing days. Mm -hmm. So for example, last year, I had a decent year. I made, uh, you know, in seven figures and I had only a 51% win percentage. The year before the same thing, 51.8. So as long as I manage my money properly, right? So if my average day I'm making 50 grand, my average day I'm losing 27 or 32, whatever it might be, you know, over 252 trading days, you know, well, a couple of days for breaks, but not many because I don't break very often. Um, the money will add up. And you get that way by kind of, I would say, eliminating the slippage, eliminating the trades that maybe you shouldn't make, eliminating the pressing. Now, that being said, I'm going to be perfectly candid in this call. In the last couple of months, I've not traded well. I'm actually, I've lost some money the last two months, which the last time I've had back to back losing months was a, a few years. Um, it's been kind of difficult for me. And the reason why is because the market changed a little bit. So for me, when, if you notice, the VIX is like 13 now, or 13 and a half is in that area. And when volatility gets gets taken out of the market, for me, mm -hmm. it's a it's a it's a it's a change that I have to kind of adjust to. Mm -hmm. And in my earlier in my career, it took me a long time to adjust. It takes shorter now, but it's always something I'm still working on. Like, you know, I listened to Dr. Steve Barger and and uh Bell Fiori, Mike Bell Fiori's, and they have some great knowledge. And some of the things will overlap about. And that's and I think it's smart and important because you need to know these things over and over to kind of step in your head. Um, it, you have to always, to me, talk about the management of money. It's just extremely important. I think also at the same time, you know, moving on, I want to talk about like um, pressing when you're winning versus yep. kind of pulling back when you're lo losing. So like right now, then I'm in this little, I would say, down move or a little pullback of, of PL, I like to call it. I try to cut my trading back. I try to trade smaller until I can stop the bleeding. Okay. The first issue you got to do, you got to stop. Make sure you stop the losing. Size back, trade less. Uh, you know, look for situations where, where you're confident because your confidence, what happens really is that your confidence, your confidence takes a hit. Mm -hmm. Okay. You, ba you basically kind of get like, oh no, if I put this trade on, is it going to work? Am I going to make any money? Um, maybe I should book the profit now really quickly before, before it goes away. These are all things that play on your head, you know? So for me, the first thing you got to do is stop the losing. Mm -hmm. Reset. Because here's the thing, and this is kind of hard for traders. 
That money's gone. It's, it's not like makeup. That money is no longer yours. Now it's time to have a new approach to making new money. Don't chase the old money. That money's history. Okay, once you get that thought in your head and you kind of let go of that weight that's sitting on your shoulders, because because when you're in a hole, all you think about is, oh my God, I gotta get out of this hole. Oh my God, I'm down so much money. How am I gonna get back to my high water mark? And that is not beneficial to getting out of your out of that losing streak. You need to forget about it, let it go. That's important. Yeah. At the same time, though, when you're winning, okay, it's important to press. And when I say press, I don't mean go crazy, just enter a thousand trades and, and become a get, uh, you know, some kind of crazy cowboy. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about you see a good idea, okay? You step on the gas, you size up a little bigger. And the reason why is because you're seeing it well. Mm -hmm. now, consciously, you may not realize it, but subconsciously, you are definitely seeing the ball. You know, when a hitter hits 375 with a, a 280 lifetime or a golfer is, you know, he's playing great, he hits he's averaging 1.6 putts instead of 1.8 or whatever it might be. OK, or a poker player who is winning tournament after tournament, he's got the confidence. So he's pressing and he's and, he, and he's kind of rolling with that. And that's important because that's kind of for me, like give you an example. Most of my year is kind of, I would say, between, let's say I'm using arbitrary numbers here just to make it kind of easy. Let's say between 20 and 50,000 every day. Right. And again, these are hypothetical arbitrary numbers. And then I'll have days I make 300. Right. Those outlier days really make up my year. Because I'm a 50-50 trader, right, 51%, those big outlier days, those are the days that make you the money. So when I'm seeing it well, I'm hitting it. You know what I'm saying? I'm making sure that I am capitalizing on that, okay, and 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 not not taking my foot off the, off the gas. Now, there's a few kind of caveats to that. The first caveat is that you got to be careful because I say that meaning that confidence is great. Cockiness and overconfidence is a killer. Mm -hmm. And I will let you know right now that every down move that a trader has comes after a big boom they've had. You know, I know many traders that go on this year and a half run and they make a fortune, life-changing money. And then in three months, they lose 25% of it. And they're wondering, huh? That's because they're still kind of stuck in fifth gear. You got to downshift. You know, when things start turning, shift back into second gear. Mm -hmm. You know, have gears, have different ways you can... You can, you know, change your speed. You don't have to always have the, the throttle gun when you're when it's working great. Another thing I like to talk about uh, in that same category is something like, um, let's say you want to make, you have a goal in mind. You lost some, let's say it's 10 grand a day and you want to make 20. Okay. And you get 20,000 in the first 32 minutes of trading. There's some people that say, well, I made my 20,000. It's good for the day. I'm done. I don't subscribe to that. First of all, you can't make 50 unless you make 20, okay? That's the first thing. And if you're seeing it that good and that well and things are actually working out for you, no, you don't stop when you, you because you're your high tick. Set a little give back. Okay, I'm up 20,000. I think you back five and done for a day. So if I, I guarantee you'll make, make, make 15 or 14, a percentage, a percentage that you're happy with, right? Mm -hmm. So if you do that, then you can, while you can kind of still ride that wave, kind of think of surfing, you can surf that wave all the way into the shore, right? I like using analogies of sports and poker because it's a very competitive game. And there's a lot of crossover that's there if you really think about it, especially in the mental aspect. Yeah. And can I hop in with a question? Sure. Yeah. Going back uh, to your batting average, um, I think that's worth emphasizing, you know, 51%, uh, you know, there, there's, there's people, you know, a lot, there's this perception that you need to have an 80, 90% win rate to be successful in trading. But like, like you mentioned, it's about the risk reward as well as that batting average that really makes a difference. Could you kind of touch on that concept a little bit and, and maybe some guidance about what traders should be shooting for depending on their style and, and uh, how they like to trade? Sure. So a lot of traders, not all, but a lot of traders that have high win percentages, their loss, win loss is, is, is backwards. So they'll win like 90% of the time, but when they lose, they really lose. Right? They get smashed, okay? So for me, being that I kind of make money management and the wins being bigger than my losses paramount, I cut a lot of losses maybe that others would hold and wait till, wait till they come back. I don't wait around, mm -hmm. right? I'm not, I'm not the trader, and I think it's kind of horrible to do in my opinion, to wait around to, you know, if you don't with trade with a stop or trade with a, 
a, a, a loss limit that you want to set for yourself and just kind of hope it comes back. Because um, here's the thing about that, okay? That works until it doesn't. And when it doesn't, you're blown up. And some of the, there are guys out there that you would never think would blow up, that have blown up. There are guys that are much better than I am and trade, you know, billion dollar bucks, I would say, you know, that have blown up because they have, they have gotten in a situation where they have not cut their losses or have gotten emotionally connected to a trade. Um, for me though, going back to what you were saying, I feel like by having kind of getting rid of those losses on the quicker level, I'm never putting myself in a situation to have those big, those outsized losses. Right. And that's just my style. Like if a guy can make 90% and have bigger winners and losers then fantastic. I'd like to meet the guy because I've never met that dude. And I would like to, or girl for that matter, or woman, um, because it usually goes hand in hand. It's usually one way or the other. And it's a super active trader. Yeah. And can you kind of give some perspective about it in your, in your opinion, how important is the mental aspect of things and like making sure you, you're, you're, con you're protecting your confidence, your mental capital as well, compared to, you know, just working on trading skill and, and trading execution. Sure. So I, I do want to say one thing really fast that I want to touch on a little, a little story. Yeah. Go okay. So I know a person who going back to the 90% thing, I know a person who was, is a fan, is a fantastic trader. I have the utmost respect for him. Okay. And he got caught in a trade that he got emotionally attached to. Um, it was, uh, I think, TOP a couple months ago. Uh, the stock went to like, I don't know, like went from like 30 to 250 yeah. after hours. And like three, right. It was like a, it was like a record for, for a lot of people. And that was a situation to me where he, he got emotionally attached to that trade. Like because this, that style, which was a style, that he would kind of hold positions, not really trade with the stop limit until they came back, right? So he basically liquefied two years of earnings in four hours after hours, and the re and the reason and the reason why that happened is because that's just the, his style. That was his style. That was his leak. That was his flaw in his trading. I have flaws in my trade. I tend to overtrade when I, when, I, when I trade poorly. I tend to not. I tend to not. Um, trust what I'm doing. I let the doubt creep in. And that, and you want to talk about mental aspects of trading. Well, this is a perfect segue into that because it's important for traders to trade with confidence, right? And when you're first starting off, there's a reason to be doubtful and have some fear, okay? Because it's new. Um, you, it's a situation where maybe you feel like, you know, you don't know it all just yet, or there's, there's stuff you, there's stuff you have to learn, you know, it's understandable, right. but once you kind of learn and understand and kind of have a, a, I would say a strategy in place, doubt will really just kill a trader. So what I used to do is, and this was years ago, a trader would start trading. He would tell me, you know, John, I have a hard time. Every tick, I'm worried that I'm going to lose money. Every tick, I, I get nervous and I want to micromanage, I want to sell. And this is back when like stocks were trading eighths and quarters, by the way. So I'm kind of really old. You know, I mean, this is the, we're talking like, I think the first trade that I made was I made two and seven eighths on Eli Lilly, 100 shares. It was fantastic. I still remember it. Um, but he was talking about that. And this is what I said. I go, look, do me a favor. Put on eight positions. Okay. Put some stops in. Leave for two hours. He goes, what? I go, yeah, just do me a favor. Put your stops on and leave. Don't even watch them. Just go. He goes, well, what happens if you get stops in? He goes, well, what happens if I, I go, what happens if what? You have stops in. Stop, you have to get used to stop watching every tick, okay? The, if you sit there glued to your monitor watching every tick, forget it. You, you're not going to make it because it's like it's like the old adage. I read it in a book somewhere. I forget where it was. It was, um, it might have been college, actually, basically talking about how if you're on a boat, right, and the waters are calm, you feel calm. And when the waters are rough, you may feel nervous and anxious. The ocean, I mean, nothing's really changed. Your attitude has changed towards the ocean. Sure, it's gotten a little rough, but the, the, you're still in the boat. I mean, everything else is still kind of the same. So I, I try to get these beginning traders to let go of that of that fear, let go of that, that anxiety of trading a, a portfolio short term and be able to actually let these things kind of materialize and play out. Um, for an experienced trader, 
doubt is something that is really, really detrimental. I mean, it, it's crazy. Like, <clears throat> like I said, 30 years I've been doing this and I still go through all this stuff. Yeah. 30 years. So, I mean, I'm doing it. This, this will start my fourth decade, which is when I talk about it, it's crazy next year. And, um, and I still have to remind myself of all this stuff, especially with doubt. Like, you know, you have a, I'll go back to the athlete again. I mean, I mean, we, we, you're staying over a two foot putt and all of a sudden the, the, you're worried about it. The hole looks like a pin. Like, like how am I going to make this? Well, when you're confident, right? I mean, it, it, everything looks e e enormously huge. And when you have the doubt, especially in trading, little micro changes happen that you cannot tell. Mm -hmm. Okay. So <clears throat> uh, let me give another example about playing poker. You know, you have, you talk about people on, in playing poker and being on tilt. Okay. I don't know if, you, if anybody plays poker here, but being on tilt and they're playing differently and they, then they're crying and moaning how the cards are not working their way or the dealer hates me, you know, and I've been guilty of these things at the poker table once in a while in my life. So I understand. And um, the truth of the matter is you're just not playing well. I mean, sure, you can get unlucky it's a sh in a short term, but you're not playing well. You're making changes, maybe not as aggressive as you should. Be. Maybe you're too aggressive. Maybe you're pushing. Maybe you're pulling back. This is the same thing for trading. You know, you're trading. Maybe you're holding those winners a little too long. You're trying to squeeze more out of it because you want to make all the money back. Or maybe you're so scared of losing that you're cutting the winners off really fast because you don't want to lose the cash at your own. These are all part of that. And those little micro changes are very, very hard to, to kind of notice that they're gone, that they're different. Very difficult, really hard. Yeah. And you mentioned, you know, how detrimental doubt can be. What are some tactics or, or strategies that you use to kind of eliminate that or avoid it as much as you can uh, so you, you preserve that confidence? So for me, it's more process, right? You're talking about process, you know, the process is the most important part. And I agree with that. So what I try to do is, and, and, and it's funny because I could be losing four days in a row and oh God, I can't make a do dollar. I'm trading so poorly. Have one good trade the next day and all of a sudden feel like, Hey, everything's ready. Again. It comes back quick. The confidence. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah. it's, that, that's the thing. Yeah. So I like to call that kind of long learning and short memories. Right? right. And the reason why I say that is, so when things are tough for me, I stick with the process. If I'm trading 10,000 shares or 20,000 shares or a million dollars worth of stock or $2 million of stock, I'll cut it by, by 50%, 70%, just to get a winning day, just to get a winning trade. Let's say I lose, and again, these are hypothetical numbers, 50, 50, 50, 50,000. I make $1,000 in the fifth day. Fantastic. I go home feeling like a million dollars. I feel like I got it again. $1,000. Or you need, just book a win. Get out of that cycle. Losing begets losing. You've heard that before. You get out of that cycle of losing. You know what I'm saying? The winning mindset, the winning mindset is such the key to trading. This game is so mental. I mean, let me ask you a question, all right? So I sat on a desk for, I would say, 20 years, okay? And on this desk that I sat on, all right, we all trade the same way. So when I was at my first trading firm, it, we all traded the same way. Intraday, single night overnights, um, relative strength, momentum, okay, which is still my backbone of my trading. And we all trade the same way. But explain to me if we're all talking the same thing on the desk and we're having the same conversation, okay, about what trade and we're actually getting in mostly at the same time. How is one guy making five million a year and the other guy losing two hundred thousand? The ideas aren't different. We're not trading differently. What's the difference there? I'll tell you the difference there. The guy who's not making money is is executing poorly because his mental mindset is he doesn't have the confidence. Mm -hmm. Well, the guy making the money knows that these trades are going to work if he just gives it the proper time and gives it the, the room that it's supposed to have to work. Got to accept, you have to accept the risk when you trade. There's no way around it. You cannot, I mean, and cannot try to trade without risk tolerance. You have to have some. And whether you'll learn it or some, some people are born with it, some people can learn it, but you better have it. Yeah. And how do you... Yeah, how how do you learn that, and how do you work? How do you how do you realize how much risk you can take, and make sure you've got a plan that that will be the max risk that you can take? If that makes sense. Well, so yeah. Well, so first of all, you you learn it by like I said by the long learnings and short memories. You learn it by learning about what works and what doesn't, right? So if you listen to Mike and Brett's presentation, they talk about trading things that you do well at. And that's true. Like, like I used to think when I was younger, oh yeah, I got 86 tools in my toolbox. I got the screwdriver, the hammer for this situation, for that situation. And the truth of the matter is that's all noise. 
a jack of all trades makes some money. A master makes all the money. That's just the truth. If you can stick to one or two things that you're fantastic at, you're going to make money. So basically, you got to find out what you're good at. What do you trade well? Do you trade earning stocks well? Do you trade breakouts or breakdowns or 200-day moving average breaks or whatever it might be well? Or do you swing position well, mean reversion well? Find that out. And once you get that, then you concentrate and hone on that. You make sure that that is your focus. With that focus, you, you will become better and better at that. I think that's that's I call long-term learning. Mm -hmm. um, the short memory part is that once you, I mean, you have to be able to, and this is part of risk tolerance also, you have to be able to, if you have a bad day, to let it go and come in next morning like it never happened. That money's gone. I discussed this before. It's, it, dwelling on it is not going to help. Talking about it, telling people about your about your hard hard days, which again I'm guilty of. I'm, all these things I talk about, I'm guilty of, by the way, or have been guilty of in my life. That's why I know they're detrimental because I cut them out at one point and make money. It, it's it, it, you have to. The only way, you know, I'm trying to help people not have to go through this. Mm -hmm. Kind of learn about it by me telling about it because I went through every single thing I'm talking about, all of it. I mean, thirty years is a long time. Um, so you got to be able to. Let it go. That money, like I said, money's gone. Focus on your next trade. You're only as good as your next trade. Focus on that. Focus on your on on, on the opportunity that lies in front of you, right? And the reason why is because a lot of traders and, and have what I call FOMO. Mm -hmm. Okay, they don't let it go. And FOMO, in my opinion, can come in three flavors. I like to call it, right. One flavor is that you hold your winner too long. Because you want to make all the money. Oh, this is the trade. It's going from three to sixteen. I'm not selling it till it's sixteen dollars. I'm going to make all the money. Meanwhile, you buy fifty thousand shares. It goes from three to five. You don't take a, 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 anything off because I mean, you know, it's going to sixteen, and then it closes at one and a half. And now you lost money, or you break even and get stopped out. Let's say when it goes back to unchanged, and you just piss away hundred grand because you wanted to make sure you didn't miss out the big trade. You're right. That's a FOMO. Fear of missing out. Another one is um, getting out of your losers, not getting out of them, just holding them because you're scared. Once you get out of them, guess what's going to happen? It's going to turn. It's going to go the other way. You're going to miss the big ride back. You're going to miss the profit back. Let's go back to the top story we talked about, about the about the person that didn't get out and, and gave away two years of earnings in a few hours because he was worried that if he got out at that time, that would be the wrong time to get out. And then, poof. And by the way, that strategy worked for 20 years. But all it took is one time. And guess what? That strategy is no longer he uses a different strategy. So that and then there's a fear of not making as much as you should because the guy next to you is making more, or the guy on Twitter is making more, or the guy in the chat rooms are making more, telling you how he's made 826 jillion dollars this year. And you look at your PL and you're 1400 Well, look, okay, there's always gonna be somebody who makes more than you. There's always going to be somebody who loses more than you. Okay. It just is what it is. You got to let that go. Um, there is no kind of, I mean, that, that stuff there to me is so detrimental to your trading to figure out. And again, I was guilty of it early in my career. How are you doing? What are you doing? Let me see your PL. You know, so competitive because I'm a competitive guy. Right. And usually traders are pretty competitive. That's kind of some of the allure that they can make money by their own merits and, and they can figure out the system and, and, and earn and don't have to worry about the, the red tape or any other stuff. Um, but the truth is, is that that doesn't help you any. Because first of all, no matter what Mr. Jones or Mrs. Jones is making, you're not getting paid any of it. So who cares? This is, this is a game that's, read, that, that, that's built on how much money you're making. What are you making? Okay, that's how you. That, that's how we decide who's a good trader, who's not. What have you earned? Okay, so if it doesn't help you earn, forget about it. Right, yeah. and there are, and, and and also the funny thing is with FOMO, there is a there is a few things that um that you miss out. Like for example, you miss the good trades that you might be seeing because you're worried about being stuck in this trade that you're getting buried in. How about that? How about the opportunity cost of that of of missing that next trade? Of that trade being, I mean, clear as day, lights and horns and bells, and and you're just missing it because you're sitting there staring at X Y Z because you're down two and a half bucks in it, and you know you should have got out two dollars ago. How about right? That's a, that, that, that's huge. Yeah. I mean, another one is like I talked about before, 
you're, you're up in a position, but you're not up enough. You need to make more. And then that winner just turning into dust. It's just gone. I mean, that's, that's, you know, those, those little things chip at your psyche. They chip at your confidence, you know, even making, you know, if it, 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 you know, have realistic profit goals when you're in winners. Okay. You buy a stock at three and it's five. Uh, hello, that's a 66% gain. Maybe you should take it. If you want to let a little ride, then I can understand. You know, I mean, if you got 20,000 shares, you take all 15, you want five to ride just in case it goes ballistic, like some of these crazy runners. Fine. Or if you're, and you have to also know what kind of stock you're trading. You know, if, if I'm in Intel and I'm up 250 in Intel, that's an enormous move. If I'm up 250 in Tesla, not so big. You have to be able to kind of understand and quantify what a big winner is and what a good winner is versus, uh, you know, a piggish winner yeah. and losses are the same way. You have to set your stops proper, manage that money properly. So you give yourself the room and accept the risk. You know, I'm not trading Tesla with an 80 cent stop, right? But I might trade Intel with a dollar stop. I mean, you know what I'm saying? I mean, especially if I'm an int trading an intraday, stock only has like a dollar 70 range all, all day, dollar 60. I look at the average range, you know, kind of cal calculate it through that. Yeah. So I mean that, that, that's kind of with the FOMO. What I what I I, I like to call FOMO. It's, that's kind of like what what I like to um kind of hone on. I, I think it's important. Yeah. Another thing that's important to me is the emotions in trading. So we're talking mental, right? And we're talking about like we're not machines, okay? At least I'm not. Maybe some people out there nowadays are, but I, I'm not just yet. Um, and we talk about emotions. This is a you know making money is emotional. Right. When you make money, I mean, when you make money, let's say you win some money gambling somewhere or you get some kind of money given to you by somebody, uh, whatever it might be. It's emotional. It makes you feel happy. Right. It makes you feel good. I mean, right? no one's ever said, oh, man, I made money. It sucks. You know what I'm saying? That doesn't happen very often. I mean, maybe it's like Brewster's Millions. Uh, it's old movies, but don't worry about it. Anyways, the point I'm trying to, the point I'm trying to make is that is that it's emotional. All right. And it's funny because I have seen basically traders get emotional and have and, and, and these great superstar traders just supernova they just blow up they just you know they, they just lose their accounts because they can't handle it like they, they, they're so worried about how much money they're going to make and what and, and one of the things i used to do and i used to tell my friend this is that um when i you know when i traded on a desk if if let's say i was up in a position and again remember we, we all trade homogeneously so we kind of had the same stuff you know, we were all momentum overnight traders in intraday, and the, and the desk was celebrating like a like a wolf like a wolf of Wall Street trailer. Like they're everybody's going crazy and going up. I knew that it's get out us. now, yeah. right? It's over. You yeah. know what I'm saying? It, it, it's done. Or or I used to like to talk about how you know the the person who has is not in the market is telling me how he's making a killing in this stock and that stock. And they're making all the money. I knew within six to nine months something bad was going to happen because. Basically, emotions kind of, that's kind of what sentiment is. And it, it's funny because it's the same way that you see the guy and he's all upset and, and he's breaking keyboards and smacking monitors because he's in a stock they should have got out of a while ago. You know, it's probably, and he just, I can't take it anymore. It hits the button. I mean, look, it's probably close to turning. Again, his emotions, I know it sounds terrible, but but our bodies have a way, a, a sneaky way of kind of getting <laughs> getting to a spot where they get like, um, where you get emotional or, or I, how do I say it? Like uh, a response. Yeah. yeah. Response and action where, where it's kind of, that's kind of your mind kind of telling you something, but you're, um, you're, it's being conveyed emotionally instead of logically. Right. Okay. Right. Gut feeling. There's no gut feeling. Gut feelings, a, a, in my opinion, a history of experiences that you've had. That is what that's kind of your brain telling you, hey, maybe you shouldn't get into display. Remember what happened last 84 times, right? I have a gut feeling this might work. Well, you have a gut feeling it's going to work because you've seen it 84 times. Like, I mean, the percentages are there. This is not, you know, for what I do, it's not an exact science, right? What I do, it's percentages. I play the percentages, right? Uh, I, just like if, you know, I mean, you sit at a poker table, again, we'll go to poker analogies. You sit at a poker table and a guy who has no business sitting in a game cleans up one day. I mean, it can happen. You can trade well and lose. 
Mm-hmm. It can actually happen for more than one day. It can happen for a while. You're trading well and you're just not making money. Maybe the market's changed. You know, they talk about it also. Maybe, maybe you're still, maybe you're still in fifth gear. Maybe you're still trading uh, breakouts when in actuality it's more of a mean reversion type of choppy tape. All uh, right. So uh, there are ways that you can still do your process, but just not make not making money. Now, if it happens for an extended period of time, then it's it, it most likely it's you. Okay. I mean, I would say one hundred ninety nine point nine percent of the time. It's you unless you walk into like some kind of your short of stock and opens up 400 or something like that because of some kind of crazy news. I mean, that, that is what it is. But for the most part, it, it, it's it's usually you. Yeah. And um, it's, I mean, look, I mean, there are different types of ways. You know, I talked about the people on the desk celebrating and smashing the monitor. You know, that's, I, you know, obviously in other things, it's called tilt. Okay. And you got to be careful of that because the more you trade in actuality, and let me tell you something, you have warnings, okay? When you're trading, you have warnings that things aren't going to go well. You choose to ignore those warnings. And the more experience you have, the earlier those warnings come. I have, I, I sometimes be trading, and most of the time I adhere to the warnings, sometimes I do not. And 100 out of 100 that I don't adhere to my warnings, I lose badly. Okay, and these warnings come in uh, uh, feelings of this may not work. I'm not trading well. Um, I, 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 I'm chasing. I'm doing things that are that are are detrimental to how I'm how I'm supposed to trade. I'm not following my rules. They're there, and and your body is signaling it to you. Your brain is telling you, listen. I mean, you're not you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. Most you know people ignore it. They ignore it. They think if they don't think about it, it just goes away. Tree doesn't fall in the forest and I'm not there, they really fall. Well, it's fall and your account's going to start falling. And the truth is that what I like to do, and I think it's a good strategy, um, is walk away. Get away from the screen. You're staring at the screen from nine. Well, if you, if you're, you know, get there early, 7.30 Eastern, by the way, to what, 4.30, 5 o'clock. You think you're not going to start seeing the dancing monkeys on the screen sooner or later? Doing it day after day, 252 trading days a year? Yeah. It's just start playing with your mind. And by the way, you're not going to notice. To you, it's going to be, oh, it's all fine. It's like the frog in the boiling pot. You know, it it doesn't realize it's being boiled. You have no clue what's happening. To you, it seems all fine. So when you get those signals, I like to call them, listen to them. Take a walk, 30 minutes, 20 minutes. Get away, get a a, a breath of fresh air. Mm -hmm. It will do your mind. It, it will really do your mind wonders. It really will. Is there anything you do outside of training to help, you know, keep you in the zone overall, you know, uh, things you do so, mentally or prepare, preparation right. So for, for me, per, for me personally, I'm, a, you know, look, I have been in holes before. Mm-hmm. Like I said, I'm kind of in a hole now in the last few months. I'm not trading well. And I'm in a, uh, you can call it a whole, I call it just, you know, I'm off, I'm, that I have a new PNL regimen to make, you know what I'm saying? Start over and freshen it. Um, for me, I do that fairly well. Okay. So, I mean, I like to, you know, I go to the gym, but I really haven't been working out recently as well lately. Um, take a walk. Um, I don't know, go to lunch, you know, just, just get away from it. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Just, just detach myself. I am not one to detach on a daily basis, meaning that if I tell you, and this is ex- an example of someone who's very far the uh, one direction. Um, if I tell you I've taken off 20 days of my whole career, that's, it's probably too much. Like I'm, 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 you know, and nowadays it's very easy to stay connected. Um, it's important though, when things are not doing well to take a breather. Yeah. Like I said, for me, exercise is good. When I exercise, um, uh, just detaching, even if just for an hour, you know what I'm saying? Just getting away from it. I, I think that's, I think it's very beneficial, but I like to do stuff like that. For, for um, sure. And did you want to touch on kind of pain threshold? Is that? Is yeah. That so good? this is to me, this is to me the most important part of the mental aspect of trading. Um, I don't know if people talk about it. It's something that's everybody has. And I mean, everybody has this. It comes in all shapes and sizes, all limits. But there's not one trader, not one person on earth that doesn't have a pain threshold, especially when it comes to risk taking. So 
this is how this works, okay? Some people have a very high pain threshold, meaning that they can handle risk at an exorbitant amount. Some people can't handle so much, right? It's the little, and then you have people in the middle. Think of it as an imaginary line, okay? Just a line. And as you get close to that line, usually by losses, right? You start getting uneasy. You start getting anxious. Now, guys, people out there listening, tell me if this isn't you, if you haven't had this situation once in your life if you're a trader. I guarantee you have. You get closer to that imaginary line and you're getting sweaty maybe. Well, maybe it doesn't have to be physical, but you're getting anxious, you're getting upset. Can't believe, you know, you're losing, you, you know, you, you get close to that number that you don't want to lose. And it's just, it's, you know, it, you just have that uneasy feeling, that anxious feeling, I call it. And then all of a sudden it disappears. And now you're numb. And now you don't have that feeling anymore. Because to be honest with you, you kind of don't care. You do care, but you don't care. Okay. That's crossing pain threshold. So once you get to that imaginary line, and everybody's line is different, okay, but your body is definitely telling you when you're close, okay, right? We talked about that before, about ignoring signals. Yeah. When you cross that line, okay, the losses literally multiply exponentially, okay? It, it, again, it, it, you can you tilt if you want or anything else, but they, let's say hypothetical numbers, you're down 30 grand in the day or 35 grand in the day and God, the day, whatever you're talking to yourself and mumbling. And then before you know the end of the day, you're down 150. Uh, hello, how'd you get down 150 if 35 you were nervous about? 35 is making you anxious because once you pass whatever number that is, everything above that line, you don't feel anymore. It's like you're in shock. It's it, it basically it is, it's trader shock. It's 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 money shock. I mean, you know, when you get into a, God forbid, some sort of uh, problem, you know, an accident or something like that, and you're bleeding or something like that, I mean, you basically, right, your body goes into shock to shut down the pain. To shut, well, this is, that, that's what your mind is doing. It's shutting down the pain. It's shutting down the pain of you losing more money, okay? It's making it so you, are, you aren't you uh, are feeling the disaster that is happening in real time, by the way, okay? And everybody's big loss that they've had one has had that happen to them. Not one person on this earth hasn't had that happen to them, okay? The best traders, and it's a small percentage, and I strive to, sometimes I get it right, sometimes I don't. I'll be honest, I mean, most of the time I do or I wouldn't be here for 30 years, but um, but there are times I don't. I'm, I'm always learning. But a very small percentage realize when that's happening. And they're like, I'm done. Mm -hmm. Lock it down, liquidate, shut it down. I don't got it today. Okay, this is going to turn into a nightmare. And I've had a conversation with a friend of mine who works at a different firm I've been trading with for 20 something years, you know, and I'll say to him, this feels bad. This is, I just, I, this is not going in the right direction. He's like, what do you mean? I'm like, you know what I mean? We've been here before. He'll be like, lock it down. You, you know where, you know where this goes. Remember, we're playing the percentages. It's not an exact science. Don't I want to put the percentages in my favor? If I know two out of 100, I escape this, this feeling. Two out of 100, when I cross the pain threshold, I come back. Why? Why take that risk? Go with the 98%. It ain't going to work. And if it does work, I mean, you got lucky, shut it down. Take your loss. Take your medicine for that day. Come back tomorrow, short memory, ready to, ready to trade again, fully focused, fully committed, to earning because the truth is this job you're only as good as you earn <laughs> it's just it is what it is and um there are a lot of different ways i, I want to talk about something else really fast that i really haven't touched on yeah, go for it. Are outside influences so you know because trading to me is nine i would say 90 percent mental again and i'm being conservative i think there are people who disagree there are people that say that oh no the technical aspect of it's more important the actual trading part uh, no okay because guess what this controls everything you do. And if this is not right, no matter what you think you're doing is right, is not right. You're not in step. You're not in locks. You're not in sync. You are out of sync. And when you're out of sync, nothing good happens. 
So there are other things that, how about things that are outside your, your, your control? Like maybe, you know, your health isn't as good, or maybe you have some family issues, right? Or your home life's a little rough. Okay. Um, that can affect your trade and actually will affect your trade. I've had that happen um, a couple of times in my life as well. And I think um, most traders who have been trading a couple of decades or a decade or two have, yep. I think newer traders, maybe not because they're younger for the most part, newer traders are younger. So they don't have kind of the, and I don't want to you know, sound um, like I'm being um, um, not compassionate to newer traders, but they really don't have the pressures of somebody, you know, if you're 25 years old and you go broke, okay, I mean, you know, start over, 25. If you're 45 and you go broke and you've got a family and a mortgage, you know, I got, I got news for you. It's a little rougher, okay? So what I like to talk about is that those outside influences, to me, are extremely important to your psyche and how you're trading. You know, make sure that, like you said, what do you do to get rid of the doubt? What do you do when things aren't going well? Try to be healthier, right? Try to exercise half hour a day. It doesn't matter how long. You know, saying have a hobby outside of trading. Um, you know, make sure your whole life is a little less stressful. I mean, I guess that's, you know, mine could be, you know, the one thing I kind of do well is that after an hour of me not trading well, I kind of let it go. Mm -hmm. Um, again, this, the, the market's going to be there tomorrow. So business, you know, I'm still a job. So, um, let that go. Have some routines, you know, if, if your routine is getting up at six 30 and, and, and lifting at the gym or getting up at seven, playing pickleball for an hour, or or coming in 5.45 and reading all the news that you have, whatever your routine is, and it works, stick with it. You're saying it, it, it's something that you put your mind in a happy place. And if your mind's in a happy place, your account's gonna be in a happy place. I, I give you my word. I promise you guys, you, 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 will, be, you will be rewarded with, with profits if you've got the, the proper headspace. And another thing that's really important that's overlooked. Now, again, for the younger trader, this may not um, qualify so much because they don't have as, as many obligations, I would say, but you, cash reserves are important, mm -hmm. right? So when you're trading and you're older or you've been trading a while, you want to have, in my opinion, at least a couple of years worth of cash for bills in case things don't work out. Because if you don't, and I've been in this situation too, okay? And you have to trade having to make money. God help you. I mean, seriously, it is not, especially when you're older. I, I've done it. Um, it's hard. You know what I'm saying? Um, it's a situation that you don't want to be in. Um, but so a couple of years of reserves, I think, is good, especially in the kind of job that I have. If you're an independent trader and trade your own accounts, you're definitely going to want it. Okay, because you know you, you know. You need to give yourself time. If if you've lost money, you're not being profitable to turn the boat, boat around. It's a battleship, okay? You need time to make that turn. It's going to take a little bit. Give yourself, you know, when I get in a, you know, I got in a hole, I give myself six months. Six to nine months. Now, listen, the truth is I can make the money back in three weeks. You know, things start going well. I start seeing the ball. I start trading well. You know, you start making boom, boom, boom. Everything's good. But I don't tell my brain that. I tell my brain it's going to take a while. Let's slow down. Let's be methodical about this. Remember that money's history. Let's start again, fresh and new. Build on a new, a new winning way. Okay. And I think having cash reserves definitely helps that situation because you're not going to be pressed to hit the button and make money. And especially if you're active, if you're a swing trader that makes two trades a day or three trades a week, it doesn't really qualify for you. But if you're someone like me who is an active trader who trades every day. Like, you know, I mean, it takes a lot to see nothing, yeah. you know, when you, when you, when you trade my style. Yeah. And going mm -hmm. back to outside influences, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't the most stressful period of my, of my life ever, but uh, one of my worst weeks trading occurred right during final season. I think my junior year of college where mm -hmm. I had a bunch of exams line up in a row and I, I tried to trade through it for some random reason. I don't know, but yeah, it definitely impacted things and the stress just built from the exams, the trading back to the exams. So, right. Yeah. It's just too much. I mean, listen, right. you have a fine line around. It, look, look, I know it's hard for people, especially who are competitive, to understand this, yeah. but you have a finite around amount of resources. I mean, it's not unlimited. And the older you get, the less you have. I mean, it's just, it is what it is, it's biology. I mean, we, we only can handle so much. Some people can handle more, some people can handle less. 
most of us are in the middle somewhere, but you only, you know, you, you have to prioritize. You have to be able to put yourself in a position, a mental position to win, yeah. a mental position to make good choices, a mental position to be able to preserve the money and don't liquefy it, you know, into, 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 into molten metal. You know, you need to be able to do this. And to be to be able to do that is to constantly learn and protect the money and understand that you need to accept the risk. OK, at the same time, though, you need to be able to use that risk to profit. And there's just there's no other way around it. If you want to be a trader that lasts through different types of markets, listen, there are traders that are great in bull markets. And then a bear market comes around. And they're, they're finished. They're 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 working at Merrill Lynch or doing something else. And then there are traders that are great big short term uh, short traders. When the markets fall apart, they make all the money. And then the market gets into a bull market, they lose every single day. You know what I'm saying? You have to be able to adjust to all those market conditions. You don't have to change your style. You just have to adjust it a little bit, ment using mentally and money management wise, okay, to kind of, I would say, turn the knobs. Like, I mean, Again, I'm kind of older, so I remember when I was young, we had one of those TVs that had like a fine tuning knob, right? Like it was static, and you're way too young for this. But it's like a staticky fine tune knob. You have to fine tune the the picture to make sure you got it in right because the antenna, the the rabbit ears on your TV set, whatever it was, you have to point them. But you had to fine tune it. Well, that's what this is. You basically have to fine tune the screen so the screen is clear. Mm -hmm. Okay, it, it's going to be you know as markets change, your screen's going to get murky. Your screen's going to get fuzzy, snowy, so to speak. You got to fine tune it. That's your job as a, as a trader who is, if you've been trading for a period of time to earn. And again, I will say this as many times as I possibly can. I do not care how much money you've made in the past. I do not care what kind of rock star trader you are. It means nothing to me because the truth is that sooner or later, if you don't adhere to your rules, you will pay the price. A guaranteed 100% of the time. I promise you, you will. It may be 10 years from now. You may be five years from now. It may be tomorrow, but it's going to happen. Okay. Those rules that you set in place are there for a reason. Okay. They're there to protect you from situate from your brain running amok. Okay. From your brain becoming an enemy instead of your biggest asset. And it happens. It, I've seen it happen at least 10, 10 to 20 times the traders that thought it would never, ever happen. Yeah. That's why I'm always alert to it because that's, I mean, listen, I, I, like I said, I've had downdrafts before that, you know, the, the, the one thing I do, is just gotta stop, stop the bleeding. We start and re earn. Yeah. And coming back to the context mattering a lot and, and the environment changing, what are some things that you notice in your trading or, or in the market when it's getting a little bit fuzzy, when, when you start to notice a shift, but you're, you're not quite realizing it just yet. And, and you have to start, you know, realizing it so you can make those adjust adjustments. Okay. So for me, like I said, I, I don't know if I mentioned this earlier for me, it's when volatility kind of gets sucked out of the market. Right. When the that, that's collapse, to, yeah. Right, yeah. right. That to me is my biggest struggle mm -hmm. because my style of trading is market centric with stock. Mm -hmm. So what I'll do is, is that when, when, you know, I, I trade a portfolio and if the market has more, you know, volatility in it, I can kind of trade the waves, so to speak. When stocks just kind of, when, when volatility shrinks and gets compressed, okay, there's still kind of choppy motion involved, right? But stocks don't really move that way. They kind of grind up, which is fine if they just grind it up. But you get this choppy, messy market where basically it almost becomes like a mean reversion type of like a like a a pool of just I don't know how to say it. Just like mis mis yeah. well, look at this market. Like, well, let's go through this market right now. Yeah. The Nasdaq was making new highs. The IWM can't, couldn't get out of its way, right? It was only the Nasdaq. It was like twenty five stocks. You looked at the breadth. The breadth was horrible. I was like, oh my god, this market's gonna collapse. It's like being led up by twenty stocks, right? And so you're like, oh my god, you know everything I look at. It's like the market's gonna come in. And then the market will come in and like, I'm going to be right. And then the market will shoot right back up. There's like maybe like last month, like three days in a row, four days in a row that happened. The market was by its lows, like at 350, just exploded. The next day was up. Like that, that's a death trap for me. You know what I'm saying? I have to recognize that. I have to recognize that there's no momentum here. And that's changed. 
pull back. Maybe just day trade. Maybe take overnight skeletal positions. And instead of taking a million dollars position or two million dollar position, take five hundred thousand. If it's against you, add in the morning. You know what I'm saying? You know, have a stock that you are comfortable with. I want to risk ten thousand a position. To get down ten grand, I'm done with the position. If not, I can add to it. I can keep my powder dry, stay in the game. That's money management. You know, making sure that you have, you know, you're able to stay around. Um, so for me, I, I need to recognize that sooner, um, but I also need to adjust, uh, adjust as well. And it's hard because I mean, like I said, I mean, 30 years and I still, I still fight with it. Yeah. Uh, again, it's better than it was five years ago, better than it was two years ago, but it's never, you know, you know, I, I listened to, I, I don't, I'm going to bring up, uh, Bella and, um, Brett's interview one more time. They talk about the mountain and Lance yep. climbing the mountain, right? To me, this mountain never ends. Like the mountain just gets bigger and bigger. Like it just doesn't stop. Like there's no getting to the top. Like every time you think you're at the top, an, another peak pops up. That's how I see it. I mean, it just it just it just doesn't stop. You have to always adjust. You have to always make tweaks, make changes, no matter what it is. You, whether you're an arbitrator or you're a, or you're like I said, a, it doesn't matter what kind of trading you do. You have to adjust. You have to make mental changes. Okay. You have to make money management changes to the environment that you're in. You do, you'll make money. I mean, I, I promise you'll make money. I, I actually guarantee you'll make money. I'll guarantee it. I know it sounds terrible to guarantee anything when it comes to trading, but in the long run, long run, I ain't talking about going out tomorrow and listening to what I'm telling you, then you're going to make money. I ain't saying that. Okay. Uh, the, the, you know, is trading every day is, 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 is up and down, but over a career, Okay, a career. If you can have, if, if mentally you can stay focused, and 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 follow your rules that you set for yourself, and notice the, the signals that your body's telling you, and you can manage the money and make the money paramount. That 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 pool of money that you have, whether it's outside investment, in-house prop, your own, any type, is is your first and foremost protecting that capital so you can earn on it. In the long run, you're going to make. Is you you saw her. Yeah, perfect, John. Is there anything else you really want to touch on before we maybe move into some more questions from the audience? Because there's a no. I mean, I, I I I think I'd like to hear you know people have to say. I I you know I think I touched up on everything I kind of, I kind of wanted to. Yeah. Um. I have, yeah. Awesome. All right. Uh, first, uh, from Michael, how does John detach from the dollar value of trades and risks he puts on? Do you think in percentages, or you're just able to? to so I, 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 right. So for me, ultimately, uh, optimally, I like to set up a, a amount that I'm willing to lose on the trade, right? So I'm setting, okay, I'm looking to lose X and I'm looking to make one and a half X or two X. Okay. And optimally when I'm, when I'm trading, like I'm supposed to, um, I will set stops and targets and I will trade accordingly for that. Um, on the way up, I usually don't have an ultimate target. I usually will sell three quarters of the position on the way up if it's working for me or down if I'm short it and then let a little piece ride and trail the stop. I like to trade that way. Um, basically, yeah. It's... Yep, perfect. Uh, from Dan here, uh, does he use a stair step, the, the gear analogy that you mentioned, to predetermine position size uh, based on his performance? So position size for me is based on the volatility of the stock, right? And, and, and the range of it. So I use a lot of range, right? So, so like I said before, if I am risking um, 10 grand a position, my, my stops will be wider um, for a, a stock that moves more, right? But it'll still be 10 grand. I try to use a, a fixed amount. Um, when I'm trading better, I may up that amount. Make, I may make it bigger. Um, and special situations, which I don't like to do so much because what happens is that usually it's almost like I get the special situation and, you know, I mean, if thing, you know, it, 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 if I make it seven trades and lose on one, you know, I, that's not my style. I want to, you know, I want to have the one winner out, you know, dwarf the, the six losers. So I will set, I will set it up. So basically these trades are uniform risk, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And then the, on special occasions, I will. Kind of like I said, when I'm seeing the ball, I'll load up in a position that I think I can maybe risk more on that stock. Maybe risk, uh, you know, maybe some stocks are, uh, I want to risk, uh, 
you know, 20,000 a position and this stock here, I want to risk 50,000 a position. Um, but for the most part, it's based on, it's based on the, the qualities of the stock. Yeah. So to speak. And he has a follow-up. Is, is it, is for the ranges and kind of measuring that is it ATR based or? Yes, for me. So yes. Yeah. So I use the average range of the stock to me is I kind of base it. So I like to usually risk maybe three quarters of a range, especially if I have it overnight. Okay. Um, I try to make at least one range and then hold for a range and a half, the two ranges. Mm -hmm. um, again, when I'm trading optimally, uh, there are times I'm not, I'm going to be the first to admit it. And you know, that's the part, every trader needs to, whatever they uh, are doing, they need to adhere to their rules. And when they slide a little bit, they need to make sure they get back on track, which is, you know, where I'm kind of in the process of doing now. Um, so yes, I will, I, I use average range. I use volume, I use dollar volume. Um, and I use, um, sometimes actually thinking it overnight, I use overnight history. Mm -hmm. There are certain stocks that just don't work overnight. I mean, like, like, like Netflix just is notoriously just awful all through the stock. I mean, for a gap, it just, just is. I don't know why, can't, but, you know, so I'll look at that. What's Tesla notoriously is a good one. Mm -hmm. Tesla followed through a lot. You know, it has a lot of momentum. Like the last few days, look how good Tesla's done. Sure, it had some news, but normally it's a pretty good stock overnight. So maybe we could get a little more risk there. You know, saying the percentages. Again, let's play the percentages. Right. And um, I actually just remembered a, a question I really want to ask you. I really liked what you said about, uh, you know, focusing on two setups and kind of mastering those versus trying to be a jack of all trades, 86 mm -hmm. tools in your toolbox. Um, do you think part of that mastery is recognizing when that setup is really working in the environment you're in? Uh, for me, it might be a little bit more relevant just because the longer longer time frames, there can be like a technical theme that works versus you, it's like intraday. So setups might appear, you know, more frequently and, and all that, but. Right. So that's kind of talking about the hitting it big when you're seeing it. Right. Kind right. of aspect. Right. Um, the, when, when you're focused on one or two styles, I wouldn't say styles, I would say trades that you like, so to speak, yep. the trades that you do. Okay. It's easier to notice that because that's all you're looking for. Mm -hmm. If I go and tell you, Hey, by the way, like uh, this happened to me a couple of years ago. Someone was talking about this car called the Q, which I, I don't think I've ever seen in my life. Oh, you look at the car. It's the Q. I'm like, that's the ugliest car I've ever seen, right? Whatever. Mm -hmm. For the next like two weeks, all I saw were cubes on the highway. Like everywhere I looked, it was a cube. Yep. So it's the same thing. If you're looking at these two stop, I mean, two ways, like, two ways that you make money. And these are your mat, like your bread and butter. You're going to see those setups more because you're not busy with the other noise that you're okay at. Mm -hmm. you're, not, you're not worried about that. All you're looking for is what you're good at. Okay, and you'll see them clearer, more crystallized, and so you can hit them bigger, and you can make better trades in them, for sure. Yeah, perfect. Uh, let's see. Uh, keep the questions coming, everybody. If you have anything you'd like to ask John, uh, this is the perfect time to leave it in the chat. Uh, there's some good ones here. Let me find the next one. Let's see. Oh yeah, there's there's one from like, another one from Dan. Uh, does John have a specific max drawdown response plan uh, for different scenarios? So, I yes, I do actually. Um, one of that's a good question because every time I violated this plan, I've lost. So, and it's hard to some sort of losing streak. Everybody that goes on a losing streak is usually kind of custom fit for them, and it's usually the same way. It happens kind of always the same kind of way. Um, for me. If I have a, again, I'm going to use arbitrary numbers. If I have a day where I lose $150,000, okay? I take, I try to go flat, no overnight, start over, right? If I have a couple days where I lose over seventy five or $80,000, I'll cut my loss limit, let's say to 50 grand a day. You know what I'm saying? Or cut it, you know, keep myself from losing more money. Every time I have violated that, I've lost more every single time. So basically for me, I try to I try to cut back on the amount of money that I'm risking when things aren't going well. It's just that simple. I mean, risk less. There'll be time to risk more. I promise. There'll be time where you're seeing it and you will make a lot of money if you're trading well. There will be. They'll set up for you, no matter what kind of style. Um, but you got but you have to be able, you have to be able to kind of have it the powder dry you hear you know all these other people talk about on the cnbc about powder dry and all this stuff but it's true i mean you you need to have that uh, you can't you know 
you, you can't l- blow your count to smithereens in one week and be, you know, done for the year. I mean, that, you know, I mean, get up in the morning and, you know, think to yourself, you got to make this money back. Even though, again, that's not the, even the right mindset, but that's how you got to think. It's hard to train your brain to know that it's gone. That, that's, that's hard. I mean, think about it. If I take, you know, X amount of money from you and just put it in my pocket, oh, that money's gone. You don't have it anymore. You'd be like, well, what do you mean? I want my money back. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's what you're going to say. I mean, wouldn't anybody? So it, for me, it's it's cutting it's cutting my losses, having a lower number, maybe lightening up on overnights, putting myself in a position where I don't come in. You know, if I take a slate of overnights and I lose 100 grand and I have 10 million overnight, I walk in and I'm wrong. I'm down 150,000 immediately, one and a half percent immediately. Then what? How, you know, I'm down 250. Right. Instead of if I follow my rules, I went flat, I get a fresh start. And I don't put all that risk and capital at risk. And I can, you know, start again. Yeah. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you was, uh, you know, uh, Bella and uh, Brett mentioned a few times, you know, treating trading as a business. Uh, is there anything you want to add to, to maybe talk about how you treat trading like a business and maybe, you know, add to that perspective about, you know, why that's so, so important uh, if if you want to do this, you know, seriously and treat this seriously? Right. So it is a business. I mean, <laughs> no matter which way you look at it, I mean, you're not trading the trade. You don't just go out there to hit the button because it's fun. Mm-hmm. This this is your livelihood. This is how you get paid. Right. So, I mean, if you're going out there like, oh, yeah, I'm just going to throw some trades on because uh, I'm enjoying myself. I mean, that's. That's not being very professional. You know, you, you have, you know, plan, you know, if someone once told me, you know, uh, failing the plan is planning to fail. Okay. You you need to have plans in place. I mean, it, it, any good business has a business plan, right? They have a, a model that they follow, a profit, uh, a, 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 a way they can get uh, um, revenues and where they can grow their business to, to you know, make more money and to, and to be, a, you know, to, a, big, a bigger business in general. Um, it's the same as a trader. I mean, you need to grow your trading. It needs to grow. It needs to be, it's not, this is not a game. It, it seems like a game because it's fun if you like to trade, but it ain't a game. I mean, listen, you don't hit the reset button and get your money back. You know I mean? I, you know, it's not like PlayStation. You hit the button and all of a sudden you get your money back. You, you know, if you lose, you lose. And if you work for a firm, a prop firm, you lose your job. Yeah. And if you work for yourself, you lose your money. Right. So it has to be treated with the utmost respect. The money has to be treated. The it has to be treated as if it's a business because it is a business. It's a business of you making money, earning off the money capital that you have. You are using capital to earn capital, to earn profits. That's business. Yeah, perfect. And coming back to the doubt discussion, uh, Michael had a, a question about are you able to really eliminate doubt or can you just kind of minimize it and push it, I guess, to the back of your mind? Are you never minimizing doubt? I mean, to me, are you minimizing fear? Can you actually get rid of fear? I mean, can you, can, can, I mean, I guess there's some people who are like special forces or, or some kind of, or sort or some kind of like, like, I don't know, maybe one in a jillion or million or whatever that can actually have no fear at all. Mm-hmm. Hard to do. I'm not one of them. I mean, I'll be honest with you. I mean, there's always going to be fear that kind of, creeps in in some form. Um, doubt, you need to recognize doubt. Uh, doubt's a part of every trader, just like fear is. You need to recognize it. When you recognize it, you can handle it better. It's about handling the doubt. It's about handling the fear. It's about handling a situation that is is not good for you at that time, a situation that puts you in an uncomfortable spot. You have to be able to kind of, since you have the techniques or you have the knowledge that you know that exists and it's there, you can kind of arm yourself to help yourself in those spots, but it's never going away. I mean, I, I, I've never met a trader. I've never met a person that has zero fear in everything. I mean, and listen, again, money is a very emotional thing. I mean, you can't tell me that money doesn't, that people aren't attached to their money. I mean, I've seen people grab, hold on to money like it's the lifeblood of the world. I mean, that's emotional attachment. Everybody's attached in one way, shape, or form. That's why when people trade and they make money, it feels so good. You're right. The endorphins get run up. I mean, they're feeling nice. They're feeling great. You know, that's that's money. I mean, 
And that's that's the part that, that that's the emotional part. You never get rid of doubt. You never get rid of fear. You try to minimize it. You try to understand where it's coming from. You try to deal with it in the best way that you can to minimize your losses and or maximize gains by knowing that it's there. Because remember, losing less is actually making money, mm -hmm. which kind of sounds, you know, crazy, but it's true. Because like I said, you lose a couple bucks on the stock, yeah, you lost. You lose $23 on a stock, you lost more. And the amount of money that the $21 is actually money that you gained. And it's it, like, it's just a way you have, to, it's all about how you look at things. It's how you take the approach. What mental approach do you take? Okay, that's that's important. Perfect. And yeah, I like how you said that. And there are a few questions about uh, your how you set stop losses. Uh, the first is about uh, whether you have a maximum stop percentage you allow yourself to you allow yourself to have in a trade. Or and the second question was, do you use hard stops or mental stops when you when you put? Them so I, I use hard stops. Yeah. Um, um, I use hard stops just because I normally have numerous positions on, and if it gets to my hard stop, I'm wrong. I'm wrong. I mean, look, I mean, I, 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 again, FOMO, I'm not concerned if it bounces back up. I have top, I have bottom ticked many a stock. Mm -hmm. I have top ticked many a stock, good and bad. Okay. My job as a trader is not to top tick or bottom tick anything. People have to understand this. Okay. Your job is to cut out a swath, a slice of the movement that is happening in that stock over whatever time, over X time frame. Not has a five dollar range. I make two bucks. Fantastic. I'd be great. To me, thinking I'm going to sell a high tick and, and, and get out of the low tick, it's crazy. And if I get stopped out at the low tick, then so be it. I get stopped at a low tick. But I got news for you. I'm not worried about that piece of trash anymore. I'm not focused on that garbage position that I was in. It's gone. Time for me to look for stocks that are going to make me money, not stocks that I hope bounce back so I don't lose. Mental stops. I, some people like to use them because they think that they're stop hunting. You know, people are stop hunting your orders, maybe, but um, I'd rather just be done with the bad trade, to be honest. I'd rather just be cut it loose. It's gone. It's done. Move, move on. on. Yep. Yeah, move on. I mean, it, 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 the, the, again, you have a finite amount of resources, Rich, okay? You only have a certain amount. And if that losing position that I didn't get stopped out of or use my, mental, my hard stop is sucking up some of my mental resources that, by the way, are probably less than it worth 20 years ago, okay, then... It's just going to cost me money. Right. It's all about not costing me money. Right. Yeah. Great. Mm -hmm. We'll take a few more because we are running low on time. Uh, let's sure. see. Uh, another one from Dan. He's asked a really good question. So th thank you, Dan. Uh, for doubt slash fear, uh, have you ever tried to assign a value to it before entering a trade? So I guess try to quantify the emotions you're feeling or put them on a scale. The only way I would even think of doing that is saying a, a, a loss limit for the day. Um, you know, this is my loss limit today. If I hit this, I'm done. Um, it's kind of hard to quantify an emotion. I mean, I, I mean, it's not not. I mean, I, maybe AI will be able to do it in like six months, but for me, it's it, it, I, I gotta kind of be objective about that. I can't. Um, all like all I can do is that, like I said, manage money. Doubt and fear creep in, and I'm in a position. And I feel like I'm not trading well, or I feel like I'm about to, you know, I'm, I'm not seeing it right. Sometimes liquidating is the best thing. I know it sounds, or putting my stops in, just that's it. No more trades. I'm done trading for today. I'll let my stocks play out as they play out. Um, I think that is a, that works for me um, when I do it. Um, but to try to kind of put a, a, a money number, that that's just basically me just, the money number would be me just that's what i'm willing to risk today uh what well, could change during the day sure i mean let's say I, let's say i want to start with a fifty thousand dollar loss limit that's my loss limit and then i'm just not seeing it right i'm just i'm just making two or three my first three or four trades are awful okay just chasing or or timing poorly or 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 feeling like i'm i'm, I'm uneasy mm -hmm. even i cut it to twenty five thousand that day you know take adjust it on the fly yeah. Because I'm not seeing it today. Yeah. I'll do that. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because uh, Jared Tendler, who actually he kicked off day one, uh, he's a mental game coach. Uh, he wrote The Mental Game of Trading. 
and his process allows you to map your emotions on kind of a, a scale by noticing kind of the, the, the thoughts you're having, the, phil- the physiological, you know, you, you mentioned, you know, sweating, feelings of anger, jumpiness, antsiness, like tapping mm-hmm. your foot. And I think what that's doing is allowing you to bring it back to what you said, allowing you to realize when you're approaching the line in the sand, the, 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 the pain tolerance where you go numb after it and you recognize how close you are to that. You know, if you're just a little bit frustrated because you didn't execute super well to, you know, complete tilt, that type of thing. So I, I think that that's kind of yeah. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can, you yeah, I mean, but I think after time, you kind of, you'll know your body. It's kind of yeah. like, for instance, you know, anything with your body, like, like, like if you're sore because you worked out too hard or you did something, you know, you tweaked the knee or whatever it might be, it's going to tell you, your brain's going to let you know. You know what I'm saying? Again, when you're a neophyte trader or a new trader, you don't have that because you don't have the experiences yet, right? right? You have, your brain has something to build on. But as you trade over time, you, you know, this thing's pretty powerful. It remembers stuff. You know what I'm saying? Whether you know it or not. It remembers feelings. It remembers uh, uh, all those fears and doubts and those happy times and those good trades. It remembers everything. Again, you may not be able to call it out by saying, what what you make in November of 2017 on, on IBM? You know, I mean, well, what are you talking about? But you will know that you're in a situation where you have positions on and you have a feeling of, oh, you know, this doesn't look so good. You know what I'm saying? I mean, that's you brain telling you that all the knowledge and, and know how you've learned. It's feedback. Yeah. Is that what it is? Perfect, John. Uh, unfortunately, we're just out of time. Thank you so much for. Well, oh, sure, this. my I, pleasure. Thank you for having me. Yeah, of course. I, I think people I hope really I was got able to add some. I hope I was able to add some value, and uh, you know, maybe people have learned some things, or maybe they just rehashed other things, or you know. Either way, I think it's really important. Um, is there any advice that you'd like to leave everybody with? Any any last uh, last last bits about risk management? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. So for new traders, you need to be patient. Okay, new traders, it will come. All right. If you have a, a technique that works for you, okay, mentally, the mental aspect of it and money, money management, obviously you need to learn right away. Okay. That, 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 as you learn how to trade, you need to learn how to manage money. Okay. Hand in hand right away, hundred percent. The mental part will take some time. It will take some time. It will take some experiences. It will take some situations that you're in that are uncomfortable and that are good. And, it will, you'll build, you'll build almost, I would say a data bank of, of mental feelings, I'll call them. Okay. To kind of guide you and help you in times of doubt and fear that we talked about. And in times of boom times where things, you know, you, everything looks like a beach ball. For the experienced trader. Okay. If you seem to be having big drawdowns or seem to be having the times where you can't seem to earn, listen to yourself more, give yourself a break. You know what I'm saying? When I say give yourself a break, I don't mean stop trading. I mean, give yourself a break. Don't try to be 100% perfect all the time. You're not going to be able to, okay? Use the odds in your favor to be able to make money in the long run so you can last in this business. Because the only way you last is to have not just money management and a good technique, but good mental facilities to be able to bounce back when things are tough because they will get tough. You will lose. You will have drawdowns. You will act, it'll, it may be parts of your time if you're in it long enough that I can't do this anymore. That, it's coming, mm-hmm. okay? But if you're mentally tough enough, okay, and you use some of the tools that I talked about and listen to yourself, you'll get through them. I, I'm convinced of it. And that's, that's what I would say. Yeah. Well, John, thanks again for, for taking the time to do this. I, I really enjoyed this, and I think everybody did as well. Uh, if you did find value and you're finding value in the conference, uh, please consider uh, leave a like down below, subscribe to the channel. And also at this point, you know, uh, please go ahead and donate to St. Jude's if you haven't already and learned a lot over these four days. It's a really worthy cause. Uh, and with that, John, just one last thank you to you. Um, I, I think this is really yeah, valuable. Yeah, of course. And uh, we'll be right back with Tom Basso at 5 p.m. Uh, so stay tuned. And uh, yeah, we'll be right back. Take care. Thank you, Rich.
Okay, welcome back everybody for the last, but uh, what you know, it's going to be one of my favorite presentations with Tom. Uh, one of the last presentations of the conference to wrap up things nicely. Uh, Tom, of course, was featured in Market Wizards. Uh, he was dubbed Mr. Serenity, as I'm sure you'll you'll understand why as soon as he gets talking. If if you haven't uh, uh, listened to him before, a nice calmness and and loads and loads of experience. So, uh, Tom, it, it's always great chatting with you, and uh, as always, I'm really looking forward to your presentation. Yeah, thanks, Richard. It's always fun to, to be interviewed by you. You ask some interesting questions over time. Well, thanks for allowing me the chance to be one of your speakers. And uh, I guess I'm the last one. So maybe you saved the best for last. I don't know. But we'll uh, we'll try to live up to that billing. And um, I'm, I suspect that depending on how many of these speakers you've listened to, all, all of you get listening out there, You've had uh, speakers give you their favorite setups, perhaps. You've probably get, had people talk about their theories about what makes the market tick. Uh, you've probably heard some of their strategies that they use to try to make money. And they probably, some of them have given their thoughts on the current situation in the markets or the economy or where they think it's going to go. And some of them were covering markets that you've either never heard of or perhaps don't even trade. So it's probably been a, a broad mix. I mean, you've had four days and lots and lots of speakers. So there's lots, a lot there to take in. And a lot of traders I find, uh, you know, on Twitter or Facebook, they, they get almost overwhelmed by so much information. And what I'm going to try to do is maybe help you kind of distill all that down to what might be useful to you. And uh, I'm going to talk about what is a complete trading strategy, because a lot of the things you've heard might be pieces of a trading strategy, but you need to fill in the, the pieces. I'll try to give you a little indication of what I think that might be. I'll encourage you along the way, as bizarre as it seems, to not duplicate another trader strategy to trade your own money. And I'll give you the reasons why. I'll encourage you to never predict what the market's going to do next, because good trading is being in the flow, being in the now, getting it done day after day flawlessly. Trying to predict where the market will be, you know, six months or 12 months from now. If you can do it, good for you. I've never been able to do it. And I think I'm a successful trader. So I'll encourage you to not predict. And I'll try to explain how I use all weather concepts in trading my own money so that you can use that as an example only of what you might, you might come up with something similar, something, you know, maybe you pick up a, a certain aspect of what I'm doing and you modify it for your own needs. I just use it as throwing out examples and stimulating your brain. So with that, why don't we uh, share the uh, start screen here, if I can. Yep, let's see. From and right while, there. And while Tom's you... doing that, uh, throughout the the presentation, if you guys have any questions whatsoever, uh, just drop them in the chat, and we'll have uh, plenty of time for a Q and A uh, after his presentation. So, Richard, are you seeing the uh, the title? Uh, not just yet. Did you click the okay. share screen uh, button and in I... Zoom? I got to do some other share screen here. Let me see what's what's going on. Yeah, no worries. Take your time. And uh, while share that's going on, uh, if you're enjoying the conference, please consider leaving a like down below. It uh, really helps YouTube let basically lets them know it's a valuable resource that will push to other traders. And Tom, I just saw that pop up. So just go ahead. Go ahead to, there we go. There we go. Well, we called it all weather trading. And... <laughs> This is my wife and I, uh, my, the graphic we came up with, uh, all the bizarre things that get thrown at you in the markets coming at you and attacking risk by getting that umbrella up there and bouncing all those lines up into the right, which is what all traders like to see with their equity curve. So that was our depiction of what all weather trading means. Uh, and certainly the markets are pretty good at throwing you some difficult uh, times. So... Why would anybody want to copy another trader? Well, you know, all right, you take me as an example. I've been doing this for almost 50 years. People know of me through Market Wizards and Trend Falling Mindset and the All Weather Trader book and everything else. And they see me on Twitter and I seem to make sense. I seem to be successful. So 
if I could copy Tom Basso, that would be great, wouldn't it? It's easy. Uh, I've already figured it out. So a lot of these traders that did, that they're very famous traders that talked the last uh, three days and even including today, they've kind of figured out how to make money and how to protect risk. Some of them have made a gazillion dollars. They've been doing it for decades, you know, in my case, almost five. So why wouldn't you just copy somebody? That makes sense, doesn't it? No, it doesn't. All traders are unique. Each has a different amount of capital, different time to develop and research strategies. If you're working full time and you're trying to develop an extensive trading strategy, well, you're going to have to do it at night after dinner. You're going to have to get up early in the morning, do it maybe Saturdays, Sundays. You got to, how much time do you have? Well, I'm retired. I could take every day and spend 12 hours a day if I felt like it. I don't have a job I have to go to. So each person has different amounts of time available. Each person has a different amount of time each day. Even I in retirement, I have a lot about 40 to 45 minutes a day to do trading. Uh, I don't have all day. Uh, a lot of days I'm doing a bunch of other things in retirement that I would like to do or my wife schedules me to do or whatever, but you only have so much time. You got to work your, your what you're doing around your situation. Different skill levels. I've got a computer background, engineering, chemical engineering, heavy math skills. Uh, so that's my skill levels. Other people might have, you know, uh, floor experience or other things that I don't have. And each person is unique in that regard. They have different levels of skills. You have different risk tolerance. You know, I'm in retirement. Some of you out there might be 20 something years old and got a nice salary coming in every day. So your situation and mine in terms of risk tolerance might be very, very different. I don't want to go back and manage money again. I'm 70 years old. I'm enjoying retirement, so I have to set my risk tolerances that way. So what I'm doing is interesting, perhaps, but it isn't something that maybe you should be doing. Different tools. Um, every one of us has got certain uh, levels of automation, let's say, certain broker uh, platforms that you're relying on to give you your indicators, maybe, or do your executions. Well, they aren't the same. Uh, I use interactive brokers a lot, but I also have my wife's account over at Schwab. I have different brokers that I have to deal with, different setups, different in terms of uh, the screens. And uh, you have to deal with what you have to draw on, and it's unique to you. So when you start looking at all of this and you start uh uh, you know, thinking about it, it's illogical for anybody to try to copy anybody else because everybody's different. You got a different financial puzzle uh, you're trying to solve for yourself. So most traders approach it backwards. And this is what you'll have a tendency to do after some great talks like you've heard over the last four days. They hear about a great strategy. You got a famous person talking about it. You try to replicate it. So you kind of figure out the math or the logic or you find the indicator on your broker platform. Then you try to test it. It might be nothing more than just going back in time and saying, OK, well, this Keltner band here looks interesting. Let's go back and see where the signals would be. And, you know, you have enough history that you can get a couple of years in there and say, yeah, you know, this works pretty good. I think I'm going to see if I can do something. And then all of a sudden you try to trade it live. And then for some reason, you can't seem to make it work. <laughs> and you can't put your finger on why and you abandon it. And then you hear about another great strategy and you repeat the process. That happens so much out there. And it's, it's sad that it does. So how should you approach it? Well, this is a little more difficult to explain completely, but I'm going to try to to explain it, and I'm going to give you a little exercise in a moment to help you try to do your own. So get a piece of paper and pencil handy uh, so that you might uh, play along with the talk. Uh, start with your objective and personal inventory. In other words, Tom Basso has a certain amount of math skills, a certain amount of computer skills. I can program in this language. I can't program in that language. Just write it down. Describe yourself as if you're starting out a business 
what what are you what what are you trying to achieve with your business what is your personal inventory of skills and flaws and weaknesses and everything put it all down then develop your own trading strategy that fits your profile your capital your skills and your personality if i'm trading millions in my money why would you try to take 50,000 and try to trade the same way i do it's not possible it's kind of dumb to even think that you could, right? It doesn't make any mathematical sense. On the other hand, there's things that a person with 50,000 can do that I might not be able to do because you can slip in and out of small stocks with 100 shares and nobody cares. And if I try to take a meaningful position in it, I start moving the market. So you have an advantage over me in certain situations. So try to capture your situation and, and that starts the process of creating a trading strategy. Now execute that strategy that's designed for you flawlessly and with ease. If you've got the time figured out, you've got backups figured out, you've got, you understand completely your buy sell engines and you've got good position sizing and you fit your profile and risk profile perfectly. Well, then it's going to, it's, it's like having the glove that fits the hand. It's just perfect. And it's a lot easier to be your own Mr. Serenity because everything seems to be flowing um, the way you would like it because it's designed for your situation. So here's an exercise to do uh, while I'm talking. And I'll uh, uh, pick on myself and show you a little bit about my situation. So we're going to make a personal inventory of yourself in this exercise. And if you want, when I show you the next screen, hit Windows the Windows key, uh, if you're on an IBM a, a keyboard, or, and then a shift and S, or whatever way you can capture your screen and print it down, and you can write your own answers on it. So here's just a, you know, a number of different things that you should consider when you're trying to do your own personal inventory. First of all, you're psychological. Are you, um, I don't know, do you want a lot of action, or do you want to make as few trades as possible in terms of where are you on the mental side of things? Uh, are you are you a uh, a details person or a big picture guy? Are you a uh, you know a nervous Nelly all the time and always thinking of the negatives, or are you a pie eyed optimist that that just always thinks things are going to be great? How much capital are you going to trade? Risk objectives. What's your maximum drawdown that you think you could tolerate, and how long? Would the longest drawdown have to click along? You know, you're talking six months, you're talking a year, two years. At some point, you're going to get bored and say, this isn't working. I want something else. So how much patience do you have, uh, so to speak, there? Return objectives. What are you looking for to try to make? Uh, because some people are trying to make more than others. Uh, and returns versus benchmarks is critical to some people because they feel like that gives them some kind of a way of comparing themselves to some group out there. Style of trading, there's lots. I mean, you can trend follow, you can swing trade, you can mean reversion, you can come up with any number of other things. I remember seeing one, one trading strategy that was all about the phase of the moon. I mean, those, I don't dismiss any of them. Dismiss any of them. They're just different ways of trading and, you know, whatever fits you. Direction, do you want to be long only? Do you want to be short only? Or do you want to go both ways? Uh, people will have their certain biases there. Time frames, do you want to day trade, short term trade, maybe on the order of a couple days? Or do you want to maybe go out 21 days or more and get into the months and maybe weekly charts? You're a busy guy, you travel all the time. You can only look at your stuff on Saturday morning. And so you're going to use weekly charts and trade for very long-term positions, maybe. Skills, computer, math, markets, time availability, all these different things that go into that. So write down your own. And while you're doing that, I'm going to show you mine. So psychologically, well, I'm a seasoned veteran of 50 years. Capital, more than I need, millions. Risk objectives. Believe it or not, I I have enough money where if I add another million dollars, it isn't going to change my life. So 10% to me, 
I'm happy with that uh, on, a, on a risk basis because I don't want to go back to work and I want to keep preserve my uh, my balances where they are. Longest drawdowns, I, I pretty much can stand a year. I'm not, if it starts stretching out beyond that, it gets a little old. Uh, return objectives, 10 to 15% is fine with me. If, if I make a little less than that, it's not going to kill me. If I make a little more than that, you know, it's fine. Uh, the account gets bigger. I just have to manage a bigger account size. No big deal. I, it's it's not going to change anything. Returns versus, versus benchmarks. Because I do so many types of strategies, I'm not sure what benchmark I would even use. I really don't care about benchmarks. I care about keeping the return to risk of my own account as high as I can make it. And whatever that is, it is. Uh, benchmarks can do whatever they want. Style of trading. I'm basically largely a trend follower, I would say. And there's a tiny bit of mean reversion in some of my uh, credit option spreads that I do, but not a, that's not a super material part of my portfolio. So I would say you could label me a trend follower pretty much. I like to go both directions. I see no reason if crude oil is going negative in price, I want to be short crude oil. I don't care uh, where it is, what price it is. I happy to go both ways. Time frames. I like to do as many time frames as I can because different time frames have different uh, profit opportunities and each one carries its own return to risk structure. But uh, having all the time frames uh, is fun because you might have a long term position going long and you might have a very short term one trying to trade a, a pullback and they're offsetting each other. So the the strategies are sort of fighting each other and keeping you uh, controlling your risk very, very well. But when they all line up, oh, that's very profitable. Skills. I have computer math, position sizing. I wrote a book on position sizing. Flexible time. I, I can somewhat do research at certain times all day. And then there's other days when I can't do any research at all, but I do have some ability to schedule my time. I, I agreed to do this talk because I knew I had the free time this afternoon and I like Richard and uh, uh, support what he's doing. And as far as I'm concerned, having the ability to do some of these things is part of the problem. Some people are just too busy and you try to grab something quick and easy and you're not really doing a proper job of uh, getting ready to trade. So here's, this is me, kind of. And you're going to have your own decisions. And obviously, we can't have go around the table and have everybody say what their their uh, their answers were. But uh, think through this. Uh, you don't have to have it finished by now, but it's really important. Because once you have this, you now know what you're looking for. It, it's like taking a trip on vacation. If you don't have the map in your final destination in the GPS or on the map, how the heck are you going to get there? You just shooting off in all directions and it would be amazing if you got there. So why would anyone want to trade exactly like me? It would be insane. You're not me. So develop your own strategies. So if you're going to develop a strategy, you got to know what a strategy is. So I wrote this flow chart down because in my mind, this seems to cover all the aspects of what I have to do to have a complete trading strategy. So if we start up in, in the top here, if we're doing like stock screenings, we'd look at various correlations, diversifications, we'd screen stocks maybe. Maybe we have too many stocks in the screening, so we have to rank them. We get a portfolio that we're gonna trade. We maybe have various buy-sell engines. By buy-sell engines, I mean an engine in a car drives the car. A buy-sell engine in trading drives the trader. It gets them to buy or sell. So it could be something as simple as a moving average. It could be a Keltner Bands. It could be Dunson's. It could be Bollinger's. It could be any one of a number of other indicators that motivate the trader to say, now I'm in an up direction and I need to take action and buy something. You can run simulations up here in the upper left of all of this once you have a portfolio selection and some buy-sell engines and get a sense of uh, how fast is this thing going to move? What kind of leverage makes sense for me, given my profile that I just completed on the previous couple slides? 
Sizing your initial position, if you need help with that, my $10 book on position sizing is a really good value. Uh, I got the formulas in there, the way I actually size my positions, and it's available on the enjoytheride.world website if you uh, want to go there and uh, and pick up a copy. But it's keeping your position size consistent over all of types of conditions. And when I made 103% back in 2020 with the COVID and versus right now, I'm doing exactly the same thing. I'm sizing my positions exactly the same way. And I'm actually slightly, I mean, like down 1% or something for the last 12 months right now. So that's, you know, 103% down one doing the same thing. But staying consistent allows you to be able to uh, have that proper bet size every single trade. And you got to have a way to do that. You got to execute your positions. That's sometimes tough for people. They get, they want to override it. They're worried about the market. They're doing this and that and the next thing. And they can't, uh, they mess it up. Um, ongoing position size is important. If you're in a position, especially longer term traders for six months, nine months, 12 months, Hey, 12 months out, that position and your portfolio are going to be different than they were when you bought them. You might want to think about ways of constantly ongoing uh, inside the trade, checking your position sizes as you move your stops, as you're able to lock in more profits. Is the, is the situation with risk and your attacking of risk remaining the same or is it changing? And you should slightly change your position size or change uh, how you um, manage that position and execute the position judgments. And then this whole lower right is, is the most important thing of all, your mental side, your self-responsibility, your self-awareness, your disciplines, your mental states, contingency planning. If the internet goes down, the power gets lost, the computer breaks, the your monitor goes out, what's your backup plan? If you have that and something happens, then it's no big deal. You just go to plan B, you just keep running. If you haven't even thought of any of that and any of this happens, it's high stress, it's an ulcer, it's um, you're not having a good day. So this is what, in my mind, is a complete trading strategy. And if you don't have all of these things, then I would encourage you to look at what you don't have and see if you can't uh, create something a little bit more uh, compelling in that area, because it'll help you out um, on, on the flow of the whole process. So if you're going to be an all-weather trader, like I think I am, uh, you're going to need to check every box of this complete trading strategy. You're going to have the discipline to execute that strategy. You're going to have to have a plan uh, to go up, down, and sideways markets. If you are uh, an upside trader and timing out, let's say, let's say you buy mutual funds in your 401k and you go to cash when you go to a down market because they don't have any vehicle to exploit a down market. Okay, well then you have a plan. Up market, I go long. Down market, I go to cash. Sideway market, I probably get whipsawed a bit. But that's a plan and you understand the goods and bads of each type of market and you have a plan. It may not be the smoothest of equity curves, and maybe that's the limitation of how your 401k is set up, but you at least have a plan. So the stress gets a lot lower. You're able to execute it. It just makes a lot more sense. Anticipate various risks with your strategy. Like I just said, if you're in a down market and you're going to cash in a 401k, fine. You've attacked the downside risk by getting out of the downside risk and going to something like cash, which doesn't have that same risk. That's a way of attacking risk. So let's talk about attacking risk versus avoiding risk. When you're uh, on offense, you're far more in control. If you, if you think about just a simple football game in the NFL, the quarterbacks up there changing the plays at the line and Guys are going down the field and they're doing all sorts of fancy patterns. And the defense is not sure what the offense is doing and is trying to react as best they can. 
isn't it a little easier for you to be trying to pick apart the defense than the defense trying to do something that anticipates what you're going to do because you'll never be able to do that perfectly. So I like to think of attacking risk as being on offense and, and trying to avoid risk as being on defense. And I'd always prefer to rather be on offense. So I like to try to look for risk and, and come up with a way to attack it. So here, there's a number of ways of attacking risk, and I cover a lot of this in uh, the All Weather Trader, the book that just came out about a month or six weeks ago or something. And uh, these are kind of my own, solving my own financial puzzle, ways that I've been able to um, keep my portfolio calm and solid and and somewhat keep the risk away through many bear markets and all sorts of sideways periods. And the, the easiest one I can think of that I came up with first was just simply to, you know, I was trading mutual funds a long time ago. I just set up some trend following models and whenever the market went to a down direction, I get out of it. So go to cash, no big deal, make interest. That's an easy one. And Timing examples you could take, like what I do as a sector ETF. I have 30 different sectors of various ETFs, exchange traded funds. Uh, and I use uh, my favorite trend following indicators to go uh, long in up directions or move to cash in down directions. It's really simple. I can't believe anybody out there listening to this couldn't adopt aspects of that for their own portfolio if they want to. Hedging, this is a, I get a lot of questions on hedging. Uh, I have an entire page on the website dedicated to exactly how I hedge because so many people ask me, I got tired of answering the emails and saying the same things over and over again. So I just wrote a whole page and that should answer just about any question you have about how I hedge. Now, do you need to copy that? No. Let's say you have a portfolio of tech stocks. I'm using the S&P 500 futures hedge to hedge with. You might use the NASDAQ because that's a little bit more tech oriented. So there'd be a better match of the hedge to what your portfolio looks like. So don't just mindlessly copy. Think through what you're trying to do with the hedge and use mine as an example to stimulate your brain and, and come up with your own uh, unique solution. Stocks. Uh, use a trend following indicator on screen stocks candidates to time out of stocks that are headed in a down direction so that you then free up that cash and maybe you screen a new stock that uh, maybe is a little bit more timely and, and taking off at this point. So those are all examples of attacking risk with timing. So my favorite timing indicators, which a lot of people always want to know uh, and ask me on Twitter or whatever, and these are all, you can look up investopedio.com and all of these are, are really standardized indicators. Most trading platforms from brokers We'll have these as pretty standard indicators that you can use. Keltner uses average true range, which is a measure of volatility, to adjust top and bottom noise band limits to an exponential moving average that's in the middle of all the price action. And it changes the indicator on the fly with changing volatility, which is why I like it so much. It's not static. It's changing all the time. Dunchin, max and min price over a look back period. So if you think about what that is doing, when you have wide ranges and lots of volatility, the Dunchin bands are gonna be wider. And when you have uh, tight, boring, nobody cares markets, the uh, Dunchin max and mins are gonna be a lot closer together. So again, it's changing with changing market conditions. Bollinger's, they use a standard deviation as a measure of volatility to adjust the top and bottom noise band limits to an exponential moving average. And it, again, changes. So smaller standard devi deviation with smaller volatility means tighter bands and the ability to uh, be more sensitive to very tiny movements. And markets going crazy, big standard deviation, wide bands give the market more room. I like indicators like that that have a... Uh, uh, an aspect of changeability to them so they can change with the markets. And what it helps do is keep the indicator a bit more robust over time, different market conditions. 
So this applies to all timing indicators. You can use them over whatever time period suits your own situation. So in my case, I tend to trade uh, some intraday stuff on five minute bars. I trade some, one of my strategies is like three days or less. And another one is 21. I use a lot and I have some that's out in 50 days. And I like that because I pick up different moves in the markets using different uh, time periods. But your situation is different than mine. If you don't want to do trades every day, then you want to get your time period out a little bit more and keep your life a little easier on the trading and execution side. You can use one or more at a time. I like to use Bollinger's, Donchins, and um, Kellner's together, and I take the first one hit. It's just the way I have been trading the last few years and I, I feel comfortable doing that. It works for me. You can take one or more. You can create other ones in conjunction with those that I mentioned. Custom design it so that you understand it and it feels comfortable to you. You should have a timing indicator that sets risk. One of the problems I have with moving averages, although I know they work over the long run uh, and you could do that and make money, I like to have a place where I set the get out point. Um, and when I do stuff like Donchins, where I'm buying the top line and I'm selling the bottom line, it's giving me a fixed risk that I then can use to size my positions. By doing a moving average, if you think about it, if you have two, av two averages that are crossing each other and that's a buy signal, where exactly do you put your, your stop loss? Do you just pick a number out of the air and say 5% or you need some way of doing that. And I, I like the ability to have the indicator give me both sides of the trade, the getting in and getting out. It should be crystal clear where you get in and out. Whatever timing indicator you do, you need to have a, a buy sell engine to motivate you to buy and sell. And if it's not crystal clear, then it gets a little bit judgmental. Then you start having a bad day and you just, I'm not going to trade today or I don't feel comfortable with this or the market doesn't look good or whatever. You come up with a million excuses to screw up the strategy. Don't do that. Make a strategy so it's crystal clear. You need to get in at 30.52 on a stop, good till cancel. You, know, you should be able to say that. You should understand the math completely. Don't, don't do Bollinger's if you don't understand what a standard deviation is. is because then you don't have the confidence to trust the indicator. Um, if you can deal with just looking back in time and doing a, a donchon, we'll do a donchon. That's easy to understand. And it's going to get you in and out roughly in the same uh, general area. So extreme diversification is another way that we have to, um, to deal with uh, risk and attacking risk. And what you're doing here is purposely adding such diversification and non-correlation that no one part of your portfolio can sink your ship. You're just spreading the risk all over the place. Now, the portfolio selection and allocation when you're trying to select items that move independently of the rest of the portfolio has gotten over my lifetime a whole lot more difficult than it was back in, say, 1974 when I came out of college. What's happened, uh, perfect correlations of 1.0 or a 100, it means everything moves exactly like each other. Perfect negative correlation is minus 1 or minus 100. This means that one goes up, the other one goes down by the same percent. What you really want when you're putting together a portfolio is a non-correlation or a zero. You want each item in the portfolio to just go their own way. And sometimes they'll go the same way as another instrument. Sometimes they'll go opposite direction. That gives you true diversification and smooths out everything. Here's the major stock markets. I pulled this in June of 2022, but it's only gotten closer and closer over time. So I wouldn't expect the numbers to be too much different. But as you can see on this left column, you're looking at uh, all these different markets around the world. Well, remember 1.0 is a perfect correlation. So the Russell 2000 
compared to the Russell 2000 is a one, as it should be. But when it's compared to the NASDAQ, it's 0.96, which is almost one. And if you really glance down all of these, what's some of the lowest is like 0.56, maybe the Seoul and the Nikkei are 0.45. There's a whole bunch of them that are, you know, 0.7 or higher. So you're getting tremendous correlation. So trading around the world uh, in stocks, it's very difficult to, to find a place to hide. On the other hand, I just took some futures markets because I also trade futures. And so if you don't know these tickers, I'll go right across top pay top line is crude oil, natural gas, wheat, soybeans, gold, silver, lumber, uh, live cattle, lean hogs, and Japanese yen. Now look at these numbers. There's, there's some that are negative, some that are, uh, you know, around zero, minus 0 0.05, minus 0 0.03, minus 0.12, plus 0 0.10. There's lots of, that's what you're looking for when you're looking for extreme diversification. Because basically, uh, you know, gold or lumber, let's say, doesn't care what crude oil is doing in any one day. They're different markets affected by different aspects of life and uh, they're gonna go their own direction. And isn't that what you're looking for when you're trying to attack risk? So basically there's grains, energies, financials, metals, meats, sauce, indexes and currencies, lots of different ways you can go. And by the way, for those who think they don't know anything about futures, I was not born with a knowledge of futures. It's a learned skill. You, CME has all sorts of educational tutorials. There's books on it. And now to help the, the small trader uh, get into some of these things, the micro and mini futures contracts that a lot of the exchanges are coming up with where instead of trading a full crude oil, you can now trade a mini crude oil and get a smaller contract size so you can get you can participate in a way in a smaller portfolio and still pull it off and make all the math work you don't need to be trading uh you know with a million two million dollars to pull this off sideways market let's think about that we got sideways markets in my estimation happen somewhere around 60 percent of the time in terms of the stock market over the last 40 to 50 years that's more than half of the time, you're kind of going nowhere. Uh, you're moving and you're getting chopped maybe, but you're not ending up anywhere. <laughs> you're just coming back to where you were. So by adding strategies that are likely to profit from markets that don't move, that's a useful function 60% of the time kind of. So what I've done there for myself, and I, this is just an example of timing, and how with all these ovals, I pointed on the top line to the various sideways markets that didn't really go anywhere. And in every one of the cases, you can see the equity curve for a timing strategy goes down. So sideways timing, not a good thing. They fight each other and you get whipsawed a little bit. This strategy I use once a week. It's simple to do. Uh, I do I, I, I look uh, at something like an RSI, RSI stochastic and I measure whether the, the market is overbought or oversold. If it's overbought, I try to sell a call spread. If it's oversold, I try to sell a put spread. It's a credit spread. I have a limited loss, so I can't lose an infinite amount of money. And if the market doesn't go anywhere, Generally speaking, all of the credit spreads require uh, expire worthless and I net all that money. So the reliability of this type of strategy, especially during a sideways market is extremely high. I, I've had stretches where maybe I'm up in the 80, 85% reliable. Now, if you get a trending market, this is not a lot of fun because you're gonna take your uh, prescribed losses on the option spread. But I have, nine strategies and many of them are trend following. And when the markets are trending and I'm losing money with this type of strategy, I'm cleaning up other places. So I don't mind. So I blended these things together to, uh, to make it all work. Uh, here's a sideways, another sideways, uh, you go so short term 
that you end up with dancing around the noise bands. So in this case, I took a simple three indicator. So it'd be Bollinger, uh, Donchen, and uh, Keltner. And I did it with three days and no filters. And I did do position sizing like I always do. But when I do that run and you look at the uh, various ratios that came in here, look at, I mean, you've got Sertino ratios are improving. You got average drawdown getting a lot less. You have an MAR ratio uh, that's less than that. You got a maximum drawdown that's a lot less. You've got a certain reliability because you're having to buy and sell. You do have a positive profit factor, but when you're adding it all together, look at here, you've got improvement of the total return. You've got an improvement of the sharp, improvement of Sartino, maximum drawdown improvement, and you've made more money. I mean, those, that's a simple example of something that is trying to take a known risk and by blending in another strategy, you all of a sudden have the ability to uh, buffer your risk and improve your return to risk ratios. And I call that filling the pothole. It's a term I'll have to credit with Lawrence Bensdorf over in Portugal. And he used the term and it just fit me. I just hit my brain and I said, that's perfect. Here's the equity curve and I've shaded some of the potholes. And everybody's driven on roads around you with your automobiles knows what a pothole is. Just not a fun experience to go into the pothole. Your tires do not like it. And if you could somehow come up with strategies that end up help, helping to fill that pothole, it's a good mental image of what you're trying to achieve by using some multiple strategies and trying to develop ways of stabilizing your equity curve so it doesn't have those long and extended uh, downward spikes. And if you're adding new strategies, ask yourself, when you look at the pothole and drill down in there, what exactly is causing that pothole? Is there a particular strategy that you're doing? Is it Was it one stock that you bought that created the pothole? What You got to analyze it, dig down deep, find out in dollars and cents and return where the heck the pothole came from. And ask yourself, what kind of strategy can be developed that would likely make a profit during that same market condition? Figuring that over time in the future, there's going to be similar, not precisely the same, but similar market conditions. So if it's a, let's say a drawdown for a timing strategy that's long only going to cash, what could you come up with that might make money during that down period? Well, maybe it could be a hedging strategy and that would make money when the markets go down and lose money when the market goes up. So now you're starting to see, oh, wait, that would that would take that little drawdown that I'm suffering and maybe turn it into a break even, flatten it out, maybe even make a profit if it was a bear market that lasted for a long period of time. So use your um, your human brain and creativity and develop things that will help you out when you're suffering those uh, potholes. Develop the logic, the time period, position sizing for the new strategy. If it's a drawdown that's going to last for a long period of time, maybe your time period could be a little longer. If they're quick and fast and abrupt time period uh, drawdowns and potholes, then maybe you need to keep your time periods a little bit on the smaller side. Um, test it however you can with your capabilities. If, if nothing else, get on your broker platform and pull a chart up and go back and kind of look at signals in the past and see how you feel about them. Uh, if you can get a more automated situation, fine, use it. Determine what percent of your total portfolio the new strategy will get. You know, I mean, is it 50-50? Uh, or is that going to cause the new strategy you're bringing in to sort of overwhelm the first strategy that you're using? And play with different types of percents so that you kind of feel like they're both contributing to the risk and to the reward somewhat equally and and you'll get a little bit more balance going on in your portfolio and then when you're all ready to go add it into the suite of your uh, trading strategies and if you've done your job right and you've made it very easy to do or automated it even you can get to the point where you could add 
you know, I've got nine strategies. Uh, six of them are automated. The seventh one is going automated on Tuesday, I'm told. We'll see if that happens. But, um, you know, it's, again, automating a strategy is nothing more than finding some computer guy that you can describe what you want and they go out and, and build it for you. And uh, so you can, even if you don't know um, computer programming, you can do some things to help yourself. Let's uh, talk about rebalancing between positions and strategies. So here you got a situation and you got multiple strategies because you're trying to offset those potholes. Well, one strategy is doing very well. The other one's losing money. How do you resolve that? You've got an equity figure that maybe stayed the same. What I do is I once I've decided on how much of a portfolio I'm going to put on each strategy, I let the daily work that I do always be based off of the total equity. And that flows down to a percent to the strategy and it flows down to each position in the strategy. And that way, ongoing, I'm already kind of rebalancing and taking money from some of the more successful strategies and feeding it into the ones that have not been as successful lately. Hopefully that shifts and uh, the ones that uh, with market conditions change and these strategies that have been struggling all of a sudden become the heroes. They've got plenty of money to be able to do their job. And I've taken something off the table of those that have uh, already done their job. And when I was at Trendstat back in the money management days, uh, uh, retired in 2023 uh, or 2003, uh, Trendstat did it every day. So we'd have every account, we'd know what the equity was and all the strategies underneath it would just get their allocations. And that's how we sized all our positions. And this is interesting and I put it in red because I can't say this enough. And I've said it a lot of times, I've not had anybody I've had people debate me as to whether this is an important thing to do, but I've never had anybody show me that it isn't what I said here. I, all my studies show that rebalancing always, in caps, improves the return to risk. And I'm a return to risk type of guy. I'm a retired guy. I want to keep my risk down and maximize my return to risk. I am not a let's go out and try to make 100% this year type of trader. I'm just not, and I know myself, don't want that. So think about this in terms of your portfolio and whether or not you want to try to go after return to risk or are you, are you just looking for the maximum amount of money you can make. So the mental side of trading is very important. And most of you know by now probably that um, Jack Schwager tagged me with Mr. Serenity and I've been Mr. Serenity for about the last 30 years now, I guess. And maybe in the future, I'll be known as the all-weather trader. I don't know. Maybe I'll have a new nickname. But um, the mental side of trading is the most important. And, and why would that be? Well, that's pretty simple. Any trader, including an automated trader, can mess up the trading. You can override it. You can turn the computers off or you can say, ah, this is... This is the seventh trade in a row. This isn't working anymore. Whatever. There's ways you can do it. And the markets are going to test you psychologically in every possible way they can figure out how to, how to do it. You will end up being tested. If you have a weak spot, the market will find it. So you've got to get good control of your own mental balance, your your ability to have patience, the ability to maybe do nothing if it's appropriate to do nothing, uh, the ability to move quickly without almost even thought um, to uh, to pull off a trade and make, make it happen because it's time to do it and not a second from now, now. And so mental side is really, really important. And then here's the other thing I, I talk about a lot. I, I kind of almost sound like I'm preaching on it sometimes, I think, at least to me. Social media predictions, just ignore them. Uh, here, here's an example of just some Twitter thing, and I blanked out um, the names so that we don't embarrass anybody. But 
you read this Canadian sectors on TSX looks like they may be turning to the upside, except for healthcare, especially Canadian financials and real estate. The spies futures don't look terrible either. Definitely looking short-term bullish to me made a long entry into Fry uh, on Friday before the close. Same person never use the word deaf again when talking about the market. Nothing is ever definite when it comes to the market. Things were looking pretty good until they looked terrible when I woke up this morning. Damn. A little bit later the same day. Oh, we're looking good again. Spies on a pancake flipping mode. Now, is that trading? I mean, is, is that a strategy or is this person just making it up on the fly? And it, he thinks this and it's predicting that. And you're just setting yourself up for so much angst and so much stress. Just ignore it. Quit. The, it don't, if you see something like this on Twitter, just go right by it. Discipline. You do not know what is coming next. I don't for sure. And if you think you do, well, good for you. But I would recommend that you quit trying to predict what's going to happen next and just deal with what you're going to do right now. So your own all-weather plan to uh, get this close to the finish uh, is to write down your personal objectives. I've already given you a sheet that you can do that with if you saved the did the screen save. And if you didn't do that, you can get the recorded version of this and uh, that Richard's going to make available eventually, I guess. And uh, you'll be able to print that out and then just start thinking through each of those items. Start with a base strategy. You may already have one right now. I'm not saying you change it. Um, go ahead and start there. And that's your starting point. And that has an equity curve that you can plot. Uh, and you can concentrate on the potholes and look at the potholes and analyze them. Try to figure out what happened during those potholes. And you may find something out with your existing strategy that you want to tweak. But you may also come to a conclusion, well, wait, what if I add a second strategy B that always makes money during these types of markets, then I'm going to soften those drawdowns. I may give up a little bit of my overall return, but by smoothing out that graph, my mental side gets a lot easier to take care of. And I've got more ability to be able to uh, leverage it in a comfortable way. Uh, there's just a lot of advantages there. Look at some new strategies to fill the potholes, add them and evaluate the new curve and its new potholes and wash, rinse and repeat over time. And while you're doing it, enjoy the ride. Over to Richard. Perfect, Tom. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's super important what you just covered, um, especially considering, you know, there's been a lot of different ideas uh, thrown about in this conference. You know, a key theme is to manage risk, which at some point every system has to do. Uh, but I, de I definitely think it's very important to tailor your process towards yourself and develop your own system over time. Um, I've definitely got a lot of questions here, and uh, I see some good ones coming in uh, to the chat as well. Uh, to start things off, um, if if it'd be possible, thinking back on when you're when you're developing a system, would you be able to discuss um, one example of filling in a pothole? Um, using two different strategies. One strategy obviously produced an equity curve. And uh, can you talk through the process of designing a strategy that filled filled in a portion of a, a pothole of that strategy? Yeah, the easiest one that I can think of that everybody probably can easily understand is let's say I have a buy and hold diversified growth stock portfolio that acts like the S&P 500. And I'm gonna hold it for the next 20 years. Well, what's that gonna look like? Every time we have an up market, it's going to go screaming upward. Every time we have a down market, it's going to go screaming downward. Every time we go sideways, it's going to go and bounce around and go sideways. So we look at the equity curve. The potholes, the big ones, are going to be in bear markets. So second strategy could be let's create a timing model that short only, it goes flat when it goes to the up direction, and we'll use the Standard & Poor's 500 futures contract. And every time we get a down direction, we throw a short sell in the S&P future on. So it, it's making money as the market falls. And my palm is making money, let's say. The stock portfolio is, uh, is making money when the market goes up and it loses when it goes that way. 
The hedge is the opposite. See, I got the hands different. The hedge is making money as the market falls and losing money as it goes up. So if I have those two strategies together, what have I done with the pothole? Mm -hmm. I minimize the pothole. I may not eliminate it because the timing of the two strategies might be just slightly different. And maybe my S&P 500 futures doesn't exactly match my portfolio, but haven't I taken a, a major step in the right direction to getting rid of a lot of that pothole? So if I have, for example, like a 2000, 2000 tech meltdown, 2008 stock market, real estate markdown, uh, uh, meltdown, COVID crash, you know, major moves that happened and severely impact people's psychology. Haven't I awfully softened that kind of, you know, debacle happening to your portfolio? So that's kind of a simple example. You could come up with a million others, but they'd get more complicated probably. So, yeah, I think that's a good example for it. And to keep, to keep going with it, and this may get into the email that you've written a thousand times and as explained on your website, but I figured I'd ask it, um, <laughs> How would you, in a simplified way, uh, size that hedge versus the position to offset uh, that drawdown? Okay, the way I do that is you could just match the dollars and the dollars, but because certain stocks would move faster than, say, an S&P index, what I do is I just measure the volatility each day of my portfolio. So I have a spreadsheet, simple spreadsheet that most people know how to do one of those. So I write down the date, I write down the amount of the portfolio, and I have a percent that the portfolio went up or down. I have the S&P futures and what it did that day and the percent it went up or down. And I have a ratio of those two yep. so that uh, I need 1.35 futures hedges to match my portfolio over here. So I just volatility balance it on a spreadsheet. And based on the fact that I've got this much in my portfolio, that means I need x number of futures contracts to exactly hedge my long position over there it's that simple yeah very interesting and um are are many of your strategies do they work are they like a pair in a way that you design them where one creates a trend and then the other kind of fills in the pothole or are they all pretty much kind of independent uh strategies mm, yeah no, so, some are tied some are completely independent uh my futures trading on the longer term basis has nothing whatsoever to do with my sector ETF timing or my hedging. They're completely, you know, d distinctly uh, different and uh, going after different return streams over various time periods over various markets. So no. Okay. No, that's great. Uh, let's see. Uh, there's a question from uh, Benjamin. How do you separate each strategy? I find that I have uh, multiple strategies on the same trade or the same chart. Uh, back to back or out of one into another. So it just sounds like a lot of churning, I guess. Yeah, I I get that every now and again. Um, and the only way I've been able to deal with it is to create a simple spreadsheet again that keeps track of the positions by each strategy. And it does get a little complicated. And um, I wish some of the brokers would be able to, you know, label some of the positions in your portfolio. Like this one is from strategy A and this same position, which is in the same direction as the first position is strategy B. So I've got three contracts are here and I got five over there and I've got a total of eight. A lot of brokerage firms will just say, you've got eight contracts of X, Y, Z, whatever. And you can't really, it's harder to manage it. But um, if you organize it, you can do it. It's uh, it's all, I guess, a matter of how much time you want to spend, how much automation you can put forth into the problem. But I, a lot of times I'll just use a spreadsheet. And if I've got a couple of strategies that are going to be trading similar instruments, I try to keep track of them on a spreadsheet as I, on an ongoing basis. And it's, it's not impossible. Um, you can make a few mistakes along the way, but if you discover them, go ahead and correct your mistakes right away and move on. Yep. Perfect. And uh, there's a question that I think you mentioned the answer, but it might be a cool talk, talking point um, from Nim Jedi. Uh, how probably didn't pronounce that right. I apologize. Uh, how much discretionary training versus systematic does Tom use currently? I like to think of discretion coming in when I'm designing a trading strategy. That is where I use my creative human brain. To analyze the pothole, 
develop a sort of a logic of what could I do that would exploit that type of market condition. And then I start studying indicators that might be used to trigger that. How will I use my position sizing? So how much leverage do I want to take on? How much margin impact is it going to have to the portfolio? Uh, in the case of an IRA, uh, uh, interactive brokers charge us three times the normal margin for futures in the case, uh, than they would in a, say, taxable account. So I have to take into account tax considerations, uh, re margin restrictions, and I'm using my creative brain and my discretion to try to put together that strategy. Once I use all my best discretion in designing something that exploits that particular pothole that I'm trying to fill, at that point, and it's automated and I've done my historical simulation, I'm comfortable with the way it's acting, and I understand the logic of how it's going to help that pothole, I'm ready to go. Turn it on, no discretion. Yeah, perfect. Um, and in designing the systems that you create, are there any things that you do uh, consciously with, with most of your strategies or maybe just one in particular that is designed to increase the robustness but might be counterintuitive when people first think about it? Um, is, is there any system or... or way of thinking about it that you do to make sure, you know, it, it stands the test of time, even though, you know, from just somebody on looking, you know, it would significantly decrease the performance or, or have some other negative impact. Yeah. Yeah. The, what this reminds me of for a story time uh, would be along the way when I saw people constantly saying, how often do you optimize your indicators? And I thought about that and I thought, I don't optimize my indicators at all. They optimize themselves. And why is that? Uh, all my, every indicator that I use has some aspect of adjusting for the ongoing conditions that are in the market. If the ranges are wider, my stops will get wider. My position sizes will get smaller. Mm -hmm. If everything is compressed and my... Uh, my Keltner bands or my Bollinger's are getting very low standard deviations and ATR, then everything's going to be tight. I'm going to be a lot more sensitive. The markets are boring. I'm building bigger positions uh, when things, nobody cares. It's boring. It's the summertime and everybody's gone on vacation. Uh, when everybody comes back and the markets go crazy, I've got a very large position I'm starting with. And as it starts breaking out and the, you know, the lines get farther away and the ranges get farther away, that's when I'm touching off, uh, you know, the peel off trades and I'm taking my position sizes down slightly and managing my position size so that it deals with that extra volatility. So I like to think that a lot of the indicators I create discretionarily, if you will, have aspects of volatility or range built into them so that they stay more robust uh, over time because they're adjusting themselves on the fly. Mm -hmm. It seems to me more logical than trying to like once a month run a historical simulation and re-optimize your indicators. It seems a little clunky. Yeah. And you might just be, you know, fitting. And it, it, it yeah. Your curve yeah. fitting. Yeah. yeah. Your curve fitting history. And that's not what I really want. I want to try to react to current right. situations. Yeah. Perfect. Um, I want to ask a, a question about your strategies changing over time and, and developing new strategies. Um, how, how have your strategies kind of changed over the course of your career and how is that in response to kind of, you know, I, I really like the template that you shared where you think about the objectives of your system and the different components. How, how is, how have these changes reflected to the change in, in your current situation and, and, uh, how you would fill out that template? The biggest change I can think of was the transition from working as a money manager and having real clients with millions of dollars to then having a, a pretty substantial portfolio myself, but trading my own money. Right. The reason is when I was a money manager, I had to consider that the clients have a certain amount of mentality capability in terms of trading, certain amount of drawdown tolerance and so on. A lot of money managers take on the attitude, I think incorrectly, myself, I'm biased uh, to this, uh, that they're going to trade the way they would want to trade their own portfolio. And if you, Mr. Client, wants to come along for the ride, that's fine with me. You can pay me fees, I'll manage your money. Mm -hmm. I did the opposite. I said, what would I think the average client be able to tolerate 
And I designed everything we did at Trendstat to try to satisfy what the clientele wanted. And then I tolerated going along for the ride uh, with what clients were okay with. Nowadays, because I don't have any clients anymore, um, kind of the bridle is off. I, I don't have to, I can examine exactly where my risk tolerance is. And obviously since I've been trading futures for like 45 years, I'm comfortable trading futures. There's no fear there. There's, I understand what I'm doing. I can manage my risk. I can uh, trade in ETFs. I've got like 60 positions when I'm really loaded up. Um, that's all. It, it almost seems easy to me compared to what, being a money manager. Being a money manager, having clients ask you questions that you sit there and you, you shake your head and say, that's a really dumb question. <laughs> Why are you asking that? And that would happen a lot. And uh, I don't get those questions anymore because I don't ask myself stupid questions. Um, so you can kind of gear yourself to a different level and kind of do what you want to do. And you don't have to worry about labels that you put on things because you understand what you're trying to do. So that has changed the mix of indicators I've used. It's changed somewhat the risk levels that I trade at. It's uh, changed a little bit the instruments I use. Um, I never did credit spreads before for clients because if you've ever seen the disclosure documents you'd be required to give somebody for trading options for them, it would scare anybody <laughs> right out the door. Uh, good luck trying to convince anybody to give you money to do that. And um, so, I mean, I can do things that I just don't have to worry about the the legal uh, disclosures and all the, you know, the track record work and the audits by the SEC and by the NFA and all that. That all goes away when you're managing your own money. So when I retired, I put a smile on my face. It's been there ever since. Yep. So great. But I mean, in terms of some indicators, Richard, I, I can think of one indicator I'm using right now in my long-term futures trading. It's precisely the same indicator I used at Trendstat back in the 1980s. Mm -hmm. It's unaltered. It's the same indicator. I haven't changed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, and I think I probably asked this question uh, before to you, but it might be to a new audience listening. If what what advice would you have for anybody who wants to get started with automated trading uh, when designing their first system? Anything that you know could speed up their learning curve or help them avoid any pitfalls? Uh, it depends on how much they want to program. If they want to do their own programming, um, I guess the considering all the different alternatives, Python is one, and C sharp would be another. Both are public domain uh, programming languages, and I would stick to public domain. Do not do what I did, major mistake. Use FoxPro, which eventually got bought out by Microsoft, who eventually decided in a business decision to just not support it anymore. And all of my business was written in FoxPro. So I faced the prospect of hundreds of thousands of dollars of converting FoxPro to some other language just to have the same exact trading platform and simulation platform that uh, that was already working beautifully. I would, I would gain nothing. I would simply be moving from one language to another and running exactly the same thing. And I, that was just one of the many reasons why I retired, but um, it was a factor. And I would encourage you to always look for public domain. So Python and, and C Sharp, Microsoft has released C Sharp to the world. Mm -hmm. So they don't, you know, control it anymore. It's out there. And because of that, you can program stuff in there. And if you don't know these languages, I, I think I just signed up for a, a, a course in uh, well, WordPress because I'm doing some work on the website and I wanted to know WordPress is used a lot for making websites. So I thought, I'll, I'll just take a course in webs. It was like $12 and it's 10 and a half hours of WordPress for beginners. And you can go ahead and watch it on their channel. It's udemy.com. You know, they get a guy going with screens and you got exercises to do. It's just like going to school. 
but when you get all done with it, you kind of know the basics of WordPress. And the same thing is in case of, there's C-sharp courses out there you can get. They're very inexpensive. Just find the time to go through and start using your trading strategy that you want to work on as an example of what you want to work on for your program. Mm -hmm. And that, that would, you can play with it and it won't run and it'll give you an error message. And you say, well, why does there need an error message? And you get better and better and pretty soon you've got a little automated strategy. Yeah, perfect. I think that's great. Um, you mentioned that the mental side of trading is, is the most important side uh, and aspect of it. Uh, any thoughts there or, or advice there for people who are struggling with, with lack of confidence, doubt, uh, they're experiencing fear missing out. You know, a lot of the mega caps, the semiconductors have run super far. If they miss that, um, any thoughts there, uh, given, given your experience and, uh, you probably missed so many trades in your lifetime that you wish you could have traded, but you know, it's all, it's all part of the game, right? Uh, I would be worth thousands of times what I am worth, which is comfortable, uh, if I have all the trades I missed. So yeah, missing trades is not anything. I, I would encourage people to do this. First of all, quit predicting because the reason you're fearing missing out is you're predicting what's maybe going to happen, but you don't know what's going to happen. So let's concentrate on now and ask yourself, what is happening today, this moment? And how do I want the portfolio best position to attack risk and to manage risk and to manage position sizes now, not what we think is going to happen next week. I don't care what the Fed's going to do. I don't care what Biden's going to say. I don't care what is going to be on Fox News. I don't care about any of that. I only care about looking at the prices and saying what's happening right now and what should I be positioned. So that takes a lot of the pressure off altogether. Mm -hmm. Second thing you want to try to do mentally is do your homework and develop that plan. I find that people that have the most difficulty mentally that are, are people that are making it up on the fly. They react now. So they're in the now world. That's great. But they are they don't have a plan for how to deal with now. They are looking at it and saying, wow, this XYZ is going crazy. I should jump on now. But that might not meet any kind of criteria they had as a stock to screen out of a universe. There may be a hundred different better um, things that he should be buying right in the now, but he doesn't have a plan. So he can't screen anything. He doesn't know. He's, there's just nothing there. And so then, and where are you putting the stop? Oh, I don't know. I, we'll just watch it for a while. Oh, it goes the other way. Oh, now I'm nervous. And I'm so you're just taking yourself all up and down and all over the place. By having a plan and then executing that plan and doing it in the now, you get rid of the prediction frustration. You get rid of the doubt about what you should be doing in the moment. And it, it, it I kind of think of it, I, and I've never done this in reality, but think about a sniper in a, in a war situation. You've got the target in your scope. You don't have time. The, the person's moving or he might be on a vehicle. If, if the, you have to be able to pull that trigger off without thinking, it's got to be instinctive. You, you got the thing in the site and it's go. That's the way trading's got to be. You've got to have everything planned out. You know the scope is right. You know the wind direction. You got everything ready to go. It's now time to pull the trigger and you just do it. And it gets rid of a lot of that angst. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's very helpful. Uh, Tom, thank you so much for your presentation and, and the q and I, I think a lot of people uh, appreciated it. Um, any last words of advice for, for traders out there watching who are, you know, working on their systems, trying to improve as a trader and, and just, uh, yeah, improve overall? Just enjoy the ride along the way. Uh, you're going to have good periods and bad periods. And um, it just doesn't make any sense to me to go through life uh, stressed out and in angst and, and all that. So I've, I try to not think of myself as a trader, even though a lot of you out there think of me as a trader. Um, I, you know, I just, uh, I cooked a beautiful dinner last night. Uh, we had some great wine out on the back deck under the stars. Um, we taught this uh, couple that came and visited us two-step dance lessons. Um, so we did, 
it's not, I'm not just a trader. I do a lot of other things that are a lot of fun. And that's what I call enjoying the ride and why I named the website enjoy the ride world, because I think that's the thing. I think some traders get so obsessed with say doing the programming and trying to be perfect and trying to always do every trade and all this. And they just, their family life suffers, their joy in life, uh, doing other things uh, suffers. And I think you sort of lose sight. Sometimes just stepping away and doing something entertaining for yourself, go take a vacation. Uh, you'll have good ideas come to you then. Uh, yep. When you're just consumed with grinding, it's hard to come up with creative, you know, brilliant ideas because you're just so trying to do the next thing all the time. So I'd say step back and enjoy life a little bit. Perfect. And uh, you mentioned enjoytheride.world. Uh, where else can people reach out to you, learn more from you, uh, and and maybe give your Twitter handle as well? Oh, there it is. Yeah, it's uh, all there. Yeah, it's all there. Uh, Twitter is uh, Basso underscore Tom, and there's a new imposter today uh, that I'm going after. And uh, Facebook's the other one. I just really, it's enjoytheride.world, or just check out my name. And you'll find it, but um, they got another imposter I'm going up to the, uh, there. They seem to like weekends. I don't know. Uh, yeah. They must have more time on their hands. But uh, I'm on LinkedIn. Those are the three big ones. Uh, me, we, and Gitter and S Truth Social, I'm also on, but it's pretty quiet. Yeah. Well, don't follow at underscore boss of Tom 95, whatever it is. Yeah. These are these three <laughs> real handles. Or yeah. this morning, it's at B I A. S S O underscore Tom. It's every possible combination of they're creative last name and first name with a one on it and then an I in there and or two three S's instead of two S's. It's it's insane. I would if these people would just spend some time doing something legitimate, they'd be so far ahead of the game. It's yeah. what a waste. Yeah, there you go. Well, Tom, thanks again for your time, and I really appreciate it. It's a, I think it's a great way to close things out is to bring it back to you know creating a system because people yeah. have learned so many different things uh, and and taken so much input in. Uh, you got to understand that you got to you know establish something for yourself, and you can take yeah. bits and pieces here, but it's got to suit your own needs. And I, I think I think there's a really perfect way to end it. So thank you so much for your time. Always great chatting with you. Uh, and uh, yeah, any any last words you'd like to leave everybody with? No, I uh, just enjoy the ride and and uh, hope the weekend was uh, a good one for you. And uh, let's hope the markets all treat you uh, well this uh, coming week. Perfect. Uh, with that said, I'll be right back for a closing message. But uh, yeah, thanks so much, Tom, again. And thanks so much to the viewers. Uh, leave a like down below, subscribe. Uh, consider a donation to St. Jude's as well as you're, if you're finding value. And uh, yeah, I'll be right back. All right. And with that, it's time to unfortunately say goodbye. So thank you guys all for tuning into day four of the Trailline line conference. Uh, just a quick reminder. Uh, we're also as a part of this giving away a free ultimate training guide, a really amazing resource that we've you know built over the past a uh, few months here, 100 plus pages discussing setups, edges, going through a lot of chart examples, really bringing everything together. So uh, it's really designed to help level up your trading. And you can go ahead and click the link down below in the description or in the chat right here to go ahead and reserve your copy. Highly recommended. 
Uh, in addition, once again, we are currently running a sale on the master classes. Uh, definitely amazing resources here from Oliver Kell, Jared Tendler, uh, Eve, as well as the other life cycle trade authors, uh, Stan Weinstein as well, Market Legend. Uh, it's really a you know a privilege to be able to learn directly from him. Um, and these are definitely worth checking out if you're looking to level up your trading. Um, also, this is once again also brought to you by DeepView, a new and innovative charting platform, uh, screening, watch list management, um, alerts, and soon to be much, much more including trade analytics. Um, this is fully customizable. You've got your data columns, um, stats table, data panel, uh, fully customizable chart as well. And uh, you can really tailor this to suit your needs. And if you're a techno fundamentalist, this is the platform for you. Um, highly recommend checking it out, considering your options uh, and giving us a try. Uh, I promise you won't regret it. So definitely go ahead and check out DFU. Uh, down below in the description is the link. Um, and also, you know, we worked hard to make this kind of intuitive innovative and also very visual as you can see over here we've got a lot of enhanced visuals here uh, representations of daily closing ranges you can see the last five bars of volume right next to that data point um, you can see volume run rate if it's higher than normal is highlighted in blue so we're taking our trading knowledge and what we find useful and kind of you know focusing in on that and using that to uh, inform how we design this product, how we, how we design every feature, every module uh, to make sure it's most useful for real traders. So uh, definitely go ahead and check us out, uh, deepview.com. Uh, and with that, let's move on. Uh, also, please consider a donation to St. Jude's if you haven't already um, and you find value and learn something new in this conference, please go ahead and uh, consider a small donation. Definitely a very worthy cause. Uh, and with that, uh, unfortunately, it's time to say goodbye uh, once and for all, or until next next week, if we post another video, uh, and definitely next year for the next Trailline Conference. But uh, thank you all so much for coming. It's been great uh, chatting with you guys in the chat. Uh, you guys have asked some amazing questions. Um, also, a huge, huge thank you to all of our speakers as well. Every single day was fantastic, uh, and I hope everybody watching learned something new. I'm sure you did. Uh, and with that, thanks so much for tuning in. Uh, please remember to leave a like down below. Subscribe to the channel as well, and uh, we'll see you guys in future videos. Take care.